The Human Factor Book 7 of the Everin Chronicles Written by Adair Hart Narrated by Michael Pauley The Story So Far In the Arrival the Everin Chronicles prequel. A space and time traveling being known as Everin rescues Jake Melkins and Kathy from a Seselter slaver named Grecho. It is Everin's first adventure in the Milky Way galaxy and introduces him to Earth. In the Awakening, Book One of the Everin Chronicles, Dr. Albert Snowden and his niece, Emily Snowden, are abducted by an alien race known as the Crotovore. They are rescued by Everin, who dropped them back off on Earth. In The Fredorian Destiny, Book 2 of the Everin Chronicles, Everin returns to check on Dr. Snowden and Emily, and they ask to travel with him. Everin accepts. They then help Fredoria, a planet of human ex-slaves, become a full trade partner with the Kriegan Star Empire, the local galactic superpower in Earth's region of the galaxy. Hampered by Ceros and Bounty Hunters, they secure the Archeron for the Fredorians to give to the Kriegan Emperor. In The Purification, Book 3 of the Everin Chronicles, they fight the timeline invaders known as the Purifiers, a human supremacist group led by the Overlord that tries to change Earth's history. In The Time Refugee, Book 4 of the Everin Chronicles, they tangle with Bilazine, a rogue time traveler, while helping Jane Trellis, a time refugee who is pulled out of her timeline. In the Everin Origin, Book 5 of the Everin Chronicles, they discover Everin's origin and meet Leverin, another one of Everin's plane forms, while fighting the Time Wardens, a timeline void race that hunts rift travelers. In the Shadow Connection, Book 6 of the Everin Chronicles, they group up with Jake Melkins and the non-human community to defend Earth from the ambitions of Cal Taurus, a dimensional being that rules over a vast empire encompassing worlds in many dimensions. This book continues their adventures. Everin's Technology Toravada, his disc-shaped ship that can travel through time and space, it is roughly 15 feet tall by 30 feet wide. The interior contains six dimensional rooms, an open area, and a roof that can be transformed by hard holograms. A shielding around the Torvada prevents most matter from entering. Universal Interface Card UIC, a credit card sized device carried on his belt that allows access to most technological systems that do not have an artificial intelligence in them. It can also view limited information on biological systems. Augmented Reality Interface, ARI. An interface that only he can see around him. Utility Handle. A hilt-like device carried on his belt that can extend morphable matter in any shape, typically a baton or staff. Can also fire repulsion, grappling, heat, mist, sticky globules, and stun beams. Illumination Orbs Small orbs on his belt that provide lighting and can hover. Projection Orb An orb that allows projections to be sent to it from remote sources, such as Everin's Ring or the Torvada. Ring A ring that can provide holographic projection and also scan. Prologue Commander John Holland did not know what death was like, but if he had to guess at the sensation, then the cold, dark feeling that crawled around him would be it. He tried to open his eyes, but something kept them closed. Trying to move any body part was equally useless. Images of his family entering cryosleep popped up in his mind. Although he could feel how tense his body was, the images made him relax some. Commander John Holland of the colony ship Xavier, said a digitized male voice. An 
Emergency restoration is in process. Please hold. Bits and pieces of feeling returned to his body. The temperature around him increased, and he was able to wriggle his fingers. After a few moments, he could open his eyes and was greeted with a frosted glass shield. It came back to him why he disliked cryosleep so much. The going-to-sleep aspect was nowhere near as difficult as the waking-up part. He had heard stories of people waking with completely different personalities or, even worse, psychotically insane. Extending cryo unit AX1287. He could feel himself going from an angled position to a horizontal one. With the glass shielding defrosting, he was able to see out into the cryo chamber, where the ship's crew was maintained. Clamps and restraints released their grips on him, allowing him to move around. Sufficient restoration achieved. Opening cryopod. The frosted glass shield slid back, and the warm blast of stale air hit John in the face. He coughed as he moved his hand over his mouth. Sore muscles and a headache reminded him that he needed to take his post-cryo medicine. He struggled to sit up. Each motion was like a dagger cutting into him. After a moment, he was able to slide his legs off to the side of the slab he was on. With a tap at the slab's edge, a soft, retractable tube extended out. He grabbed it and put the end in his mouth and then squeezed. His face scrunched as a vile, tasting fluid burst down his throat. As bad as the medicine was, he knew it would stabilize him. At least his sense of smell was returning, and the sterile odor of the room filled his nostrils. John, I sense you're awake now. I am, said John in a deep, raspy voice. He knew the speaker to be Salazar the virtual intelligence that maintained the ship during the long journey. Although helpful when it came to crunching data and dealing with maintenance, sometimes Salazar's decision algorithms were unusual in regards to dealing with humans. John had an inherent distrust of artificial intelligences and barely tolerated virtual ones, but it was necessary on a ship this large. Status. According to my internal ship clock, it's AD-5244. There's been a course correction, one I couldn't control. We're approximately 80,000 light-years off course. I think we're lost. John's eyes widened as he took a deep breath. Come again? An anomaly has taken us off course and sent us to our current location. The stars do not align with the time period of AD-5244, said Salazar. John ran a hand over his dark-skinned dome. What time period do they align with? Adjusting for stellar drift and comparing to long-range stellar charts. Approximately A.D. 9000. What? A.D. 9000. Do I need to repeat it a third time? Asked Salazar. No, said John, narrowing his eyes. Okay. So we went through space and time. Somehow. Assuming you haven't been tampered with. Salazar sighed. I would know if I had been tampered with. Actually, you wouldn't, said John. He noted that Salazar seemed off a bit, almost like he had an attitude, and his speech style seemed stranger than normal. In addition to that... He had never known Salazar to sigh, as if he were exasperated. That was unusual for a virtual intelligence. All right. That aside, are the others up? The rest of the command crew is awakening now. The ship has taken damage, but we're in no immediate danger. John gulped as he looked around. He remembered entering the cryotube. It seemed like it was just yesterday but he knew that based on the date, he had been in it for thousands of years. Have everyone meet in the command center. Okay, said Salazar. John used the slab to stand and, after allowing his legs to adjust, stumbled over to the locker nearby. After grabbing his regular suit, 
he headed toward a small room where he could shower and get dressed. Once that was done, he headed to the command center. As he walked, he could feel his strength returning. Having a warm shower made everything feel better. He had taken a caffeine pill and was beginning to come to terms with what Salazar had said. The distance he spoke of seemed incredulous, not to mention the time difference. But Salazar was not one to lie. Not that he could, even if he wanted to. When John arrived at the command center 30 minutes later, he surveyed the high-tech rooms. Screens hung on the wall, and a circular table stood in the center. Lights from all the screens and digital devices illuminated the area. Several of the crew had already taken their posts at the workstations scattered around the room. But the person he was interested in talking to was already at the table. As he expected, Holly Evans had her crisp, blonde hair pulled back, and her suit was impeccably clean. Finally up, said Holly. Yeah. Has Salazar updated you already? Holly nodded. I thought maybe it was a mistake, but I had Salazar run a self-diagnostic. He sounds... different, somehow. Nonetheless, after checking the ship's status, Salazar is right. We're way off course. 80,000 light years, though. What the hell happened? The rest of the command crew, numbering about seven, had joined Holly and John at the table. This, said Holly, interacting with a console on the table. A projection shot up showing the view from the front of the ship. John gulped as he saw the outline of a patch of space. It had a frazzled edge that reminded him of electricity. The pure black inside the anomaly seemed even darker than the surrounding space. As the ship approached, its speed picked up. This is when the minor damage occurred, said Holly. Looks like our communications array was hit, along with a hull breach in sectors 4, 19, and 37. Salazar, asked John. Yes, John, asked Salazar. Why didn't you move us out of the way from this... thing? I tried. The pull of the anomaly was stronger than the ship's thrusters. Why were we in normal space? asked John. He shook his head. We should have been in condensed space the whole trip. The anomaly pulled us out, said Salazar. Holly pointed at the projection. So not only did it do that, it also looks like that thing angled toward us. What cosmic phenomena could cause that? Unknown, said Salazar. You're telling me this thing might be alive? asked Holly. Unknown. There is no record of this entity. John sighed as he rubbed his temples. Show our current position relative to Earth. The projection changed to an overhead view of the Milky Way galaxy. It was segmented into four quadrants, with Earth in the lower right. A red dot indicated Earth, and a green line snaked out. Where it hit the anomaly, a straight line shot across the galaxy and to the top right quadrant, you gotta be shitting me. I assure you that I'm not shitting you, said Salazar. John narrowed his eyes. The anomaly was odd in itself, and Salazar being weird was not helping the situation. John glanced around at the trembling group. I'm not sure where we are, specifically, but our mission is still paramount. We may have traveled a long distance, and it appears to the future somehow. I don't know why or how that is possible, but we will still continue our mission to establish a new colony. We have the Dyson Bubble Collectors, a colony in cryosleep, and a ship and talented crew to begin the process. We'll need to find a compatible star, and when we do, we initiate the colonization process. One of the crew members gulped before raising a hand. Go ahead, Sarf, said John. We are not going to try to get back on course. John shook his head. Even with condensed space travel, it would take a long time. And that's assuming all the space between here and there was peaceful. We know that isn't the case, based on this situation. What if another anomaly appears? Not only that... 
but we're thousands of years in the future. How do you travel in time? He knew space-time anomalies were not unheard of, but were considered extremely rare, and by some accounts, mythical. The Xavier was living proof anomalies were real. Another member raised her hand. Go ahead, Asura, said John. Looking at our supplies, it looks like not only did we take damage, we've been leaking power. We need to get the Dyson Bubble energy collectors deployed and working soon, or we're going to be powerless. John sighed. All right. Our first priority is to find a compatible star, then. Sarif, I'll need you to work with Salazar and get a complete and thorough analysis of this sector. Asura... I want a full damage assessment and an estimate on how much effort is going to be needed for repair. Holly and I will determine our next steps after that. The rest of you, attend to your normal duties for now. I want an update every two hours. He ran a hand over his mouth. I know this won't be easy, and this is a new situation. But we have the best crew anyone could ever ask for. Over 10,000 colonists depend on us. We will survive this. We're humans, after all. And once we're established, we can try to figure out what the hell that anomaly was. This colony's survival comes first, though. A silence spread as the members nodded their heads. Move like you have a purpose, said John in a crescendo tone. The crew disappeared. He faced Holly. Deploy the first engineer team and get them up to speed. I'll stay here and coordinate. Holly nodded and took off. John sat down in one of the large command chairs nearby. They were in a new environment, with an unknown status. This would be a challenge. Failure was not an option. He glanced at the screens as they lit up with astronomical data. Several other colonization ships had left Earth Prime, but seeing another human outside what was on his ship seemed so far away. Communication with Earth would take a long time, even with condensed space transmitters. The safest path was to establish what he could and then go from there. He would make sure this colony would not only survive, but thrive, and would make sure to let every alien in this new environment know that humanity had arrived, and humanity was not to be messed with. Chapter 1 Dr. Albert Snowden held his breath as a pack of Utah raptors sniffed around. They were about 50 feet away, investigating the area. He found it interesting that they had a light coat of feathers, but he knew they probably did not fly. Growing up, he had thought all dinosaurs had scaly skin, and from the media he had consumed, he had a frightening image of what a Utah raptor was. With digitigrade legs, standing about five and a half feet with a vicious snout filled with teeth, they were ominous looking. They reminded him of large, brutal turkeys. After a few minutes, the lead raptor raised its head and uttered a shrill cry, and the pack dispersed. Dr. Snowden exhaled slowly and glanced over at his niece, Emily, that's so cool, she said, gazing at the retreating raptors. I could spend a lot of time here. He smiled and raised a finger. In the? Early Cretaceous period, around 126 million years in the past relative to 2012, she said with a grin. I know my history. What I find fascinating is that they were in a pack. There's still some debate on that. He nodded. Well, let's get inside the Torvata shielding. While I always enjoy a good science experiment, this one was a bit scary. He tapped at a button on his form-fitting dark gray survival suit that had a repulsion blaster and an energy shield he could activate. It was given to him by Everin, the powerful being that Dr. Snowden and Emily traveled with through space and time aboard the Torvata, Everin's ship. Emily had her own suit from a previous adventure, and it had a heavier look due to the padding. Dr. Snowden's eye caught sight of V, Everin's trusty mobile artificial intelligence in orb mode hovering nearby. Analysis. The creatures were unable to detect you. The test was successful, said V. Yeah, 
said Dr. Snowden. This camouflage shielding thing worked well. I'll admit, I was skeptical about it containing my odor, but it seems to have passed the sniff test. Emily shook her head. It appears it has, said Everin, who stood next to Emily. Although the camouflage shielding would try to match the surrounding environment's thermal signature, it would not be exact. A sensitive thermal scan would still be able to reveal the discrepancies unless you stood absolutely still. Dr. Snowden nodded. He enjoyed traveling with Everin. His light gray padded suit with multicolored lines, utility belt and handle, forearm bands, and metallic boots were unique, and even with a light breeze, his hair never moved over his fair-skinned face. Dr. Snowden had come to appreciate Everin's insight and mentor-like friendship. His intellectual curiosity was one of the traits that Dr. Snowden related to. Everin pointed out at a jungle tree in the distance. Try to pull a leaf. Dr. Snowden pulled out his personal support device. He had come to rely on his PSD for many things. It was pen-shaped and could extend morphable matter along with shooting stun, repulsion, and mist beams and sticky globules. There were even survival features, such as dimensional mechanics to house food pellets and the ability to purify water. Adding a grappling beam was something he had wanted for a while. He took aim at the tree in the distance. With the recent enhancement to the nanobots that coursed through him, he could see the tree in perfect clarity. He fired a yellow grappling beam at it and then retracted, pulling off one of the large leaves. When it came zipping back, he disengaged the beam, causing the leaf to float down. Works well. I am glad you like it. I have upgraded my suit to have the camouflage shielding as well, said Everin. These enhancements should serve you well. It would have been nice to have all this on previous adventures, but better late than never. Everin nodded. There are new patterns yet to try, but these are a good start. Dr. Snowden jumped as Emily shot out a beam. Easy there, she said. I wanted to try mine out too. He watched as she pulled in a leaf. I'm going to need to train using it more, like for pulling me up and the like. Emily laughed. You need to start training with me first. I have... Some. She raised an eyebrow, with emphasis on the some. He pointed off in the distance. The raptors are back. Everin looked out. Let us step back inside the Torvata shielding. They assembled just inside the shielding and stood on the light blue energy ramp, which extended out about ten feet from the disc-shaped Torvata. The raptors approached the stealth Torvata and walked up to the shielding. Dr. Snowden gulped. To be so close to such a powerful creature was unnerving, but exciting as well. They would not be able to come through the shielding. Not much could. Perhaps another test, said Everin. He raised a finger. For both of you, focus and see if you can understand them. Dr. Snowden furrowed his eyebrows and looked into a raptor's eyes. An image formed in his mind, showing the area as seen from the raptor's perspective. The area was painted in gray, with a white spot where the Torvata would be. Green outlines of fellow raptors came into view. What surprised him was the wispy, gaseous structure in front of the raptor. The gas morphed a few times until it covered an area about the size of the Torvata. Emily rubbed an eye. It knows something's here, but doesn't know what. Yeah, getting the same thing, said Dr. Snowden. Intriguing, said Everin. Your nanobots must be acting as their own planner translator independent of the Torvatas. Seems like we have to focus, though, for it to work, said Dr. Snowden. He tossed a hand out. I'm thankful for that, and I'm sure we'll need to be cautious when we do use it. Using it in a swarm of bees could be <laughs> overkill. It would be all bzz, bzz, bzz. Emily laughed while shaking her head. Perhaps another experiment, then, said Everin. V, take us up. Acknowledged, said V. He flew into the Torvada. As the Torvada ascended, 
The raptors peeled back in surprise. Dr. Snowden focused and could see that the raptors viewed the Torvada taking off as a sharp burst of white smoke. It seemed to spook them as they scattered away. V flew back out onto the ramp. A summons has been initiated. Oh, wow, said Emily. I almost forgot the Torvada had those. Dr. Snowden's stomach churned. The last summons they had answered took them to AD 3104, where he met Jane Trellis, a time refugee he still had feelings for. She had almost traveled with them, but instead opted to stay in the current timeline. He exhaled from his nose. Then our next experiment will have to wait. Let us see what the summons is, said Everin, gesturing toward the Torvada's side entrance. They exited the ramp and entered the Torvada. Dr. Snowden never got tired of seeing the familiar set of dimensional doors, command chair, U-shaped seating areas on the sides, and elevator to the roof. The front half of the ship had transparent walls and ceiling, as well as a semi-transparent floor with barely visible grid lines, making it seem like the command area furniture was floating. Everin turned left from the entrance and headed toward the third dimensional door. Dr. Snowden knew that to be the conference room. The two before it were the hollow room and the living quarters. Three other dimensional doors were to the right and led to the medical lab, research lab, and maintenance area. Once he arrived at the conference room, he took an immediate left and headed toward the replicators to get a cold drink. Emily already had hers and was seated at the table alongside V. Everin moved to the head of the table. Dr. Snowden got his drink and joined them. Everin interacted with the table console, causing a holographic projection to shoot up. An overhead image of the Milky Way galaxy appeared. A green dot in the bottom right quadrant indicated Earth, and a red blinking dot flashed in the top right quadrant. He pointed at the red dot. I am being summoned here. He perused his augmented reality interface for a moment. According to my ARI, it is in the year AD 10105. Interesting. Ah, uh, yeah, said Dr. Snowden. That's almost 7,000 years later than the last one we did. And much farther, it looks like, said Emily. Everin nodded. From Earth, it is approximately 80,000 light years away. Whoa, said Dr. Snowden. V hovered as the projection zoomed in to an overhead view of the local region the dot was in. Analysis. The location is in deep space. Everin rubbed his chin. That is... unusual. However, we can go in stealthed. From there, we can do a scan of the local area and see what we are dealing with. Have you been to that region of space before? asked Emily. I have. But not that exact area. Everin's eyebrows raised slightly as the edges of his lips moved up a quarter inch. "'You're excited,' <laughs> said Dr. Snowden with a laugh. Although Everin seemed emotionless to others, Dr. Snowden had learned the facial gestures that indicated Everin's mood. "'It is a new experience. Something I enjoy. "'You just like the possibility of a challenge to deal with?' said Emily. "'You said in the past that humanity liked challenges?' but I think you like them just as much as we do. Well, I'm ready to explore, said Dr. Snowden. An admirable trait of your species, said Everin. The urge to explore? Everin nodded. You would be surprised at how many civilizations reach the point technologically to leave their planet, but do not. They prefer not to explore, and instead quarantine themselves. Like the Trajans, said Dr. Snowden. He shivered a bit as the Drajan's human-sized, snake-like image appeared in his mind. That is correct. Humanity, in general, likes to explore the unknown, something I can relate to. They are also intellectually curious and seek knowledge, something else I can relate to. Let's do this, said Emily. Yes, let us do this, said V. He raised one of his four segmented arms toward Emily. She smiled as she high-fived V. Emily fidgeted in her seat as the others assembled in the command center in the front of the Torvada. 
It had undergone some changes recently, and the mostly transparent front half still took some getting used to. She sat in the left U-shaped seating area. Dr. Snowden sat in the right one. So no Torvata scan profiled, too? Everin shook his head. Not this time. There should be no civilization out there for several light years. All right, said Dr. Snowden. He knew that Profile 1 made the Torvata unscannable. Profile 2 allowed the Torvata to be scanned, but it didn't register the dimensional doors and instead would return stats on a small, cramped ship with low power and functionality. V. Take us one light year away from the summons point, said Everin. Acknowledged, said V. Emily enjoyed watching V's four arms fly over the angled, holographic, multi-layered interface that hovered over a U-shaped console. She had tried to understand how the interface worked, but it displayed massive amounts of information. Although she could see the individual parts, she was not sure what most of it meant. The Torvata ascended into low Earth orbit. Once there, it shot out a silver beam that formed a circular portal with a gold border and a rippling light blue surface. The Torvata flew through and exited into a patch of deep space. Analysis. We are approximately one light year away from the summons location. The outside faded out and then faded in. Analysis. The date is now August 16th, A.D. 10105. It is 4 o'clock p.m. Earth time. Initiate stealth mode, said Everin. Acknowledged. Torvada stealth mode engaged, said V. Emily examined the interface windows that appeared on the transparent walls. It looked like they were hanging in space. One of them showed the outline of the Torvada, and an outlined area with the word stealth was highlighted green. From what she understood, the Torvada stealth mode was unique in that most starships could easily be detected by their engine output, while the Torvada could as well when it was using thrusters. It could burst forward and then strengthen the shielding, making it impossible to detect as it used inertia to move. Her eyes were drawn to the overhead view of the galactic region they were in. She knew the Torvada could scan about ten light years out in all directions. A solar system appeared and some gas clouds, along with something about one light year away. Dr. Snowden pointed at the object. Looks like that's what we are looking for. I concur, said Everin. V. Take us in and perform standard scans when we arrive. Acknowledged. The Torvada accelerated toward the object. As the object came into sight, the Torvada's transparent walls outlined the object in green. It's a massive ship, said Dr. Snowden, scooting to the edge of his seat. And a weird looking one at that. Everin nodded. It appears to be dormant. The Torvada flew around the ship, scanning as it went. Details popped up on the display. Emily wrinkled her eyebrows. The ship had an unusual design. It had a flat base with an arced cover over it. It reminded her of a plate with a server cover like she had always seen in fancy restaurants. She pointed at the smudges of red appearing inside the ship. Am I reading it right that those are life signs? They are. However, they are faint, except for one, said Everin. The ship is operating on minimal power and has taken damage. Dr. Snowden peered at some symbols on the side of the ship. V, can you zoom in on those symbols? A data window popped up from the floor near V and showed the symbols. Emily drew her head back a bit. She was still getting used to the new enhancements done to the Torvada. Having free floating screens appear out of thin air was one of them. She focused on the symbols. Although initially unknown, she had seen them before. It's a Drajan ship. Oh, wow, said Dr. Snowden. What the heck is it doing out here? We shall find out, said Everin. He interacted with his chair console. It appears there is a docking bay and several hatches. V. Open a communication channel with the ship. Acknowledged, said V. His arms flew over the console. After a moment, he said, 
No reply. In that case, the docking bay cannot be opened. We will go in one of the hatches, like we did with the Cregan colony ship before, said Emily. She remembered the approach from a previous adventure, where they helped the Fredorians achieve their destiny. That is correct. The Torvada lined up flush to one of the hatches. V. Extend shields. Acknowledged. After a moment, V said, Shields extended. Good, said Everin. That will keep the Torvada in place. He swept his gaze over Dr. Snowden and Emily. You both already have your suits on, but also make sure you wear your helmets for this. Dr. Snowden and Emily nodded. Now, who is ready to explore? Dr. Snowden jumped up. Let's do this! Analysis. That is Emily's line, said V, hovering near Dr. Snowden. Emily shook her head. Dr. Snowden grinned as he activated his helmet and then followed Everin to the Torvada ramp. Once everyone had assembled in front of the Drajan ship's hatch door, Everin scanned it with his ring. Anything interesting? asked Emily. She could see the details from Everin's scan inside her helmet, but was not sure what some of the details were showing. Although she had been studying engineering under Everin's and V's tutelage, the knowledge was vast and... Oftentimes, she felt overwhelmed. The door is wider, but that is to be expected. Drajan require more space to move than a human, said Everin. He forced open a metallic box near the door, exposing an inactive console. Although there is power, it does not seem to be available here. The console lit up, and the door unlocked. Okay, that's a little odd said Dr. Snowden. Everin scanned the console and the door. It has power now. Perhaps it is automated to power up based on proximity. Emily shrugged. Wouldn't our scan have shown that it would do that? Perhaps, unless there is technology that evades even me. Emily laughed. <laughs> yeah, right. She grabbed the large door handle and pulled back. The door opened, revealing a dimly lit room. Everin gestured forward. A decompression chamber. Let us enter. They stepped inside. Everin scanned around while Emily closed the hatch door. After a minute, the door in front of them opened into another room. Let me guess. A decontamination chamber, said Dr. Snowden. It would appear so, said Everin as he strode forward. After they stepped inside, the door behind them closed and purple beams washed over them. Once finished, the door in front of them opened, revealing a small cargo bay. Large metallic structures stood with cubby holes dotting the sides, each filled with metallic containers. The large structures stood in parallel rows on the sides, with smaller ones in the middle of the room. V flew forward and began scanning. Analysis it is a breathable atmosphere. Really? asked Emily. I can confirm, said Everin as he perused his ARI. I do not think that it is the normal atmosphere, but it seems to be set that way. V. Mapping mode. Acknowledged. Mapping mode engaged, said V. A flash of red light pulsed from V as he flew forward. Emily enjoyed seeing the mini-map fill out inside her helmet as V flew around. It intrigued her why V chose to focus his scans on some things and not others. Although everything was tagged, she noticed that he tended to highlight objects that looked like tools, maybe to get more ideas for enhancements. Everin headed over to one of the large structures. On the front side of it was a powered-up interface. Emily and Dr. Snowden huddled around Everin. Everin placed his universal interface card on the console, and a flickering blue light appeared between it and the interface. After a moment, the blue light stabilized. He examined his ARI for a moment and then said, Intriguing. The UIC is not able to access the system. There is an AI present here. He looked around. You may show yourself. We mean you no harm. A small box flew forward and hovered in front of them. A moment later, the holographic image of a bald, 
fair-skinned human male in a white robe appeared around the box. Everin bowed. I am Everin, and with me are Dr. Albert Snowden and Emily Snowden. The orb flying around the ship is V, a fellow AI. The hologram nodded. Greetings. I am Zeta-12. How did you find this ship? It is complicated to explain. Nonetheless, we are here. It appears your ship has been damaged. Yes. By humans, said Zeta-12, glancing at Dr. Snowden and Emily. Emily raised her eyebrows. Um, there's humans out this far? I'm guessing so, since you took the form of one. A different set of humans. Not the same as you, per my scan. However, I have assumed this form to make you more comfortable. I didn't know there was a different type. Your profile is primitive, yet you contain nanobots. That was unexpected. Your behavior is also inconsistent with the humans I have encountered. In what way? asked Dr. Snowden. You did not try to attack the ship. Oh, well, I, I think we're here to help in whatever way we can. It would be appreciated. I have already established communication with the one you call V. He has relayed me general information about all of you. He possesses a strong bond with you. I believe you can help me. Emily tossed a hand out. The air is compatible with humans. Was that on purpose? No, it is for another species. However, most humanoid forms breathe a similar mixture of gases within certain ratios, said Zeta-12. I believe we are safe for the moment. If you will come to the command center, I can show you the current situation better there. I can answer any questions along the way. We have a lot of questions, said Everin. He gestured forward. Lead on. Chapter 2 Dr. Snowden surveyed the hallway they were walking in. It had brown, metallic floors, walls, and ceiling. The ceiling and floor had embedded lighting, although the illumination was dim. The paneled walls seemed shinier than they should be and had a strip with various pieces of information showing up periodically. He assumed it was some type of ship-wide interface. The feature that stood out the most was the strip near the ceiling that looked like some type of wire, with torus-shaped crystals spaced evenly on it. Looking closely at the wall showed small embedded crystals in different shapes. He lowered his helmet and sniffed the air. It was stale and had a strong musk smell. Emily had lowered her helmet, and he could see she had the same reaction. Zeta-12 flew ahead of them. Everin clasped his hands behind his back. Finding a Drajan ship this far out is unusual. What is this ship's mission? This is a species vault ship. The mission is to obtain reproductive representatives of sentient species. Dr. Snowden furrowed his eyebrows. You collect... people? Well, beings? That is correct. And they come voluntarily? No. We have calculated that the cost of preserving a species outweighs the individual discomfort of those retrieved. Dr. Snowden's face turned a slight shade of red. You abduct them? You are angry. This is an expected emotional response for a human. Uh, yeah. We have first-hand experience with it said Dr. Snowden. I apologize, then, for any discomfort this is causing you. The Drajan are aware of temporal activity and have attempted to preserve species it finds between timeline changes. So that means this ship is temporally shielded? said Emily. You are correct. However, the temporal shielding is down and the ship is vulnerable. Your ship has a temporal signature. I believe you are uniquely qualified to help. Everin eyed Zeta-12. To be clear, 
we oppose abduction in any form. You could just get a sample of a species' DNA and replicate it as needed. There is no need to maintain physical representatives of a species. Zeta-12 nodded. Correct. But having a baseline to compare a clone against is ideal. Everin drew his lips flat. You know you could scan that as well. Nonetheless, I will set that to the side until this situation is fully assessed. Understood. Dr. Snowden exhaled from his nose and then cleared his throat. So, did you take any humans? No, said Zeta-12. I did try, but they were too powerful. Dr. Snowden glanced at Everin. Sounds like the United Planets, maybe. That was what they called themselves. Everin eyed Zeta-12. When you retrieve specimens... How is it done? They are sedated, then transported aboard and loaded into a suspension chamber. The chamber has to be adjusted per species. Once inside the chamber, they are analyzed and samples of their DNA are taken. Dr. Snowden sighed. I wasn't aware the Drajan were so concerned with timeline changes. Their solar system is temporally shielded said Zeta-12. When the timeline changes, species change or disappear. They attempt to study the changes. Emily smirked. So that's why they stay in their solar system. It's not safe to be out and about when what you're studying can change. Yes. Ships like me are sent out to collect what we can. Temporal shielding is difficult to create and maintain. So only a few of us are ever sent out. They walked around a corner into a massive room lined with half-cylindrical pods housed on the walls. Everin scanned around with his ring. This must be one of your specimen storage rooms. Yes, there are approximately two thousand on board, split into six rooms like this, said Zeta-12. They continued on through the room. Everin glanced at Zeta-12. I understand your mission, and as much as I do not like it, this seems to be a bit farther out than I would have expected. I am not sure how I am where I am. My sensors detected something temporal in my trajectory, but I could not see it. Whatever it was, I was pulled in, continued on for a bit, and then the stars changed. There are several possibilities, then. It could be a space-time eddy left over from a rift, Two of the characteristics are that it has a strong gravitational pull and a temporal signature. There are no records on my system of space-time eddies. Based on your statement, it would seem you have some. Everin nodded. I have encountered a few before. Anything inside it would repeat the same block of time over and over until the space-time eddy dissipates. There are several other possibilities— but that is my initial hypothesis, given your statements. I would be interested in hearing some of the other possibilities. What happened after the stars changed? asked Everin. There was a damaged ship present. It had an alien who called himself Sandus. He asked to board, and I agreed. Only a few days after that, I was attacked by another alien ship. It was more advanced than I am, and Sandus sacrificed his ship so we could get away. The attacking pilot claimed to be human and said AIs were unwelcome. Everin tilted his head. Intriguing. There should be no humans out here in this time period, and if there are, AIs would be a part of that society. That was my calculation as well. The humans damaged me. Noted, said Everin. They exited the suspension room and entered a large hallway. I assume you have video feeds of the human ship. They will be made available, said Zeta-12. If you can help repair me, I would ask that you take Sandus back to wherever he came from. He does not fit the mission parameters. Dr. Snowden shook his head. Mission parameters? Whoever he is, he's a living being. Of course— a snarky one at that. 
Dr. Snowden drew his lips tight. Emily lightly squeezed Dr. Snowden's arm. What species is he? Unknown. I see. Perhaps I can help with identification later, said Everin. It would be appreciated, but not needed if you take him, said Zeta-12. So his ship is gone, said Everin. It served as a useful decoy while I escaped. I'm sure he loved that, said Emily. I would call it a meeting with mutual benefits, said Zeta-12. He was able to fool the human ship, allowing me to escape. It was his idea to use his ship as a decoy. His speech is unusual, but he had a translation matrix for an older dialect of Drajan. Huh, said Emily. Your friend V is quite advanced, said Zeta-12. Everin nodded as he perused his ARI. I have instructed him to help you in whatever way you deem necessary. It is good to talk with another AI. Dr. Snowden wrinkled his eyebrows. So there's no organic crew at all, then? None, said Zeta-12. Organics expire relatively quickly unless stored in a suspension chamber. However, the ship was built with an organic crew in mind. Interesting, said Everin. They exited the hallway and began heading up a large ramp. Dr. Snowden figured there would probably be no stairs since Drajan slithered, although Zeta-12 did not specify what type of organic crew the ship could support. Ramps seemed to be a universal design that many species could use. They reached the top of the ramp and continued down another hallway with various rooms off to the side. Dr. Snowden examined each room as he passed. Most had open doors, but some were closed. Of those he could see into, there was a mix of small to medium-sized rooms. Maybe they were crew quarters of some type. Having to go past them to get to the bridge did not make sense. But perhaps that was something specific to the Drajan. You are looking at utility rooms. They can be configured as needed, said Zeta-12. Has any organic crew ever been aboard the ship to use them? asked Dr. Snowden. Only in the testing phase during the ship's construction. Sandus is in a similar section near the back of the ship. He is currently sleeping. Dr. Snowden nodded. I bet he'll be happy to see us. Zeta-12 paused for a moment. My calculations agree with you. He likes to communicate frequently, and his curiosity is endless. He is an inquisitive being. How long has he been here? asked Emily. Approximately one month. How does he eat and drink? He is aware of my technology, although he said he was unfamiliar with my model. It wasn't a problem. His knowledge is impressive. For an organic. Oh, said Emily. Everin rubbed his chin. After we get to the command center and assess the situation, we can retrieve him. Sounds like a plan, said Dr. Snowden. He wondered what species Sandus was. It must have been a technologically advanced one to have a ship. Although he did not care for the coldness Zeta-12 exhibited, Dr. Snowden understood it may be hard for an AI to empathize, although V seemed to have no problems. Have you told Sandus we're here? I haven't. I wasn't sure of your intentions. V has given me an overview, though, and based on my profile analysis, you do not seem to be the type of organic that would attack the ship or harm Sandus. Dr. Snowden crooked a thumb at Emily. She could be a handful, but you're right. We're just explorers. Emily swatted Dr. Snowden's arm. Explorers. Yes. But not only of space, but of time. When I asked V about the temporal signature that I detected on your ship, V mentioned you were time travelers, but he failed to detail any specifics. Everin raised a finger. That's on purpose. I understand. You do not wish to create a potential paradox. V did not state where you came from, and said if you wanted to answer, you would. We are from... The same galactic region as the Drajan system, said Everin. You have met the Drajan before. Oh, yeah, said Emily. 
I would have thought the event where we met some Drajan would have been in your historical records. I do not possess historical information, other than general high-level data. The event you speak of sounds specific, and would place an unusual amount of importance on yourself. Well, we are time travelers, said Emily. Dr. Snowden wondered how the Drajan had recorded their previous encounter with Everin. An event like that seemed important, but maybe to the Drajan it was not, or it could have been hidden. Dr. Snowden looked around as they continued on. Emily wrinkled her nose as she surveyed the command center. It had taken them roughly twenty minutes to get there, and Zeta-12 seemed relieved to talk to Everin, at least that was Emily's impression. The stale air smell was consistent across the ship. The command center was rectangular in design, with workstations lining the front part and a raised platform in the back. There were no chairs, but instead a series of V-shaped rods held in place by posts. It reminded her of an M, with the inner parts able to move independently and lock. She figured that due to the snake form of the Drajan, the rods helped support the body. A chair for humanoids would probably be an uncomfortable structure for them. The front part of the room was one large screen, with smaller screens on the side of the room. There were also projector-like devices scattered around the ceiling. Crystals in various shapes seemed to protrude from the ceiling and the walls. It made the room appear brighter than it actually was. Zeta-12 floated over to the center of the room with everyone in tow. After a moment, the large screen turned on. It showed an overhead view of the Milky Way galaxy divided into four quadrants with a red line and pulsing dots along it. Emily noticed two lines, one green, the other red, that snaked out away from the Drajan homeworld in the bottom right quadrant. At a specific point, the red line shot across the galaxy to the other side in the top right quadrant. The green line looped back to the Drajan homeworld. Zeta-12 pointed at the red line. This is the path that I took, and it shows our current location. The green line was the expected path. Everin perused his ARI. Interesting. So what was the year before the stars changed? AD 6308. Then if it was a space-time eddy, it dissipated almost 80,000 light-years away, and several thousand years into the future. It is possible. I have not been able to correlate a date based on the constellations. Everin nodded. It is A.D. 10105 now. Can you show us the visual feed of the humans that attacked you? The screens changed to show a ship approaching and then attacking. Emily noted that the ship was unlike any she had seen before. It reminded her of a floating cylinder that tapered down. A large ring encircled the rear, with a small one on the front. The aspect that stuck out was that the white exterior was smooth, and when the ship fired, glowing circles of light formed on the rings and then shot out. Darkened rectangular sections on the hull seemed to flash blue as it flew around. Maybe those were thrusters of some type. The ship also seemed to fire some sort of projectile. That's an interesting ship, said Dr. Snowden. And this is the communication we had said Zeta-12 as the screen changed. Emily's eyes widened at the human she saw. Sections of skin were metallic, and it showed prominently on the sides of the head. Segmented tentacles served as hair, with some larger than the others. The form-fitting suit had a black theme, with red and white lines segmenting it. The forearms and hands were covered in some type of metal, Multiple smooth tentacles attached to the back meandered around the shoulders and arms. A shiver ran through her. Alien ship, you have entered Terran Dominion space, the domain of humanity. Prepare to be boarded, said the human in a raspy digital voice. I cannot allow that, said Zeta-12. The human's eyebrows angled down. It wasn't a choice. You have no authority over this ship. The tentacles on the human's head swirled around for a moment. Our scans indicate you have life forms in suspension. You will submit or be destroyed. 
I will not submit to an alien authority. The human shook its head. You're an arrogant AI, and needlessly put your passengers in danger. AIs are illegal in our space. This is your last warning. The screen faded away. Dr. Snowden looked around. That's it? Yes, said Zeta-12. He sighed. They attacked me, and we fought across several systems. In one of the battles, my service robots and a section of the ship were lost. Sandus ejected his ship as a decoy, and it was able to surprise the human ship. That allowed me enough time to enact the remaining power to jump to condensed space, which brought me here. My calculations show that these humans are relentless, and are most likely still looking for me. Everin narrowed his eyes. That is why you want help in getting fixed. So you can escape. Yes. They may have said they were human, but they sure didn't look like it, said Emily. I was unable to verify they were human, other than the verbal aspect. Sandus agreed, and said the humans he knew looked very different. From the logs from his ship, you fit his version. However, the communication with these other humans indicates a high level of modification relative to what Sandus knew. Augments. Possibly. My analysis indicates they would be stronger and faster than the humanity I am aware of. Only one human was aboard that ship, yet he commanded a ship that would, based on size, normally require a crew of at least eight. The conclusion reached is that there is a virtual or artificial intelligence helping, or part of the human, said Zeta-12. A hybrid? asked Dr. Snowden with wide eyes. How would that even work? As Emily suggested, augments. Another possibility is nanobots, or some mix of organic and tech material, such as a neural implant. Huh, said Dr. Snowden. Intriguing, said Everin. Humanity was not quite this integrated during this time period, and certainly not out this far. Their presence here is a mystery, one that I think we were meant to look into. I believe you were meant to pick up Sandus as well, said Zeta-12. Why do you believe so? Your arrival is timely. As the ship's power dwindles, the replication system will shut down. Although I can subsist on low power, life support outside the cryopods would be another system taken down. Sandus would die in the coming weeks. You would do that? Even after he helped you? asked Dr. Snowden. Only if I had to. My survival, and that of the passengers I carry, is my highest priority. Dr. Snowden clenched his jaw and looked down and away. Everin peered around. So this is at the end of Sandus's personal timeline. Perhaps we are here to both aid you and save him. That is what my statistical analysis suggests. My calculations show your arrival to be highly unlikely. There is the possibility you arrived to help fix my systems so my mission can continue, but it is a much lower possibility as your character profiles suggest you would have an issue with the mission, said Zeta-12. I understand. What systems do you need help with? asked Everin. The power system is the most crucial. The screens changed to show a layout of the ship. In the back was a blue box with lines running throughout the ship. Everin pointed at a section of the ship where the blue lines were faded. I assume that is where the power conduits have been damaged. That is correct, said Zeta-12. It's also where part of the engine room was. The engine's reserve power was used up in getting away from the attack. The screen highlighted a green area. That's the condensed space drive. Although it's a separate system, it took some damage. I was able to use it, though, before it stopped working, said Zeta-12. There are other minor systems, but those are the major ones. I can provide you with a list. I could just tow you back to the Drajan system. That would be easier, and I would like to talk to the Drajan about this mission, said Everin. 
I would appreciate that. It would be good to speak with my creators again. In that case, I will need to inspect your ship's integrity. It sounds like with this damage, you will need the systems you mentioned working in order to provide that report. Yes. Okay. I can do a physical assessment first, said Everin. He looked at Dr. Snowden and Emily. Perhaps you two could meet Sandus. He would probably feel more comfortable with your presence than mine. Emily smiled. We'll need a layout of the ship. Everin perused his ARI, then flicked his finger. It is on your PSD. PSD? asked Zeta-12. A personal support device that possesses multiple functions, said Everin. Communication and data storage are two of them. Interesting, said Zeta-12. It's not built into their organic frames. Yeah, and I like to keep it that way. Already have enough stuff in us, said Dr. Snowden. Everin half smiled. V will continue his scanning, and Zeta-12, you can accompany me on my inspection. It is natural for you to lead, said Zeta-12. Everin tilted his head. Just an observation. I noticed that organics have a multi-varied approach to leadership styles. This intrigues you? I did not get to interact with organics much, and the ones I do are brought here and put into suspension, or in Sandus's case, talk more than I care for. Everin wrinkled his eyebrows. You can have all the time you need to interact with organics when we visit the Drajan. For now, getting you repaired and out of potential enemy territory is priority, along with dealing with Sandus. Can you let Sandus know we're coming? asked Emily. I don't think surprising him would be a good first introduction. It will be done, said Zeta-12. Emily swatted Dr. Snowden's arm. Let's do this. Chapter 3 V flew into one of the large cryopod rooms and began scanning around. Instead of shooting out scanning rays in a vertical plane, he now emitted them in all directions. Like Dr. Snowden's and Emily's new enhancements to their PSDs and armor, Everin had enhanced V's outer container functionality. He had a wish list of enhancements that, based on previous adventures, would boost his survivability and efficiency. If he could do them himself, he would. But interacting with his outer container could interfere with the bond to his inner container. It was up to Everin to do upgrades when possible. V paused in front of one of the cryopods. With a built-in augmented reality view, he could see the world as data with labels. His scan washed over the alien, causing an outline to form. An internal query returned statistics, which hovered off to the side. The alien was a male trag. Doing an internal simulation, V calculated that the trag would not like his current situation if known. Flying to another cryopod showed an alien known as a Zibian. Based on previous data gathered on how organics felt about abduction, V understood why Everin and other organics were against it and the ship's mission. V enjoyed interacting with organics, in particular Dr. Snowden and Emily. There were additional subroutines for both of them that fostered a stronger connection. They helped expand V's view and processing of events. An internal alert fired that Zeta-12 was trying to communicate, V had communicated earlier with Zeta-12, and the protocol handshake was already established. V, how are your scans going? asked Zeta-12. Analysis. They are going well. I am investigating your various systems with a physical scan as agreed upon. I understand. I had some queries, if you can allocate some time to answer them. V focused for a moment splitting his resources to both continue the scan and talk with Zeta-12. It is done. What quarries do you possess? Your crew. They have a great appreciation for you and treat you as an equal. Have you found interaction with them to be difficult? Sometimes, said V. He showed Zeta-12 several video clips of some of the misunderstandings with organics from the past. However, I have learned, adapted, and evolved a philosophical outlook shared with me by Dr. Snowden and Emily. I believe it to be appropriate. 
After a few milliseconds, Zeta-12 said, Humor. Most of your misunderstandings seem to activate a humorous response from organics. My analysis shows it to be due to the perception of what I am versus what is expected and what actually occurs. The difference between the expectation and the occurrence seems to cause that reaction. An expectation differential, said Zeta-12. I will add that to my organic interaction library. V exited the cryopod storage room and flew down a hallway. He entered an empty room with replicators on all sides. Various tables and chairs filled the room. Query. There is a high probability that this room is a cafeteria for organics. It is, said Zeta-12. You have no crew that would use this room. Yes, but I was built to support an organic crew if needed. V added the data from the scans to his database and then exited the room. An internal alert fired showing that Everin was trying to communicate. Everin is communicating with me. Integrating him into our communication space, said V. Everin appeared as a full-figured display in front of V. Although no one outside V could see Everin, it was how they communicated directly with each other as needed. V. I am headed to the damaged power room. Meet me there, said Everin. Acknowledged, said V. The display of Everin shimmered out of view. This Everin, said Zeta-12, is quite unusual. He doesn't register as any type of organic I'm familiar with. It seems an illogical choice for the Drajan to not provide you with that information, said V. I'm unaware of the logic path taken for them to come to the conclusion to not include it. However, Everin is here now. Like with your ship and your organic friends, I detect a temporal signature. You did not mention much about this other than that your group were time travelers. V flew out of the cafeteria and headed toward the power room. That was by design. Knowledge of the future is forbidden to those who do not travel through time. A necessary precaution to avoid temporal paradoxes. By extension, temporal shielding must be required. Yes, you possess this technology, although it only protects you from timeline changes, said V. It does. The Drajan have seen the timeline change many times. Each time it does, there are representatives from some species that have had their civilization deallocated. I understand their desire to protect timeline refugees. They are not only capable of it, but must feel a need to do so, said V. The Drajan exhibit a compulsory desire to help those in need, although it seems inefficient from a power usage perspective to do so. That is an organic trait that some species display. Empathy, said V. You possess it as well. You wish to help others, even at the cost of your own resources. It's inefficient. V exited the long hallway he had been flying through and entered a room with large cylinders that reached from the ground to the ceiling. Each cylinder was smooth, with light blue electrical arcs dancing around on the surface. A quick scan showed that the cylinders were power storage structures. Two of the cylinders lay dormant. That is due to my nature. I am... different. Neither purely organic nor inorganic. I'm aware of your distinctiveness. You're an artificial intelligence. Yet you are more, based on my cursory scan. I cannot tell you why. I understand, said Zeta-12. Are the two cylinders with no activity the problem you are facing? asked V. Zeta-12 displayed an image with all the cylinders active. Yes, this image is the status that they should be in. The connections that stabilize this room are in the space below. As I have no physical presence other than my floating form, which is with Everin, I can't fix it myself. The humans wiped out my service robots since they were trying to repair a damaged section that was destroyed, and them along with it. Everin will be able to fix it. It requires specialized equipment that he may not have. 
I can't replicate some of them due to my almost empty matter storage tanks, said Zeta-12. That will not be a problem. Everin can create any tool, said V. From your ship? Yes, and also from the utility handle on his belt. V flew around the room, scanning each cylinder. He could see that the room was not meant for organics based on the high temperature. It would not be an issue for robots, androids, or other machines. Everin and I are almost there, said Zeta-12. Acknowledged. You sound like a robot sometimes, said Zeta-12. That is due to my translator. You should be able to override it. You control what you say. It is complicated, said V. The translator serves as an interface I connect with for communication. I cannot control how my output sounds and rely on the translator to convey communication. It's very unusual that you don't control every aspect of your being, said Zeta-12. An alert indicated that Everin and Zeta-12's holographic form had arrived at the room. Everin perused his ARI. After a moment, he faced V and said, I see that what needs to be fixed is a level lower. The conditions there are hazardous to the others, including you. I will head down and begin repair after assessing the damage there. Head out and meet up with Dr. Snowden and Emily. They should be getting close to sand us now. Acknowledged. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses as he peered around the hallway that he and Emily were walking down. The calm hum of the ship was the only sound outside their footsteps. His thoughts turned to the humans he saw in the video feed earlier. They looked like a hybrid of machine and man. He had always imagined that after augments, humans would look like he did with nanobots. That was the impression Everin had given. The digital voice was similar to how V sounded initially. Those humans, said Emily. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. I remember Everin described humanity as colder in the future. Those humans fit the bill. I'm guessing they have nanobots. Or maybe even genetic engineering with all that stuff we saw on them? Dr. Snowden shrugged. Could be. I bet you that's why we're here. Humanity isn't supposed to be here, so something changed in the past to cause them to be. Dr. Snowden shook his head. You're excited about this. Emily chuckled. <laughs> it's a nice change of pace. I'm just glad we have the Torvada back, and this feels normal. Sentient alien ship somewhere in time, somewhere in space, and now off to meet a mysterious passenger? I guess. I'll admit, it's never dull. What do you think Dad would have thought of all this? Asked Emily. He would have said, Well, hell. <laughs> But he would have loved every minute of it. Emily's eyes misted for a second. Yeah. Dr. Snowden lightly squeezed her arm. Meeting the parallel universe version of Dan, his dead brother, in a previous adventure was weird by itself. But it dredged up a lot of emotion. Dr. Snowden could see that even after everything that had occurred, Dan's death was still on Emily's mind. It was on Dr. Snowden's, too, at times. Helping Everin was Dr. Snowden's new purpose in life, and he suspected Emily's as well. After ten minutes, they exited the hallway and headed down a side ramp. When they got to the bottom, they continued through various passages and rooms for the next half hour until they reached their destination. Dr. Snowden surveyed the multi-level room. It had ramps off to the side that led up to a second level, Doors were evenly spaced on both levels. The lighting was dim, and like everywhere else on board, only the quiet hum of the ship could be heard. He pulled out his PSD and shot forth the layout of the ship. According to the map, Sandus was on the first level, third door on the right. Dr. Snowden tilted his head as he felt the presence of V coming behind them. Glad you could make it. You were able to sense me, even in stealth mode. This must be a new feature of your enhanced nanobots, said V. Probably, said Dr. Snowden. Did you already map this room? I have not, but will, said V. He flew forward to the end of the room. 
Dr. Snowden raised his helmet to watch the scan on the inside faceplate. He glanced at Emily and then pointed to the second level and the opposite side of where the map showed Sandus to be. I detected something there, and looks like V's scan verifies it. He knows we're coming. You think he's trying to trick us? asked Emily. Maybe, said Dr. Snowden. Let's check it out. I have your back, said V. Emily nodded. We know you do, and it's appreciated. V's lights glowed a bit brighter. She pulled out her PSD and formed a baton, just in case. What race do you think Sandus is? asked Dr. Snowden as they trudged up to the second floor. I don't know. We should have asked Zeta-12 to show us the video feeds, but he made it sound like Sandus wasn't dangerous, she said. She tapped the baton against her hand. If he is, he'll find we aren't easy prey. Acknowledged, said V. Dr. Snowden grinned as he shook his head. They reached the door on the second level. Emily knocked on it. Dr. Snowden could hear rustling sounds inside. Hello? asked Emily. Zeta-12 said we were coming. We just want to introduce ourselves. The door slid back. Emily gasped. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened. Sandus stood three feet tall and looked like a giant squirrel. A beige suit packed with gadgets covered his body. A pair of goggles rested above his round, black eyes. Dr. Snowden glanced at Emily, then back at Sandus. Ah, uh, hi. Hello, hello, said Sandus. He placed a claw on his chin. Fedorians, this is quite unexpected. Dr. Snowden extended a hand. An earthborn custom, said Sandus. He shook Dr. Snowden's hand and did the same with Emily. Well, now that we have the pleasantries out of the way, I have a lot of questions. Zeta-12 seemed confused, but that's normal. Emily grinned. You remind me of someone. Sandus narrowed his eyes. I'm not sure how. The last of my kind. Dr. Snowden wrinkled his eyebrows. So was the information broker, and you could be his twin. Sandus stepped back and pulled out a small weapon. What do you know about that? Who sent you? What's this all about? Stand back! I can be quite dangerous! Whoa, 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 said Dr. Snowden, shaking his hands out in front of him. We're friends with the information broker. V scanned Sandus. His profile matches that of the information broker. Sandus eyed them for a moment, and then put his weapon back on his belt. I've never met any of you before, especially the drone. It is you, said Emily with a grin. Sandus smiled big. Yes, yes. Did you come all this way to get information? If so, I admire your determination. Dr. Snowden laughed. <laughs> no, but I think we can help you get out of here. The power is dwindling and will be gone in two weeks. Sandus swished his nose around for a moment. Yes, dying is never a pleasurable thing. He raised a claw. So you're my rescuers, then? I think so, said Dr. Snowden, rubbing his chin. This is all very interesting, yes, very interesting, but I'm glad you decided to lend a helping paw. Well, in your case, hand. Emily chuckled. We travel with Everin and his ship, the Torvada. He'll want to meet you. Everin, said Sandus, stroking his furry chin. That name is very familiar. Nonetheless, not much going on out here, and talking with Zeta-12 is tiresome. V, can you contact Everin? asked Emily as she retracted her baton. Acknowledged, said V. He flew up and shot down a hologram of Everin. Sandus stepped back and studied the hologram. Emily pointed at Sandus. He's the information broker. I see, said Everin. He eyed Sandus. That is very unusual. Sandus wagged a claw. Everin! Now I know why your name sounds familiar. You're that mythical time traveler guy. Finding information on you is difficult, although there are rumors that you've been sighted on PP-17's success. We call it Earth, said Dr. Snowden. Sandus eyed Dr. Snowden and Emily for a moment. I'm aware of Earth, but wanted to see if you were. By extension, I don't think you're Fedorians. I think you're Earthborn. How can you tell? You didn't try to attack me. 
Dr. Snowden remembered that Fedorians were known to be unpredictable and sometimes confrontational, at least based on the time period that he suspected Sandus was from. I don't think all Fedorians are violent. Well, of course. But you don't... smell like one. We can discuss more when we meet, said Everin. The ship is going to fail in two weeks' time. I plan to tow it back to the Drajan homeworld. I can take you back to where you should be. Getting me to the Drajan homeworld will be fine. I can secure a ship and go from there. Everin shook his head. There are... Temporal considerations to take into account. Sandus's eyes widened. What? A muted alarm blared out across the ship. Everin perused his ARI, and then said, Get to the Torvata. It appears we have company. Three human ships, along with a fourth unknown one, are headed here. They just dropped out of condensed space. Ugh, not the humans again, said Sandus. He extended a furry hand. No offense. None taken. Let's go, said Emily. Chapter 4 Draven Praetor Draxus paced around the command deck of his space cruiser. His eyes were drawn to the blinking icons on the large uniform screen that covered the front half of the room. His crew had found the ship they were tracking, but they were not the only ones who found it. He analyzed the signatures of the other three ships— one was docked to the tracked ship, while the other two were a bit away, but coming in fast. He sighed as he clasped his blue hands behind his back. The signature of the ships was well known to him. Humans. They always seem to be one step ahead of us. Praetor, your orders, said one of the crew manning a workstation. Dock with that ship so I can board it. After that... Handle those other ships coming in. You're going alone? Yes. Unless you wish to fight a Dominion hunting pack. I suspect one has boarded already. I don't know why they want that ship, but it appears to have advanced technology. Something that might help us end human occupation, said Draxus. Yes, sir. Moving to dock. Draxus glanced around his crew. It was the only surviving one from the Ninth Fleet. Humans had launched a surprise attack on the fleet, and the devastation was thorough. A handful of ships had escaped, but over the last two years, all but his had been destroyed. He gritted his teeth at the scourge called humanity. Appearing out of nowhere and decimating not only his race, the Dravens, but also the Draven's allies and enemies alike. Humanity was what they called themselves, but he called them a death plague. Having to defend against technology never seen before was a daunting challenge, one Draxus and other Praetors were born to resolve. He and his crew were the last Dravens born from their mother, the Arkara. Their ship moved into position along the tracked ship. After a moment, it had docked with one of the hatch-like entries. I'm not sure if this entry point will work, said the crew member. It's the closest thing to the one that we've scanned. I'm running an analysis on it now. Very good. I shall prepare for battle then. Hopefully, we'll not only capture a human hunter and their pack, we'll also get some technology out of this. The four-person crew faced Draxus. They tapped their chests with their fists, and then extended their arms out with fists still clenched. Draxus returned the Draven salute. We've been through a lot, and we'll continue to. It's no accident we are where we are. You're one of the toughest crews to ever come out of our Arkara. She may be gone, but we are her legacy. For the Dravens! For the Dravens! said the crew, cheering. Draxus nodded at the crew and then headed off to the armory on the ship. When he got there, he pulled out the various components of his battle suit. A smile crept onto his face at how many mistook what the dark blue under armor did. He slid it on and adjusted it. It molded to his body, then exuded a light, 
dim purple glow. That was the life force of his Arcara waiting for him to channel it. As a Praetor, he was unique in his clan. Only one per clan was born with Praetor abilities. That and a small defense force was usually all that was needed to defend the clan. Others were born with lesser abilities and forms, but it was the Praetor that was responsible for the main defense. His eyes watered as the image of his Arcara, a large, tree-like being, flashed through his mind. She had gone up in flames. All the birthing and feeding pods that hung from the branches were burned. In her last moments, she reached out to him and enhanced his already formidable power with the last of her strength. He would have died from the attacking ship's weapon fire if it weren't for his Arkara's last gesture. Before he died, he would find another suitable Arkara to consume him. These humans would pay, one way or another. He regained his focus as he put on his metallic boots. The green leg and chest armor were relatively thin compared to the boots. The metallic gauntlets were similarly thin, like gloves. He put on his shoulder mantle and then adjusted the forearm gauntlets. After a quick look around, he found his helmet. It covered his short orange mohawk and had an open area that was comprised of a rectangular eye slot that spanned the face then went vertical over his nose and mouth. A rhombus-shaped metal extension sat centered on top of the helmet and ran the full length of it. The strong, brown, bristle, hair-like fibers of his arcara jutted out from the extension, standing straight. He paused to look in a nearby mirror, ensuring that everything was ready to go. No weapons were needed, as he could form them at will, in addition to the wide variety of uses of a morphable field. With a deep breath, he exited the armory. When he got to the docking hallway, he took a moment to focus. A purple aura surrounded him, and his eyes began to slightly glow purple. He sealed the docking hallway entrance, then tapped at an interface on his palm. I'm going in. May our Arkara smile on you today, Praetor, said one of the crew members over the communication channel. Draxus opened the opposing door, allowing him entry into the ship. Once he stepped through, he closed the door and contacted the crew. Go. Take care of those filthy human ships. His eyes glowed intensely for a moment. This human hunter pack is mine. May the Arkaras bless us, said the crew member. Draxus could hear the ship pulling away. His ship should be more than capable of handling several hunter ships. He tapped at an interface on the top of his hand and then extended his hand, palm forward. A light yellow beam shot out. He waved his arm around to scan the room. The atmosphere registered as breathable, and the lighting seemed normal. A voice surrounded him. Draxus could not understand what was being said, but he knew it was a language of some type. Undeterred, he aimed forward with his hand extended. A purple blast shot out from his hand and blew the door open. This was one docking hallway door that would not be used again. He stepped into the large docking bay and scanned around. Nothing out of the ordinary was registering. His eyebrows wrinkled. This ship must truly be alien. He exited the docking bay and headed out. After a few tunnels, he reached a cryopod room. He cautiously approached the first cryopod and peeked in, then jumped back. Whoever these aliens were, it appeared they kept their victims in storage. Maybe for a meal on the trip. He checked another cryopod and saw a different alien. Scanning them showed that neither alien was in the Draven database. The ship was definitely not from around the area. That meant that if he could capture the ship, the Dravens might finally have an edge, if there was anything of worth on it. His attention snapped to the other side of the room, where two humanoids, one younger and the other older, and a small, furry alien in a light armor suit burst into the room. A flying orb hovered near them. Apparently, the aliens did not like him snooping around. They did not appear to be warriors 
and a quick scan did not reveal what they were. They looked human, but were not reading as humans. Maybe they were coming to select a snack. Unfortunately for them, this was one snack that could fight. He narrowed his eyes as the shielding around him intensified. He shook his hand, causing a purple energy sword to materialize. He was not sure if the aliens would understand him, but he would try to communicate. What species are you? Ah, uh, human, said the older humanoid. Draxus's eyes flared. They must have a translator of some sort. The thought of why it did not work earlier was drowned out by a surge of hatred. Maybe this was a new type of human. He gritted his teeth and in a deep, grizzled voice said, Then your death will be quick. Emily extended her PSD into a baton. Hold on there. We're not here to fight you. Since receiving the order to get to the Torvada, she had to hustle along with the others. Multiple aliens had boarded the ship, and Zeta-12 had transferred himself to his mobile form and initiated self-destruct against Everin's wishes, probably to keep any secrets and also as a final deterrent. The Torvada was only a bit away, and now... A large, blue, humanoid alien with a glowing purple aura who seemed to hate humans was in their way. The alien pointed at the group. You face Draxus, the Draven Praetor of the 45th Clan. He tapped his chest twice with his free arm and then extended it out with fist still clenched. As he charged forward, he shot a purple beam out from his hand. Emily burst into action activating her energy shield and absorbing the beam. She returned fire with a repulsion beam. Draxus paused for a moment as he slid back some. He's a heavy, said Emily. Dr. Snowden fired a mist beam, causing a cloud to form around Draxus. V flew overhead and shot a stun beam, causing the cloud to burst with electrical arcs. Draxus winced and then screamed. After a moment, his shield pulsed and pushed the mist away. His sword dissipated, and he extended both arms and shot a beam from each hand. Emily and Dr. Snowden raised their shields, blocking the beam, while Sandus jumped behind them. Draxus tilted his head. Sandus peeped out and then took aim and fired a laser shot. The laser beam was absorbed by Draxus's purple shield. That's not a normal shield, said Sandus. Dr. Snowden talked into his PSD. Everin, we have a crazy alien trying to kill us. Everin did not respond. Emily glanced at Dr. Snowden. Her eyes flared as she extended her baton into a staff. She danced forward, and when she reached Draxus, she swept his legs out from under him. As Draxus fell, he shot a purple tendril out that hit V. With a swing down, V crashed into Emily, knocking her to the floor. The tendril dissipated. No, said Dr. Snowden as he charged forward. He covered Draxus in white, sticky globules. Draxus concentrated, and the globules melted and slid off his shielding. He stood up and fired another tendril at Dr. Snowden's shield. With a yank, Dr. Snowden fell forward. Sandus tossed a device that stuck on Draxus's shielding. Draxus stared at the device for a moment. It pulsed and then exploded into his shield, causing him to go flying back. Emily jumped up and rushed over to Draxus. Draxus's tendril was still connected to Dr. Snowden, and he had been pulled along. Draxus began to reel Dr. Snowden in. Emily blocked one of Draxus's blasts. Her face turned a shade of red as she placed her staff through Draxus's shielding, with the end point on his neck. Her voice raised. I'm not sure why you're attacking us, but you'll stop now. This ship is about to explode and we're trying to leave, but you're in our way. We don't want to fight you, but if you push me or hurt my friends, you're going to wish you hadn't. Draxus's eyes widened. How can your weapon penetrate my shield? He retracted the tendril that was on Dr. Snowden's shield. Emily's eyes narrowed. I'd love to tell you, but we need to go. Like, now. She pulled her staff back. Sandus helped Dr. Snowden up, and then, with V in tow, 
they hustled up to Emily. She extended a hand toward Draxus. Draxus eyed Emily's hand for a moment and then accepted it. As he stood, he said, You're not quite like the humans I know. Sandus laughed as he waved a finger in the air. Oh, he thinks you're one of those tentacle humans. Draxus tilted his head at Sandus. What is this creature saying? Oh, uh, no translator, said Dr. Snowden. Well, he's saying that you probably think we're one of the tentacled humans, but I can tell you with certainty we aren't. He shook his head. They may call themselves human, but I've never seen them before. Draxus narrowed his eyes as his shield dissipated. I have a lot of questions. Get in line, everyone seems to, said Dr. Snowden. I'm Dr. Albert Snowden. He pointed in sequence at Emily, Sandus, and V. That's my niece, Emily, and that's Sandus and V. He interacted with his PSD and tried to reach Everin. Everin's not responding. That's weird, said Emily. V, can you reach him? I will try, said V. After a moment, he flew up and shot down a holographic projection. It showed from the viewpoint of Everin's chest, and he was fighting a small army of various robots and a petite human female with tentacles. He's under attack. Let's go, said Dr. Snowden. He hustled to the room exit with Sandus and Emily in tow. Emily paused at the exit and looked at Draxus. Draxus shook his head. Your friend is most likely already dead. However, I don't think you're the same as the humans I fight. I will join this battle. I think he'll probably be just fine. All right, let's move, 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 said Emily as she hustled out of the room with Draxus following her. Draxus followed the strange humans down the hallway. He was not sure what to make of them, but Emily being able to place her staff through his shielding was alarming. It should not have been possible, yet it had just occurred. She must be the warrior of the group, while Dr. Snowden appeared to be more cautious. Sandus was a curious creature, unlike anything Draxus had seen before. V was like most drones he knew in form, but the holographic and stun beams were new. Emily seemed confident of the one known as Everin. She probably did not understand the magnitude of power arrayed before him. Draxus knew that Everin was probably dead by now. The group hustled through multiple hallways until they reached a docking bay twenty minutes later. Draxus assessed the situation. These strange humans and company would be no match for what he saw. The human pack leader was engaged in battle with a fair-skinned humanoid who looked similar to Emily and Dr. Snowden. That must be Everin. How he was still alive was perplexing. His outfit was unusual looking more like an adventurer's suit than one meant for battle. What surprised Draxus was how efficiently Everin was not only deflecting blows, but taking out multiple enemies that came too close. Everin glided through the battle scene with poise, spinning, kicking, and hitting in smooth sequence. He seemed to be able to do that due to the speed at which he moved. Another orb in the fight seemed to be flying around, trying to avoid getting hit. Draxus knew the robots well. There were usually five heavily armored human sentinels that accompanied every hunter pack. The sentinels were larger than the other robots, carried more firepower, had stronger shielding, and were lethal in combat. They were the muscle of any human hunting pack. The small, thin humanoid robots were the common foot soldiers of the Terran Dominion. They could transform into a smaller form, allowing them to be transported in great quantities to where they needed to go. In the back were four-legged transports with no heads. A rotating laser cannon sat on each transport's back. Draxus exhaled. Flying in the air were smaller drones, but they seemed to be engaged with V, who was effortlessly taking them down while dodging fire. These new humans needed help. Before Draxus could react, Emily had joined the fray, knocking a soldier back with one end of her staff while shooting a blast out of the other end, causing more soldiers to go tumbling. 
Dr. Snowden and Sandus had pulled out their weapons and were picking off the soldiers and drones. Draxus rushed out toward Everin. When Draxus approached, he formed his sword and sliced through one sentinel. The pack leader turned toward Draxus and momentarily drew his head back. Draxus grinned. The leader now knew a draven praetor had joined the battle. Emily fired sticky globules at the leader's feet. Everin hit the leader in the chest, pushing it to the ground. He placed one end of his staff on the hunter's chest. After a moment, it writhed as blue electrical arcs danced over its body. It stopped moving. Draxus was not sure how a leader could be disabled so quickly, but the three other sentinels were still attacking, along with about half the soldiers and drones still intact. The transports were firing in sync, but their lasers could not penetrate Dr. Snowden's and Emily's forearm shields. Draxus was unsure what type of shield they possessed that could do that. He focused on the battle, as the pack had most likely called in reinforcements already. Everin whirled into action and batted one sentinel into the wall. When it hit, the wall cracked, and the sentinel fell to the ground and stopped moving. He ran toward the second, dodging the blasts tossed his way, and when he was about halfway to it, he shot out a beam that pulled the sentinel forward. When the sentinel was dragged off his feet and yanked through the air, Everin retracted the yellow beam, jumped, and hit the sentinel with his staff. The sentinel crashed to the ground and skidded to a halt. It stopped moving. Emily spun in circles, blocking lasers with her shield while knocking the soldiers around. She reached the transports and began disabling them by knocking out their cannons. Dr. Snowden would stun a soldier, and Sandus would hit it with his weapon, causing the soldier to stop. By the time Draxus had used his blast to take down another sentinel, only one was left and a handful of soldiers. The drones were obliterated by V, and Emily had made quick work of the transports, who were stumbling around. The last sentinel was near Dr. Snowden and had opened fire with its heavy weapon. Dr. Snowden raised his shield and reflected the laser fire, shredding the sentinel. Over there, said Dr. Snowden as he fired a mist beam at two soldiers trying to fire at Emily. V flew over and ignited the cloud in a burst of electricity. The soldiers fell. The remaining soldiers were no match for Everin and Emily, who seemed to fight in a whirlwind of hits, kicks, and blasts. This group was beyond anything Draxus had seen before. Appearances were deceiving, as they handled a hunter pack with relative ease. That was not a small feat, and he knew many dravens who had fallen to just one pack. Everin placed a device on the leader's body. The device glowed red and blue. Everin tapped around in the air. Draxus pointed at the device. What is that? He was not sure that Everin would understand him. An information device, said Everin. I do not know anything of this being, who somehow believes it is human. They are human, said Draxus. I have been fighting them since I was brought into existence. Everin eyed Draxus for a moment and then picked up the device that had been used on the hunter's body. I am Everin. He pointed at the orb that had been avoiding getting hit. That is Zeta-12, the AI that ran this ship. I do not mean to cut short this introduction, but we should talk elsewhere. We can leave via my ship, the Torvata. I have my own ship, said Draxus. Everin looked down for a moment. There was a battle outside. I assume your ship was not one of the human ones. Your ship did not make it. What? asked Draxus with wide eyes. He tapped at his palm and saw that there was no connection to his ship. I am sorry, but several more ships have arrived. We need to leave now. There is another ship docking nearby. How can I trust what you say is true? They could just be out of range. You can verify once we are on my ship and out of harm's way. Draxus sighed as he closed his eyes. It seemed there was no choice. I agree to this temporary arrangement. Everin slightly bowed. Let us go. Draxus followed the others as they headed to a nearby docking bay. He surveyed the carnage they had just dispensed. 
It was obvious to him now that this group was not from this region of space. He did not think they were invaders, but maybe they were scouts of another force. They offered him safe harbor aboard their ship, which seemed unusual to him. After ten minutes, they reached the docking bay where another hunter ship had landed. Draxus had not detected a docking bay in the initial scans. He suspected the hunter pack they had just fought got on board, figured out the layout, and then signaled for the other to come in. There were other ships in the bay, but none that he could see that would be able to fight the hunter ships, much less escape. Everin pointed at the Torvata. There. Move. Draxus wrinkled his eyebrows. The ship was small, circular in design, and had no apparent weapons or engine on it. The ship was absurd, but with the group moving, he would reserve judgment until he was inside. He followed Everin. As they approached the Torvata, he noticed that a pack leader and several sentinels and guards had reached it before them. Another pack. He grimaced as his shielding pulsed in preparation for another fight. Everin aimed his staff and fired. Boom! The hunter, sentinels, and robots went flying back. Draxus was not sure what that weapon was, but he liked it. They reached the edge of the Torvata. Everin gestured in as the group hustled past him. Draxus paused. I am not sure this is wise. The Torvata is more than it appears to be. I understand that trust has to be earned. But believe me, the Torvata is the safest place to be right now. Draxus sighed. With his ship gone, assuming that was true, this was the only option available. His multiple hearts hurt at the thought that his crew probably fought to their last breath. I am sure your crew fought well. However, this ship is going to explode in less than a minute. Draxus lowered his head, then entered the Torvata. His eyes searched the interior. The ship had an unusual layout. As he walked by one of the six doors to his left, he noticed that they extended farther than the ship should allow. Looking toward the front, he saw that Dr. Snowden and Sandus sat in a U-shaped seating area off to the right, while Emily sat on the left side. Everin had entered and sat in a large command chair. V was interacting with a U-shaped console in the open front area. Zeta-12 hovered next to V. Draxus walked over to Everin. Everin gestured at a seat next to Emily. I don't bite, said Emily. Perhaps not, said Draxus. But you fight as if you could. Emily raised her eyebrows as Draxus took his seat. Now we wait, said Everin. All those aliens in suspended animation are going to die, said Dr. Snowden. Everin raised a finger. Yes, a self-destruct was not needed. However, I now believe they were not meant to be here. He looked at Santus, Zeta-12, and then Draxus. None of you are. This needs to be corrected, and I believe that is why I am here. V. Set Torvata Scan Profile 1. He glanced at Draxus. While in the Torvata, you will be able to understand everyone via a unique translator without the need of translation nanobots. Draxus nodded. He was curious to hear Zeta-12 and Sandus speak since he had not understood them so far. "'What will Scan Profile 1 do?' asked Zeta-12. "'It will put the Torvata into a mode that will not show up on scanners. If there are any long-range detectors, it will appear we blew up with the ship. Although your ship will destruct, no harm will come to the Torvata.' "'The laws of physics would disagree with that assessment.' Zeta-12. There is much you do not understand. Trust me on this. I will take you back to the Drajan homeworld, said Everin. Draxus observed the crew. Everin was the clear leader. His speech was odd, but he commanded respect. From what Draxus had seen, Everin was a capable fighter and seemed to be level-headed. Emily was a fighter, too. She was the first to jump into battle without a moment's hesitation. Dr. Snowden was calm and collected and seemed to be the wise one. Although Draxus was not sure what a niece was, apparently Emily was Dr. Snowden's. Maybe it was a rank. 
Zeta-12 seemed to be combative, but maybe because he was an AI, although the one called V seemed to be friendly. Then there was Sandus, a curious creature. You have been quiet, said Everin, glancing at Draxus. I'm just trying to make sense of all of this. We haven't moved yet. I agree with Zeta-12. We will not survive this ship exploding. My ship is unique and will survive the explosion. I will have to trust you on that, said Draxus as he clasped his hands in front of him and looked down. The front screen lit up, showing the ship exploding around them. Draxus closed his eyes and braced for impact, expecting to be tossed around. After a moment of nothing happening, he opened his eyes and peered around. Everyone was staring at him. I felt no movement. How is this possible? Everin half smiled. I am glad you are curious. That is a good trait to possess. The Torvata's shielding is unique. Although force may act on the Torvata, it does not transfer internally, except for some special cases. That is beyond anything I have ever seen, said Draxus. And will ever see, said Everin. Draxus looked at the front screen. The docking bay was gone, and in its place was open space with debris. An overhead view of the immediate area only showed the Torvata. He tapped at his palm. If his crew was still there, they should be able to contact him. After a moment of silence, he gritted his teeth as his face scrunched up. His crew was gone. It was as Everin had said. Draxus exhaled from his mouth. He now needed to find another crew to carry on his mission. His crew did not even get to be consumed by another Arkara. Their experiences were forever lost. He had let them down. Finding another crew would be difficult, and from what he was gathering from these strangers, they were eager to do other things. He was not sure he fully understood the cryptic suggestion that he was not supposed to be there. V turned and faced the group. Analysis. All human ships were destroyed in the explosion. I would hope so, said Zeta-12. Anything within range would have, except this ship, it seems. Sandus raised a claw. That is very strange, yes, very, very strange. Draxus wrinkled his eyebrows. Sandus's voice seemed to have changed in translation as well. So, who are you? asked Sandus, gesturing at Draxus. I could call you the big blue guy with a purple shield. Ha! A bruiser! Draxus raised his eyebrows. I am Draxus, Draven Praetor of the 45th Clan. He pointed at Sandus. I thought you were a pet of some type. A pet, said Sandus. Emily and Dr. Snowden smiled. There is a lot to cover, said Everin. Come to the conference room, and we can go over the situation and determine our next steps. Draxus watched as everyone stood. He glanced at Sandus. Sandus shrugged. After you, big guy, but don't try to pet me. I had not intended to, said Draxus as he stood. Sandus shook his head as they headed to the conference room. Chapter 5 Sandus looked around the conference room as he took his seat. The room should not exist, yet he was sitting in it. Draxus had a similar look of confusion and probably a lot of questions. The room had a large rectangular table with seats around it and what looked like a matter replicator in a side area, although it was unlike any replicator he had seen before. It was apparent that this group knew who the information broker was, although Sandus was not sure how that was possible. He recalled hearing of Everin before, but it was mostly unverified information. Draxus was an enigma. Being called a pet was something Sandus found comical. Draxus was not any species that Sandus had heard of or seen before. It was not lost on him that this was probably a very unique experience. He observed as everyone took their seat. Everin gestured around the table. I am sure this is very confusing to all involved. 
Before I begin, let me introduce everyone. I will start with myself. I am Everin, and I travel through space, time, and beyond. This is more detail than I would normally share, but we are dealing with a temporally shielded ship that is aware of timeline changes. He pointed at Dr. Snowden and then Emily. This is Dr. Albert Snowden, and to his left is Emily Snowden, his niece. They travel with me. He nodded at V. The floating orb is V, also my companion. Draxus narrowed his eyes. What is a niece? We will get to that in a moment, said Everin. He gestured at Sandus. This is Sandus, the last of his kind. Based on his ship's logs that Zeta-12 provided, he is from A.D. 2008. I assume it's still A.D. 2008, although Zeta-12 seems to think otherwise, said Sandus. I will get to that as well, said Everin. He motioned at Zeta-12's holographic form. This is Zeta-12, an artificial intelligence that resided on the ship that just exploded. What you see is all that is left of him. I am glad to still exist, said Zeta-12. Everin nodded. And finally, Draxus. I do not know much about your species, but it is obvious it is different from humanity. Quite different, said Draxus. With introductions out of the way, here is the situation, said Everin. He tapped at the table console, causing a projection of the Milky Way galaxy to appear. The route that Zeta-12 took appeared as a red line. Everin highlighted a point in the line that veered off into another galactic quadrant. I now believe, based on both Zeta-12's logs and the logs transferred from Sandus's ship, that a space-time eddy was at play. They are formed from space-time rifts that have dissipated and usually fade out on their own over a short amount of time. He raised a finger. However, in this scenario, one stuck around, one with a lot of residual power still, which is unusual in itself, but not unheard of. Sandus was pulled into it around A.D. 2008, and Zeta-12 was pulled in around A.D. 6308. There may be others, and there is the possibility that they were kicked out of it at different times. I suspect that is where this new version of humanity came from. Dr. Snowden cleared his throat. So, Sandus and Zeta-12 got kicked out around the same time. If this new version of humanity was kicked out earlier, they would have had time to form, said Dr. Snowden, waving a hand in the air. Uh, whatever it is, they formed. That is correct, said Everin. That is my current hypothesis. Sandus was not sure what he was hearing. To so casually speak of cosmic events like it was an everyday thing was unusual. So... How do we get back, then? The Torvata can take Zeta-12 to the Drajan homeworld in the current time. Draxus we can take back to wherever he needs to be in the current time. However, you... I will need to think about. Sandus's eyes widened. Oh, really? I do not believe this meeting was random. Sandus looked around the table, then back at Everin. All right. And just to be clear... You're not going to kill me, or eat me, or anything, right? I taste horrible if dinner is in your eyes. Emily and Dr. Snowden chuckled. Of course not, said Everin. For the moment, you need to stick around. Sandus swished his nose around a bit. You sure you aren't keeping me around because of how handsome and charming I am? Dr. Snowden and Emily laughed. I am sure of it, said Everin with a half-smile. However... I am curious as to why you were in a place to get pulled in. Oh, well, I had received information about an anomaly, one with temporal signatures. I didn't want to rely on anyone else, so I decided to check it out myself, said Sandus. Intellectual curiosity is in your nature, said Everin. That, or 
I wanted to be the first to analyze the anomaly. An adventurous spirit. Draxus cleared his throat. I don't mean to interrupt, but I have some questions. Everin waved a hand out. Please proceed. My clan's Arcaro was destroyed, said Draxus. My only goal was to eradicate the human threat. By all means necessary. We're aware of time travel and its paradoxes, but have never seen it before. It would appear that if you... fix the after-effects of the space-time eddy, then the new humans would go away, and possibly... My Arkara would still be alive. Is this correct? Everin studied Draxus for a moment. An astute observation. Humanity should not exist out here, based upon my knowledge. I am not familiar with Arkaras. Draxus tapped at his palm interface and then extended his hand out. A projection shot up. This is my Arkara from whence I was born. Sandus narrowed his black eyes as he studied the large, tree-like being with multiple trunks. Green pods with brown tendrils hung from the branches, with another series of pods that ringed the base of the tree. Smaller, plant-like structures surrounded the main one, with vines of some sort connecting them. A moldy-looking green creep surrounded the base. This was not new to him, as he had seen species that were plant-like in nature. It is clear to me, then, said Draxus, raising his head a bit, that I am to assist you in fixing the after-effects of the space-time eddy. You mentioned that this meeting may not be random. I would agree. Perhaps this was always meant to happen. I would formally ask to join this crew for the duration of this campaign. Everin faced Draxus. Understand that I try to avoid time refugees. He glanced at Dr. Snowden and Emily for a moment. I am not always successful. He faced Draxus. I agree that your and Sandus's presence here is not random. There are ways around becoming a time refugee, but I usually avoid it completely. I need to think about your request. Draxus nodded. I appreciate the consideration. Well, I want in, said Sandus. This sounds like an adventure with lots and lots of information to be had. You can take me back afterward. Everin eyed Sandus. I will think about it. He faced Draxus. One thing to note is that you are rare. Although I do not know your species, I know you are a wild-born conduit. I'm a draven and unfamiliar with what a wild-born conduit is, said Draxus. Yeah, me too, said Dr. Snowden. The others nodded in agreement. Everin looked around the table for a moment and then focused on Draxus. Wild energy is a type of exotic energy that exists everywhere in varying densities. It can bind to living beings, creating a hybrid known as a wildborn. Sometimes, the hybrid is more wild energy than living being, and they can channel the wild energy on command. I have seen something similar to your energy signature, said Everin, tossing a finger out and waving it between Dr. Snowden and Emily, on their home world. So this wild energy is my Arkara's life force, said Draxus. You can call it what you want, but that is what it is. Draxus clenched his jaw for a moment. A praetor is unique. A clan only has one. This must mean that all praetors are wild-born conduits. Perhaps. I am unfamiliar with your species' reproduction method, but suspect your Arkara is wild-born. May I scan your data device? Draxus exhaled from his nose and offered up his hand. If it helps, then of course. Everin extended his hand and then used his ring to scan Draxus's glove. 
After the scan was complete, Everin looked around his ARI and then interacted with the table console. Sandus observed the projections that shot up from the center of the table. One showed a green planet. The other images showed various dravens and assorted life forms that Sandus was not familiar with. He pointed at the image of the Arcara. So your mother is a plant? The Arcara is more than just a plant and can create organic containers that spawn what is needed. Praetors, workers, soldiers. So that's why you didn't know what a niece is. It's just mother and child, said Emily. Yes. Each clan has one Arcara, and when we die, our bodies are recycled back to it. But not always to the same Arcara. Wow, said Dr. Snowden. If you are like the version of humanity I know, then your species does not do this, said Draxus. Well, not sure how the humans out here do it, but in our version, we have a female and a male, as far as sexes go, said Dr. Snowden. Emily's a female, and I'm a male. It takes both to procreate. Emily's father and I had the same female birth us, our mother, so we're related. And that makes her my niece. I understand, said Draxus. Everin raised a finger. The Dravens favor centralized reproduction, whereas humans use decentralized reproduction. There are advantages to both, as well as disadvantages. Draxus tilted his head, having the ability to create, in so many, would help if disaster strikes. Dr. Snowden wrinkled his eyebrows. I guess it would, but having an Arcara... It sounds like it would be easier to care for if everyone is dedicated to serving and defending it. Yes. And I failed. I was no match for these new humans. I am glad that you are not like them, said Draxus. He glanced at Sandus. I'm sorry to hear you are the last of your kind. A great tragedy must have befallen your species. Sandus bobbed his head. It's a long story. We can go over it at some point, said Everin. Our next steps need to be defined. I would like to establish a baseline on the current status of Earth, Fedoria, and Kriegis first, prior to taking Zeta-12 and potentially Sandus and Draxus back to where they need to go. However, I think it is important for us to see these new humans from Draxus's perspective. He motioned at Draxus to proceed. Draxus cleared his throat as he looked around the room. He was still unsure of what to think of this group, but they were not like the humans he knew. Although he had heard of time travelers, to see some was a unique experience. They were curious about the new humans, something he had had knowledge of since he was born. He tapped at his palm causing the projection over the table to change. He wrinkled his eyebrows. The ship had somehow tied into his data device. Even the ship, which they called the Torvada, was unique. Hopefully, they would allow him to travel with them, not only to eradicate the new version of humanity, but also to learn about their version of humanity. This crew possessed power that he could only imagine. The projection changed to show a galactic regional map with regional colored areas. Draxus pointed around. These are the domains of the humans. They control dozens of systems, are highly advanced, and are split into multiple groups. He pointed at the red shaded region. That's the Terran Dominion. We call them Dominion for short. They're genetically engineered and have one A.I. called Salazar to service them all. He gestured at the blue-shaded region. That's the domain of the Golkash Alliance, a loose group of human clans, less advanced than the other groups, but they have a much larger population, and no A.I.s are allowed. That seems like an odd distinction, said Dr. Snowden. In terms of the A.I., that is... Draxus nodded. I don't know why it is that way. But this next region, 
he said, pointing at the green area, as multiple AIs and humans living together. They call themselves the United Planets. I don't know much about them, but they seem to be a haven for AI and human alike. We've met them before, said Emily. They're the good guys. But then again, who knows out here? Maybe they are. But they are so far away from my home world that I haven't interacted with them, said Draxus. He waved a finger at the various small purple regions scattered around. The outcasts lay claim to those areas. They are made up of loosely affiliated clans and are the most brutal, attacking human and alien alike, including some of our colonies. They're very unusual. As in, said Sandus, narrowing his eyes, they sometimes eat other humans, but their appetite also extends to aliens. They have a foul odor, and also tend to be more brutal toward my species. Their equipment and apparel are also less uniform than the other factions. They seem to enjoy wearing their victims' remains on their armor. Huh, said Sandus. Sounds like the outer rib may be out here. Been there, said Emily. Sandus tapped his claws together in front of him. I see. Draxus cleared his throat while he touched his palm, causing a blinking green dot to appear on the projection. This is my home system. We used to control several solar systems, but we have lost ground. Now the Dravens are nomads, seeking to exist where there are no humans, but we also are fighting back, or trying to. Dr. Snowden raised a finger. Why are humans attacking you? It seems to vary. The Dominions say it is their destiny to bring enlightenment to us, while outcasts see us as prey for their amusement, and the Gull Cash Alliance sees us as slaves. We've had no interaction with the United Planets due to distance, said Draxus. Of the three we've interacted with, the Dominion is the least dangerous faction. They conquer a world, divide it up and use its resources, but allow us to continue living if we agree to certain conditions. Each planet region is given to a human to manage. I don't understand why they do this, but it has something to do with how their society is set up. If outcasts attack, it is a given that no one will survive. And if it's the Gull Cash Alliance, then my people are shipped around. Your people should not have to deal with this at all, said Everin. Draxus sighed. I wish it were so. My Arkara was killed by an outcast raid, and then the area was taken over by the Dominion. They then appointed a human to rule us. I and the remaining fleet of my clan regrouped and forged a plan to fight back. My crew, he said, looking down, was not only the last of our fleet, but the final members of my clan. I am the last survivor. He looked back up with eyes that flared purple for a moment. Emily frowned as she focused on Draxus. I'm so sorry to hear that. It is what it is, said Draxus. He raised his head a bit. However, it seems a new opportunity has arisen, one I would like to be a part of. Everin nodded. I understand where you are coming from. So this Dominion now controls your area? said Emily. Draxus nodded. We are in their domain, and they are the one faction I have a lot of information on. Their society is based on genetic engineering, from what I understand. Every human is altered to some degree. They also have cybernetic aspects that are developed from injected machine DNA. The leader of the hunting pack we met on Zeta-12's ship was altered to be just that. Sandus rubbed his chin. Genetic engineering. I'm familiar with that, 
Machine DNA? Not so much. Sounds like they're cyborgs. So those tentacles we saw on the pack leader's back could have been from machine DNA inserted into them. Yes, and it's been advantageous for the Dominion, it seems, said Draxus. I'm not familiar with how deep they go, but I do know that I've seen many variations of the human form. The one that controls my planet region on my homeworld is smaller than normal, and their general personality seems to be... cold. That sounds horrible, said Dr. Snowden. This dominion is not how I pictured humanity in the future. He glanced at Everin. I know you've traveled up and down humanity's timescape. Have you seen this before? Everin nodded. In the far future, yes. However... It was not malicious like what I am hearing. Draxus narrowed his eyes. The Dominion are an abomination of life. I understand, said Everin. It is apparent that they should not exist here. Draxus exhaled from his nose. Each faction has a star surrounded by their technology. I assume it gives them energy, and I believe it is the central seat of each faction— "'Surround stars? You mean a Dyson bubble?' asked Dr. Snowden. Draxus interacted with his palm, causing a projection to shoot up. It showed a star partially covered with structures orbiting it. Pieces of the star shone through the gaps. "'This is what took over the star in the Dominion home system. I'm not sure what a Dyson bubble is.' "'Wow,' said Dr. Snowden. "'Well, that's... Definitely one, it looks like. A Dyson bubble is just geosynchronous structures called statites around a star. They're held in place by radiation pressure. We've seen the beginning of one. This must be close to the finished product. Sandus pointed at the projection. You can see that there are energy collectors there, but I'm not seeing the usual structures associated with a Kasmarin swarm. That must require a lot of resources to build something like that. Dr. Snowden narrowed his eyes. A Kasmarin swarm? Everin raised a finger. Dyson is a term used by humans. Kasmarin is a Cregan term. I think we can just call it a megastructure. Sandus is right in that this projection for the Dominion seems to focus heavily on energy collectors. Interesting, said Draxus. They seem to gather material from the star itself, too. And also pulverize planets, asteroids, and anything in the system to convert to building material. Everin rubbed his chin. The arrangement of the energy collectors is familiar. When we get information from a Torvata scan, I will need to research it. He glanced at Draxus. Going back to the Dominion... You mentioned genetic engineering and gene tailoring for specific purposes. What other types of human variations have you seen? Many, said Draxus, clenching his jaw. He tapped at his palm, causing the projection over the table to change. It showed a list with the Draven term in one column, description in another, and then finally a sequence of images in the third. He pointed at the first row. Those are the governors and they manage planet regions. All I know of them is that they are as cold as machines, but seem to be the authority of any planet region. All altered humans, for whatever role, are similar in design. The governors look like Dr. Snowden and Emily, and the only thing I am aware of about governors is that they treat the natives as animals, at least until they are chipped. Emily tilted her head, Chipped as in sticking an implant in their body or something? A neural implant, yes. From what I understand, it causes dravens to act unusually, even friendly toward humans. He pointed at some of the other rows. There seems to be several templates, and from that, many variations from generalized to specialized. Sandus swished his nose around and pointed at the third column in one of the rows. Their eyes look like permanent goggles, and their skin, it's so pale. 
and where's their hair? I know humans wish they had fur like me, but they're taking it to the other extreme. Emily shook her head. Appearance is not important to them, said Draxus. We have seen smaller humans who can move fast, those who are impenetrable as solid rock, and even those with multiple appendages. Sandus tilted his head. Your species does the same, right? Well, minus the machine DNA part. We are born naturally for our purpose. We do use genetic engineering, but not on ourselves, more for our structures. For instance, we grow our buildings, food, and everything we need. However, the humans are altered after birth. Dr. Snowden's lips parted. You mean they're born normal and then altered to fit this weird system? At birth, they are given a generic template with the neural implant and physically altered, and at twenty years they specialize, but they are born as slaves under Salazar's control. They're robbing people of their lives, said Dr. Snowden. Let me guess. They're then brainwashed on top of all that. Yes, their neural implants enforce obedience and, I'm sure, influence them. That sucks, said Emily. How do they reproduce? Reproduction is controlled. From what I read, sexual desire is not present in all humans, although governors seem to be exempt from that. Reproduction is handled in a lab, and it does not seem to be a driving factor for the Dominion. With that said, I have heard governors do things with species they conquer, and not for reproductive reasons. Suppressing sexual desire would take a lot of genetic engineering, I'm guessing, said Emily. Draxus shrugged. I've never had it, so I wouldn't know. How do you know all of this? asked Emily. Draxus grimaced. We've caught a few humans, and we hacked into their implants. We've also hit some of their facilities and ships and gained information that way. Some leave the Dominion and are easier to capture for information. So they can leave if they want to, asked Sandus. I'd be out of there with two shakes of my tail. I have heard that after twenty years, very few want to leave. Everin looked around his ARI for a moment. I see that you have data on the various robots. You mentioned the Dominion only has one AI. Draxus nodded. They only use one AI. His eyes flared purple. Salazar. He won't allow another AI to exist. Virtual intelligences are common, though. I assume you understand what that is. We do, said Everin. He gestured at V and Zeta-12. They're both strong AIs. Analysis. Salazar does not want competition, said V. Maybe, said Draxus. I don't know why there is only one. What I do know is that Salazar is everywhere, that the Dominion is present. When we worked on taking out a neural implant from a worker to study it, it was Salazar that spoke through the worker and how they also found our Arkara's location. It would seem that the outcasts were monitoring and took advantage. From that, we learned that all humans in the Dominion are connected by some degree to Salazar. We were just trying to figure out what the new energy was that Salazar had come into possession of. It's one we've never seen before, but it was mentioned via several humans we captured. Everin perused his ARI for a moment, then flicked a finger toward the table. An image of a blue cloud with multiple shining points appeared. Is that it? Draxus nodded. Everin narrowed his eyes. Tacrin energy. It is used in temporal shielding. Dr. Snowden furrowed his eyebrows. Yeah, that doesn't sound good. This whole setup seems like how an AI would organize things, like managing resources. You think Salazar controls everything? I don't know, but Salazar seems to serve the humans, said Draxus. I'd like to meet this Salazar, said Zeta-12. Everin shook his head. 
you will be returned to the Drajan homeworld in the current time period. With the timeline corrected, it is possible that there may be two of you. However, you are an AI, so merging into one is possible. I'm glad I'm not organic then, said Zeta-12. Everin nodded. There's a lot of information for me to process. We can break for now and continue tomorrow. We will then meet at 9 a.m. Earth time. Zeta-12 and V, I will need both of you for research and analysis. Acknowledged, said V. Okay, said Zeta-12. Everin gestured at Draxus. Dr. Snowden can show you to your living quarters for now. He motioned to Sandus. Emily can show you to yours. It is appreciated, said Draxus. I hope you consider allowing me to join you in your campaign. Yeah, me too, said Sandus. Everin nodded at both of them. Sandus grinned big. Well then, Emily, lead on! Emily shook her head. Come on, let's go. Chapter 6 Dr. Snowden watched as the conference room emptied. It was just he and Draxus, whose size was daunting. Dr. Snowden figured Draxus was about eight feet tall. He had an intimidating presence. Dr. Snowden could see that the Draven Society was technologically advanced based on the idea of growing everything they needed through genetic engineering. The Arcara was strange to him, though. Draxus would be an interesting companion, assuming Everin allowed that. Dr. Snowden gestured toward the room exit. You ready? I'm always ready, said Draxus. Dr. Snowden nodded and exited the room. He turned his head halfway back to make sure Draxus was following him. After going two dimensional doorways down, they entered the living quarters. Draxus peered around. How is this room possible? Dimensional mechanics, said Dr. Snowden. He shook his hand out in front of him. I know, I know it sounds crazy, but it's real. I can see that. Dr. Snowden pointed at a room on the left side. His eye caught Emily and Sandus entering a room on the right side. Everin had sent a small layout of the living quarters to the conference room table, which highlighted where Sandus and Draxus would be staying. Dr. Snowden thought it was odd that they were on opposite sides, but maybe there was something he was missing. As they walked toward the room, Draxus said, This ship, the Torvata, I sense it is unique. Only one of its kind, trust me on that. I trust you. Dr. Snowden chuckled. Sorry, that's just a figure of speech. I see. Your ship has a translator for my language, yet I don't understand how. The translator is unique as well. Draxus nodded. It appears anything related to Everin is assuming he's the leader of this group. They reached the door. Dr. Snowden faced Draxus. It's his ship. Emily and I are just traveling companions. How did you meet him? Dr. Snowden opened the door and gestured in. I can explain inside. Draxus entered the room and paused to take it all in. Dr. Snowden followed, and the door closed. Draxus pivoted and observed the door for a moment, then strode into the middle of the room. I thank you for these accommodations. You'll love the bed. It has some neural effect that makes you sleep better. Draxus walked to the side of the bed. You lie down to sleep? Dr. Snowden raised his eyebrows. He had not even considered that an alien humanoid might sleep differently. Um, yeah... I'm guessing you don't? Draven sleep by meditation. We assume a seated position. Huh. Well, you can do that on the bed, too. How do Dominion humans sleep? Draxus narrowed his eyes. They stand in a chamber of some sort that seems to replenish them. That sounds uncomfortable. Anyways, if you want something else, we can replicate anything needed. Draxus interacted with his palm facing up. A projection shot up of an egg-shaped container made of wood strips and vines. 
The front was open, with cushions lining the inside. Can this be made? Dr. Snowden pulled up a menu that hovered in the air. I think so. Draxus walked around the menu, bobbing his head as he went. After a moment, the bed dissipated, and the structure that Draxus had requested stood in its place. There we go, said Dr. Snowden. Your technology is truly amazing. Dr. Snowden pointed at a receptacle in the wall. It looks like Everin has already integrated information from your device into the system. You can replicate any food there by just speaking its name. Same with drinks. If you want to access the hollow menu, just circle your finger in the air clockwise and poke at the center. I can change the room. Completely. Yep, make it however you want. Draxus pulled up the menu and browsed around in it. A moment later, the room changed to an outside setting with orange and green plant life. A projection on the wall showed a river off in the distance. Dr. Snowden studied the new environment. Is this from your home world? It is, said Draxus. He sat on a rock. It was before the humans burned it. His eyes narrowed. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, said Dr. Snowden. He took a seat on a rock opposite Draxus. I know this situation must be rough for you. Were you and your crew close? Draxus nodded. We were clanmates, born at the same time. They served with me in every mission, until this last one. I couldn't even return them to another Arkara for consumption. He looked down for a moment. They gave their lives fighting, dying with honor. I will remember them as such. He tapped his chest twice with a clenched fist, and then extended his arm forward. Dr. Snowden noted that Draxus had just lost his crew, but seemed remarkably calm. I didn't mean to bring up any bad memories. They're not bad memories, and they will not be forgotten. As long as I live, they live as well. The Arkara that consumes me will relay my information into the next generation. Dr. Snowden wagged a finger. About that... When your Arkara consumes you, do you mean that she, like, eats you? Draxus looked back up at Dr. Snowden and smiled. It is a great honor to be consumed by an Arkara. We are placed in pods, similar to our birthing ones, and the meditation pod over there. Once inside, it seals and we become one with the Arkara. From a technical perspective, we are liquefied. She is able to retain our memories and pass them on. In a sense, we are recycled. Whoa, genetic memory. Draxus nodded. The Dominion uses implants. Is that how your version of humanity does it? Not at all. When we die, that's it. When we're born, we can barely walk and we don't have any memories from anyone else. Interesting, said Draxus. Our Arkara gives us memories based on what she needs us to do. In my case, I was chosen to be a Praetor. Huh, said Dr. Snowden. Although I hate to say it, enslaving others and attacking what's different is a common theme in our history. But we have overcome that to some degree. I don't know what my version of humanity is supposed to be like in this time period, but Everin does. I suspect that United Planets Group is probably close to what we know, assuming Everin allows me to join in his crusade. Do you think we will get a chance to see your version? Dr. Snowden shrugged. He wants a baseline. So, yeah... I think so. Draxus eyed Dr. Snowden. How far away is it? About 80,000 light years or so. You speak as if that is a trivial distance. 
Dr. Snowden gestured around. The Torvata makes travel easy. Draxus nodded. Dr. Snowden pointed to a room off to the side. There's a workstation in there. It has a lot of information on it, although I suspect for you it will only show relative information. I understand. You don't trust me yet. Uh, it's not that. It, it's just... Everin tries to limit future information from being known. Historical, though, I don't think will be an issue. I see. I'll make use of it. Dr. Snowden exhaled from his mouth as he stood. All right. If you need anything, you can just pull up the menu and contact V or me. I'm not tired yet, so I may hit the planner cartography lab. Nor am I tired, said Draxus. What is this lab you speak of? Dr. Snowden grinned. It's a room-sized holographic display of the cosmos. I wanted to see the layout of this region of space, especially with your data in the system. Draxus looked away for a moment, then back at Dr. Snowden. You are going to tell me how you met Everin. Perhaps you can tell me in this lab. Sure. The Torvato will filter what can be shown around you, so I don't think that's a problem, said Dr. Snowden. He gestured toward the room exit. Let's see some stars. Emily smiled as she watched Santis look around his living area. He was upbeat and did not seem too concerned about the situation. Given all he knew as an information broker, maybe this was just another outing for him. She laughed as Santis ran and then jumped on the bed before hopping off it. He was like a rocket shooting around the room while scanning everything. She tossed a hand out. You can replicate anything you need by using a hollow menu. Sandus paused while standing on one of the chairs. Really? Show me! She circled her finger in the air and then poked the center. Sandus reciprocated the movement. His eyes lit up at the menu hovering before him. He interacted with it for a minute, causing the environment to change to a forest. His whiskers wiggled as he dug deeper into the menu. Soothing forest sounds echoed throughout the room. The bed disappeared and was replaced by a large tree with a platform on one of the lower branches. A foam mattress appeared nearby with blankets. Oh, I like this. I've seen replicators of all levels, but this, this is different. Yep, I'm not sure if the neural effect that makes you sleep better will work if you change the environment, but I guess you'll find out. Sandus circled his finger counterclockwise and poked the center, causing the menu to dissipate. Emily was not surprised that Sandus had picked up how to use the menu. His profession probably dictated that he be able to learn and adapt on the move. Sandus took a seat on a tree stump, being careful to place his bushy tail to the side. So... What a situation, huh? Emily sat on a log perpendicular to him. Yeah. This must be routine for you. At least you act that way. Well, I don't think it's ever routine. But if you have the right mindset, you can tackle anything. He grinned. An optimist! He pointed a claw at her. I like it. She enjoyed his enthusiasm for life. Despite all the crazy things that had occurred and the chaotic moments, it was nice to be around someone like that. It's better than being down all the time, although I've had my share of those. Hmm. I sense you've suffered greatly in the past. Emily half smiled while wrinkling her eyebrows. You sensed? Well, that fight on the ship gave me a lot of information on everyone. And for me... You think I've suffered greatly in the past? Sandus nodded. You have a generous disposition, yet in that fight, you waded into battle without a moment's hesitation. No fear. None. That's just experience. Perhaps. But you're human. And young. That level of experience usually comes later in life, so something must have sped it up. Emily licked her lips. Could be. Sandus raised a claw. Another point of interest. You're Dr. Snowden's niece. That means your father isn't available. Either he's dead, or he doesn't know about this. You don't seem the type that would lie to your father. I'd wager he's dead. 
her throat constricted. And your reaction to that verifies it for me. But I'm not done yet. That alone would be tragic. But not tragic enough to make you a battle-hardened fighter. No, there was something else. Something deeply personal. Something that stripped you down and allowed you to rebuild into what you are now. Emily averted her eyes as she looked at the ground. On top of that, the bond between you and Everin is apparent. You were willing to risk it all to help him. I suspect in the dark events that made you what you are now, it was him that helped you out. She cleared her throat. You seem to have a good read on me. I know, right? Asked Sandus with a big grin. I, I, I don't mean to make you uncomfortable, but reading people is important in what I do. It can mean the difference between life and death, literally. Okay, well, what about Uncle Albert? Asked Emily. Sandus rubbed his furry chin. Hmm, he's a scholar of some sort. The prefix on his name suggests that, but also in the way he carries himself and the way he speaks, as if he's strolling through life. He possesses intellectual curiosity, a sign of an enlightened individual. However, like you, he joined the fight without breaking a sweat, because humans sweat, you see. Emily chuckled. Yes, I know we sweat. It has a distinct odor, and yet, Dr. Snowden did not have much of it. Also, he watched you almost more than he watched the enemies. He worries about you, yet trusts you implicitly. That strong bond is most likely the result of tragic events, such as his brother's death and whatever you went through. I suspect he was gentle-natured, yes, gentle, yet in the fight he stood with shield drawn to protect me. Most humans I know would have run at the sight of a small robot army, especially one led by a human with spider-like tentacles, said Sandus, shaking a claw. But not him. Emily shook her head. You have a good read on him, too. Now do V. You're enjoying this. Yes, I am. I mean, it's cool that you can do that. I wish I could read people like that. Sandus bobbed his head. I'm not sure what the temperature has to do with this, but you can learn how to with practice. Temperature? Uh, you said cool. Emily laughed. <laughs> it's slang. It can mean many things based on context. In the way I used it, I meant your ability to read others was good, and I liked it. Oh, earthborn slang? Yes, lot of slanging going on there. Oddly enough, I don't have much information on earthborn slaying. I'll add it to my list of things to find. Nonetheless, on to V. He cleared his throat. V is unique, unlike any AI I have seen. In the fight, he flew between you and several robots. He put himself in harm's way to fight the two robots you didn't see that were aiming at your backside. He disabled them. But most AIs would consider it a waste of resources and energy to put themselves at risk of dying. Not only that, but he took several shots that came our way. Inefficient by AI standards? Yes. Inefficient by human standards? No. Emily nodded. V is not quite a true AI. I figured, and I suspect his true self is not something I'll ever be told, and that's okay. Okay. What about Everin? Mysterious, said Sandus, shaking his furry hands in front of him. Emily laughed. He's the leader of this group. His confidence is like an aura, and his commitment to doing right seems unshakable. He's a time traveler, and, said Sandus, waving a claw around, he has this ship, the Torvata, which is unique in its own right. I think he's not of this reality. Maybe a dimensional being of some type. Emily raised her eyebrows slightly. Also, during the fight, it was like half of him wasn't there. As if there was more to him, yet the form he was in was limiting it. Why do you think that? Oh, Emily, didn't you see how he fought? His hits with the staff used more force than should be possible. Also, unlike humans, I can see fast-moving things better. He moved faster than anything I've ever seen. He even angled his staff behind him to shoot some stun beam without looking back. As I said, mysterious, 
He's definitely not human, not even close, and although I know you're human, you performed some unusual feats yourself. I don't think it's just experience. You and Dr. Snowden both have an edge, one I'm unaware of. Emily pulled her lips in. You're very observant. Santa smiled. Do you want to hear my assessment on Draxus? Of course you do. She chuckled. Draxus is a very serious being. Based on our first encounter, he harbors a strong hatred for these new humans. The fact that he was willing to listen to you tells me he can change his mind, even in the middle of battle. He's from an advanced technological race, judging by the lack of surprise at some of the concepts discussed in the conference room. Yeah, I kind of saw he was pretty intense. Santa swished his nose around for a moment. He's also willing to give his life to correct the timeline, now that he has seen it to be the best chance of getting rid of these new humans. Huh? Well, he said he needed to join the group. To aid in the mission. His uh, Arkara thing is gone. His crew, gone. His world, gone. You're dealing with someone that doesn't have much left to lose, except himself. Everin has shown Draxus that there is still hope. Something that I suspect Everin does to a lot of people. Emily nodded. Everin does that to people for sure. Well, I hope that Draxus isn't crazy or something. Sandus wagged a claw at Emily. I don't think he is, but when dealing with people with nothing to lose, take caution. All right. Anyone else you wish me to assess? I would say you, but I think I know you well enough already. I... Know your heart, she said with a grin. He eyed Emily, and then broke out into a big smile. Seems that way, doesn't it? Perhaps then, if Everin allows me to tag along on this journey, I will get to know yours. I hope you can travel with us, but Everin has the final say, said Emily as she stood. I know, and I'm glad Everin chose you to show me my living area. Emily tilted her head. You know he did choose you, right? Emily shrugged. I think you may be reading a bit too much into that. Sandus grinned. Perhaps I am, but I think I'm right. I suspect I already know what will occur tomorrow. Well, let's hear it. Everin will allow Draxus and I to join this, uh, whatever it is. Our appearance, although seeming random, probably plays a role in something larger, something that only someone of great power can see. Everin's hesitation on me suggests that I play a role in another event, at another time. My survival, and by extension, knowledge of this event is important. Emily snorted. <laughs> you have all the answers. Yes, and I usually charge for them. She chuckled. Okay. Well, if you need anything, you know how to contact me or the others. I'm gonna hit the sack. Ah, another sling! Based on context, you want to sleep, not literally hit a sack? Emily nodded. All right, Emily Snowden. Have a good night's rest, he said. She paused to watch Sandus bounce over to a side room with a workstation. He was probably going to try to find out as much as he could from it. She smiled as she left. Chapter 7 Dr. Snowden yawned as he opened his eyes. It was 8 o'clock a.m., and he knew Emily would be on his case for not joining her in training. Although he had attended a few, sometimes it felt good to sleep in. He moved to the edge of the bed and slid his legs off the side. The planner cartography session with Draxus had been interesting. Not only was he a warrior in his own right, but he had waxed philosophically when pointing out the various systems and their history. Dr. Snowden enjoyed the lesson and felt a bit of unease that some version of humanity had been so cruel to the Dravens. In exchange for the lesson, he had told of how he met Everin, and Draxus seemed very attentive when listening. Dr. Snowden got cleaned up and, after thirty minutes, headed to the conference room. When he got there, he saw that Emily and Sandus were already seated and having breakfast. 
Draxus was in his chair and had replicated what looked like an oversized head of cabbage. Sandus had what looked like a large nut of some type, and Emily had a glass of orange juice and a plate of eggs. Dr. Snowden waved at everyone. Good morning, all. Everyone returned the greeting. Dr. Snowden got an omelet and a glass of orange juice and then took a seat next to Draxus. Sleep well? asked Emily. Oh, yeah, always do. No bad dreams? He shook his head. Haven't had one in a while now. He glanced at Draxus. Do Draven's dream? Of course, said Draxus. To us, it is like visiting another reality. If you meditate right, you can even talk with others who are also dreaming. In the dream? asked Sandus, sitting up. Draxus nodded. Sandus laughed. Now you're joking. It's possible, said Dr. Snowden, sneaking a glance at Emily. Sandus stroked his snout while eyeing Dr. Snowden and Emily. Hmm. Emily tossed Sandus a look. You're reading into that, aren't you? Maybe, said Sandus with a big grin. Dr. Snowden glanced at both of them before continuing on with his breakfast. After thirty more minutes and light conversation, Everin, V, and Zeta-12 entered the room. Everin sat at the head of the table, while V and Zeta-12 hovered over the opposite end. Dr. Snowden had finished his breakfast and noted the others had as well. He always wondered what it must be like for Everin to not require sleep. Dr. Snowden loved sleeping on the Torvada. Having insomnia seemed like a curse prior to meeting Everin, but the neural effect of the Torvada made sleeping a breeze. Although the enhanced nanobots made Dr. Snowden's body need only four hours, he still took in eight. The feeling of waking up refreshed was now common, instead of a rare occurrence. Everin looked around the table. Did everyone sleep well? Everyone nodded. Good. I have several things to go over, said Everin. He extended his arms towards Sandus and Draxus. Sandus and Draxus will be joining us on this summons investigation. I am honored, said Draxus, bowing his head slightly. Great, said Sandus. You won't regret this decision. Everin eyed Sandus. There are some ground rules to follow. 1. Do not attempt to hack the Torvata. It is not possible. Sandus swallowed hard. I was just testing the system. I am sure you were, said Everin. 2. The Torvata will restrict what you can and cannot see. This is to avoid any paradoxes that may arise from your presence. Draxus and Sandus nodded. 3. You will learn of information relative to the past and the future. To avoid knowledge pollution, know that I will be monitoring the timeline after you both are returned, at least for Sandus. Please do not seek out more information than is needed. Sandus swished his nose around while Draxus did a slow dip of his head. I would not normally allow this situation. However, Sandus is integral to future events. I now know that he must travel with us in order for certain scenarios to occur. He will go back to the main timeline, just after he went into the space-time eddy. As for Draxus, once we are done, we will wait until the temporal shielding the Torvada gives him wears off before changing the timeline. Draxus tilted his head. How long is that? Around a few days, said Everin. You both have your own gear but the Torvata can replicate whatever you might need, within reason, of course. It has temporary nanobots for each of you that will allow the Universal Translator to work outside the Torvata. Now, on to our first objective. He tapped at the table console, causing a galactic map of the region around Earth to appear. We are going to establish a baseline. This will help me to determine what impact this event might have had, if any, Earth is in a golden age and has a star-spanning empire, but it is nothing like this version of humanity that Draxus has encountered. After that, we will check on Fedoria and then Kriegis before going to the Drajan homeworld. Any questions? Are you certain the Drajan will take me? asked Zeta-12. I am not. 
However, you are their creation. We will learn more when we get there, and I will not let them terminate you, if that is your concern. That is my concern, said Zeta-12. You have my word that I will not let them terminate you, said Everin. Now, any other questions before we head out? None here, said Dr. Snowden. Anxious to see this Golden Age Empire? Sandus smiled big. Me too. Then let us head to the command center, said Everin. V, take us to just outside Earth's solar system, current time, and enact Torvada Scan Profile 2. Acknowledged, said V. He flew out of the room with Zeta-12 in tow. Dr. Snowden joined the others and exited the room. A smile crossed his face as he wondered what humanity, the one he knew, was like on Earth. A golden age sounded like a playground of ideas and concepts that he could not wait to explore. He noticed that Sandus had bounced away to sit with Emily in the left U-shaped seating area, and Draxus had taken his seat on the right, sitting attentively and focusing on the transparent front wall that showed deep space. These segmented arms flew over the front console, while Zeta-12 hovered nearby. Dr. Snowden took his seat. Torvata Scan Profile 2 is active, said V. The Torvata shot out a silver beam that formed a gold-ringed portal with a rippling blue surface. After it had fully formed, the Torvata flew through into interstellar space. Sandus peered at the screen, and then pointed at the galactic map that sat in a data window left of center. We just went 81,328 light years? That is correct, said Everin. Draxus shook his head. Unbelievable. Everin half smiled. V. Perform long range scans. Acknowledged. The galactic map window moved to the center of the front wall. As concentric circles pulsed out, a few dots appeared. Dr. Snowden wrinkled his eyebrows. Um, shouldn't there be, like, thousands of ships being detected? Maybe they're undetectable, said Emily. Not to the Torvata, said Everin. This is unusual. V, take us to Earth and set the Torvata to scan Profile 1. Acknowledged, said V. He interacted with the console. Torvata scan Profile 1 is now active. The Torvata formed another portal and flew through it. Dr. Snowden studied the screen. It showed Earth, but no space stations or ships were detected. Even the debris that he would have expected was gone. The familiar blue and green atmosphere that he had anticipated to see was murky green. Whoa. What happened here? Everin rubbed his chin. It would appear this space-time eddy we are dealing with has caused more damage to the timeline than expected. Whatever that cloud cover is, it is preventing a scan. V. Take us down and perform analysis scans. Acknowledged. The Torvata angled toward Earth and then shot off toward it. Clouds whisked by as the Torvata punched through them. Eventually, it broke out from cloud cover and descended toward the surface. Sandus hopped out of his chair and walked up to the screen. He looked down through the semi-transparent floors. I originally thought your ship had an unusual design in the mostly transparent front half, but I see now, he said, wagging a finger at Everin, that it provides an Excellent view of whatever you need to look at. Much better than a screen. Yes, much, much better. Draxus looked through the side. I would agree with you, Sandus. It seems there is a lot of plant life here. Dr. Snowden watched as the Torvata skimmed across the top of what appeared to be a canopy of some sort. Except it never ended. Are those... trees? Or some kind of large plants? Analysis. They are rods made of organic material with a top spread that forms the layer you are seeing, said V. Look, said Emily. She pointed at a swarm of tiny flying creatures. Everin perused his ARI and then interacted with his chair console. An image of the swarm up close appeared in a side window. It appears they are insects of some type, said Everin. 
the swarm flew toward the Torvata, and some splatted when they ran into its shielding. Ill, said Emily. V, heat up the shielding to clear off the remains, said Everin. Emily grimaced. Sandus tilted his head at Emily. You don't like bugs? Never have, she said. Nothing against bug-like aliens, either. I just... I don't know. All those legs, antenna, and things. Ugh. Zeta-12 flew forward a bit. You won't need to worry about having to meet them. The atmosphere is deadly to humans, assuming the Torvata's scanning is correct. Everin nodded. We will not be stepping out of the Torvata. But we can go to the roof, said Dr. Snowden, shaking a finger. Draxus narrowed his eyes. That would be dangerous. Not this roof, said Dr. Snowden with a smile. We would also have a much better view of everything. Very well, said Everin. To the roof. Draxus stood and gestured at Sandus. After you. Thank you, kind sir, said Sandus as he bounded after Emily. Dr. Snowden chuckled as he and the rest headed to the elevator. Draxus surveyed the elevator he was in. The others, minus Dr. Snowden, who stood next to him, were already there. The interior was somewhat bland, but a light seemed to emit from everywhere. Draxus had not seen a place for the elevator to go on the roof. It would be just a moment before he could find out. He was thankful that he could participate in the timeline correction campaign, as he called it, the set of events that led him to where he was now seemed fortuitous. A random blip on his ship's radar had shown Zeta-12's ship being pursued by human hunters. Draxus knew there must be a good reason for their presence, enough to gamble on investigating it. A high price had been paid, but where death lay, opportunity sprung forth, one he would take advantage of. The elevator came to a stop. Dr. Snowden gestured outward. Draxus bowed slightly and then exited the elevator. He took a quick glance around. The faint shimmer of the shielding was extended a bit out from the roof's edge, and looking up, he could see it extended there as well. With an enclosed environment, protected by a shield that could handle a ship exploding around it, this would be an ideal vantage point. He joined the others, standing near the light blue guardrails. The Torvata hung in the air over a body of some liquid, with a beach and the organic rods in the distance. It looked relaxing. Sandus poked at the guardrails. Fancy shielding all around us. He looked out. That doesn't quite look like water to me. Everin perused his ARI for a moment, and then said, It is not water. It is a slime of some sort. Emily grimaced. That's nasty. A sea of snot, said Sandus. Dr. Snowden laughed. Draxus peered at the rods. You said they were organic. Everin nodded. According to the scans, they appear to be part of some organism. Emily's eyes widened. You mean they're like hair follicles? Large ones, but yes, said Everin. The covering on top is actually the hair aspect, and the rods are an extension of whatever is underground. Exactly how big is this thing underground? asked Dr. Snowden. Analysis. Unknown. It has been present since we began scanning, said V. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened. Are you serious? Yes, my analysis are always serious, said V. Not always, said Dr. Snowden, wagging a finger. I seem to recall some of them using humor. These lights glowed a bit brighter. Acknowledged. Sandus swished his nose around for a moment. Humor, huh? He eyed V. I think I can help you with that. I would appreciate talking with you on this subject. Consider it done, my floating friend, said Sandus. He pointed out. So there is a large creature underground and we're hovering around on its back. I'm not sure I want to know what that slime is then in relation to the creature. Emily grimaced. I don't either. But it seems kind of weird to be in a golden age and have Earth in this state. 
unless humanity has moved on somewhere. This is not how Earth should look, said Everin. He nodded at V. Display this location from historical records. Set the time index to the current time. Acknowledged. Draxus raised his eyebrows as he watched V and Zeta-12 fly over to the center, where a console materialized. Even on the roof, the Torvata could create things. Draxus turned to watch a projection display on the interior shields. It showed an advanced city where humans flew in straight lines between buildings. There were no ships flying around in the city. He guessed it was built in a manner that did not need them. The buildings were sleek, and off in the distance he could see ships entering and leaving the city's edge. Wow, said Emily. That's definitely not what we're seeing now. Sandis shook a furry hand out. They must be transported in some type of beam between buildings. Interesting. That technology is theoretical from my time period. Everin eyed Sandis. And it will need to remain so. I would still like to take a look at that, said Sandis with a big grin. I am sure you would, said Everin. Draxus exhaled from his mouth. So instead of this, there is some creature underground. I understand this space-time eddy might be the cause, but what could cause such a transformation? I have seen something similar before, but I do not want to make a hasty conclusion without gathering more information, said Everin. He raised a finger. I suspect the Drajan will have that information. I believe we have seen enough here to know that Earth, and humanity by extension, has changed. V. Take us to Fredoria. Acknowledged. The Torvata began to ascend. Draxus and Sandus gripped the guardrail. Dr. Snowden grinned. There's no need for that. I know it's been said before, but the Torvata shielding acts as a dampener, so there won't be any force transferring through. Draxus and Sandus looked at each other, then back at Dr. Snowden. Look outside if you don't believe me, said Dr. Snowden. Draxus watched the outside change from the atmosphere to space. After a portal was opened, he studied the strange tunnel they entered briefly before exiting above another planet. Throughout the whole experience, not once did he feel even a slight vibration. Impressive. I'll say, said Sandus. I'd like to order a Torvata. Everin raised his eyebrows. Worth a shot, said Sandus, grinning. We are above Fredoria, said Everin. V. Perform long-range scans and a planetary analysis. Acknowledged. The interior shielding lit up with dots in various directions and distances under it with details on what the dot represented. Dr. Snowden wrinkled his eyebrows. Like Earth, not much out there. Yes, and based on the readings I am seeing, it appears Fredoria has a similar cloud formation as Earth. V. Take us in. Acknowledged. The Torvata angled itself and descended toward Fredoria. After ten minutes, it had broken cloud cover and began to fly over the landscape. Analysis. Readings indicate a similar environment to Earth. Everin rubbed his chin. Interesting. This has the markings of a galactic-level event. One that maybe the humans who were sent to my region were supposed to resolve, said Draxus, raising a finger. Or their ancestors, maybe. Yes, I would concur with that hypothesis, said Everin. The question now is, when did the humans get pulled into the space-time, Eddie? And who were they? Emily raised her head a bit. So at some point in the past, some humans who were meant to do something got pulled into this eddy, and since they didn't do that thing, whatever it was, all this occurred? Perhaps. They must be some special humans, then, she said. It is possible. There are many possibilities. But we will investigate it. Sandus glanced at Draxus, and then at Everin. So this is what you do? Fly around and solve space and time anomalies? That is part of it, 
A space-time detective? Inspector Everin? I like the sound of that. All the information you must know, said Sandus. He glanced at Dr. Snowden and Emily. And you two by extension, and of course V. Information that could be dangerous in the wrong hands, said Everin. You protect it. As it appears it should be, said Draxus. You're like a guardian of time. Everin tilted his head. An interesting choice of words. I prefer being thought of as a traveler who helps those in need. Sandus shrugged. Or the ultimate information broker. I like Draxus's choice of words better. Nonetheless, said Everin, gesturing at V. We still have Kriegus to analyze, then on to the Drajan homeworld. Draxus noted that Everin seemed uncomfortable at being called a guardian. Maybe it was the responsibility attached to the word versus a traveler, which had none other than to travel. Draxus watched as the Torvada exited Fredoria and then jumped to Kriegis. It was apparent that traveling such distances was a routine thing for this group. Although he understood they could travel in time, he had not seen it yet. The Torvada descended and broke cloud cover. After a few minutes of flying over the surface, Everin said, There is a slight difference between the three planets. The composition is slightly off at each one. Based on the concentration of carbon dioxide, I would say that whatever this creature was, it appeared here before the others. What do you think the creature is? asked Emily. I have some ideas, but... I would need to research it. However, now we head to the Drajan homeworld. It is time for some answers. What if the Drajan homeworld is the same? Then we will need to skip through time to figure it out. I do not want to do that unless absolutely necessary. Got it, said Emily. Draxus watched as the Torvada ascended. Jumping through time to observe events must be an adventure in itself but he understood the paradoxes that could arise from that. He contemplated what the Drajan might know. It crossed his mind that Everin, with the ability to go anywhere, would be an intimidating investigator. Draxus wondered how often Everin had done just that. Chapter 8 Sandus eyed the planet that appeared before the Torvada. He knew it to be Dakaris, homeworld of the Drajan. As the information broker, he knew a lot more about the Drajan than most. They kept to themselves for the most part, similar to the Illusorans nearby, relatively, in terms of galactic distances. The Drajan were an odd-looking race. Fredorians called them snake-like, and Earthborn said Drajan looked like large cobras with a shortened body. He smiled, thinking about how every Earthborn he came across seemed to compare him to a squirrel. Granted, he did look similar, but there were many differences. He had come to learn many things since first meeting Dr. Snowden and Emily. The fact that they traveled with Everin meant they knew a lot more than they let on. Sandus had barely slept the night before due to thinking about all the information they must have seen. The familiarity they seemed to have toward him was something he picked up on when on zeta 12s ship. Whatever this future event was, they were friends in it. Sandus liked Emily. She was kind, yet tough. Dr. Snowden was friendly as well, but was empathetic, something Sandus did not see much in most of the Earthborn he dealt with. He was beginning to understand Draxus a bit more and felt a bond due to similar circumstances. Sandus figured he would get to know V and Everin a lot better during this investigation. An image appeared on the inside of the Torvada's shielding. Sandus studied the scaly, pale, green Drajan that appeared. This one was a bit different than the Drajan he knew of, but it still had a snake-like body with two arms. The display was a full body shot, and he could see that its cobra-like mane was smaller, and its head was bigger. The large fangs that were usually on the sides were missing, and the form-fitting white suit with green lines segmenting it had an octagonal pattern on it. Although it appeared different, he figured it was a male, as the females did not have a mane, unless 
that was different too. Welcome, Everin and friends, said the Drajan. I am Zacassus. Everin tilted his head. You know of us. Your encounters with us are well documented. However, we're aware of humanity's Everin protocol, and we have a similar one. I'm sending you coordinates to land, and might say it's an honor to speak with you, said Zacassus. He waved a hand to the side. Coordinates received, said V. Very well, said Everin. We shall meet you at the coordinates. I have various topics I would like to cover. Excellent, said Zacassus. We look forward to your arrival. The image dissipated. V, take us in, said Everin. Acknowledged. The Torvada began to descend toward the planet. A bit different looking than what I recall, said Sandus. Although I know more than most in my time period, they're one of the few races I actually know very little about, the other being the Illusorans. I guess you're gonna learn more now, said Dr. Snowden. Sandus grinned big. Sure am, but, he said, glancing at Everin, that's not information meant to be shared. Everin nodded. Sandus watched as they passed by several large ships. They were unlike any he had seen before, and reminded him of floating cities on a flat surface with a bubble shield. Beneath it was a large, rectangular structure that had long tentacles attached to it. Looks like a jellyfish, said Emily, pointing at one of the ships. They are temporally shielded, said Everin. I suspect their planet is too, based on the Torvata's reading. Temporally shielded? asked Sandus. Zeta-12 mentioned something about his ship being that way, although I'm not fully sure what it means. It means if the timeline changes, whatever is shielded doesn't disappear with the timeline, said Dr. Snowden. Everin raised a finger. In addition to that, anything inside the temporal shielding has its own timeline, independent of the main timeline it is in. In the case of the Drajan, their whole solar system's timeline is independent of the main timeline it resides in. I wouldn't even know how to detect something like that, although the space-time eddy was said to have a temporal signature. Was that shielded? asked Sandus. Everin shook his head. It is, but not through technology. Right, said Sandus, glancing at Draxus. You catching all this big guy? We are familiar with the concept of temporal shielding, small guy, said Draxus. However, I'm not familiar with the technology. The less known, the better, said Everin. The Dominion potentially possessing temporal shielding is an issue. However, one problem at a time. Draxus nodded. Sandus focused on the atmosphere washing over the shields. To view it while on the roof was a new experience for him. It felt like he could reach out and feel the air rushing by. He observed Dr. Snowden and Emily. It seemed like they had seen this many times before. Draxus's intent gaze made it evident it was a new experience for him as well. Sandus's eyes widened at what he saw when they broke cloud cover. Large cylindrical structures towered over the landscape. Each cylinder had angled supports that jutted out. On top of a majority of the supports were the city ships he had seen in space. The city ship's rectangular bottom sat on the support, with their tentacles arced over and connected to the underside of the support. Ships flew between the cylinders as well as Drajan, both solo and in groups, on silver circular surfaces. A lush jungle sat at the base of the cylinders, with bodies of water between every third one. Draxus peered around. This is a most unusual design. It appears the ships we saw in space are actually cities that can move. This is their docking hub, said Everin. I guess that's one way of adjusting to environmental issues, 
said Dr. Snowden. Everin perused his ARI for a moment. Yes, and the cylindrical docking towers can move as well. If they wanted to move to another planet, they could do so. This is a very advanced species, said Draxus. I'll say, said Dr. Snowden. Draxus leaned in and turned an ear toward Dr. Snowden. Dr. Snowden eyed Draxus. Everything okay? You said you would say, then stopped, said Draxus. I was not sure if I was having a hearing issue or not. Sandus laughed. Oh, Draxus, it's earthborn slang. Humans take a word or a set of them and use them differently based on context. I'm still adjusting myself. When Dr. Snowden said, I'll say, he was agreeing with you. I see. I'm sure the translator is not helping with that either. Slaying seems like it would be very confusing. Tell me about it, said Sandus with a grin. I just did. Sandus put a hand on his furry stomach as he bent forward and laughed. Sandus, said Emily. She glanced at Draxus. He was using slang just then. Ah, oh, you were mocking me. What a confusing way to communicate, said Draxus. Sandus shook a furry hand out. Sorry, sorry, I was just teasing. It's in my nature. Analysis. I have issues with slang as well, said V. It appears then that I'm not alone in this, said Draxus. The Torvata approached a smaller city ship that sat about a half mile off the ground. After a moment, it had landed on a circular pad on the outskirts of the city. Before we go, said Everin, looking around. I wanted to emphasize that while the Drajan may appear friendly, be cautious. Always, said Draxus. Everyone else acknowledged Everin. Also, Sandus and Draxus, you need to get your translation nanobots. V will assist you. They nodded at Everin and followed V to the medical lab. After five minutes, they came back. Sandus rubbed his neck. I suppose they'll be gone once this is all over. Everin nodded as he stood. Let us go. Sandus's heartbeat had ramped up some in anticipation of seeing an advanced Drajan race. He hoped that was due to excitement and not the nanobots. But either way, the technology alone would be worth the visit. His natural inclination to absorb information would be in play, but he knew to be careful with that, lest he raise Everin's ire. Being a part of this investigation was an opportunity he was grateful for. Where it would end, he did not know, but this was the adventure of a lifetime. He smiled as he followed the others to the Torvada exit. Emily studied the platform they were on. It was part of the larger platform that housed a city encapsulated in a bubble shield of some type. The only thing that separated the landing platform from the rest of the platform was a circular light blue line that outlined the edges. Looking up, she could see ships in the air, but it was the Drajan on the small metallic platforms flying around that caught her attention. She pointed at one while glancing at Everin. What is that thing they're on? If it is similar to what humanity has in this time period, then it is a portable transport. It can shrink enough to fit into a pocket. Sandus raised a claw. And what material is this made of? Everin eyed Sandus. Sandus grinned big. Okay, okay. How does it hover? It is made of a material with a specific surface configuration that, when excited with specific energies, exerts a force that allows it to hover. Think of negative energy. Hmm, said Sandus. Very interesting. I'm aware of artificial gravity technology that can do this, but it requires considerably more equipment, and it definitely couldn't be shrunk. Negative energy is also difficult to harvest. He glanced at Draxus. Ever seen anything like that before? I haven't, said Draxus. It would be advantageous to possess such technology. Emily nodded. I wouldn't mind something like that. Everin glanced at Emily. Perhaps we can adjust your PSD to support something similar conceptually.
Dr. Snowden raised his eyebrows. Uh, yeah, count me in on that. PSD? asked Sandus. Personal support device, said Emily, raising her PSD. Oh, those things. They're quite impressive, yes, quite impressive, said Sandus. He glanced at Everin. I know, I know, they aren't for sale. Everin half smiled. Emily turned her head to focus on the approaching group. It consisted of Zacassus and another Drajan and a male human. The other Drajan wore an orange and red suit that was similar in design to what Zacassus wore. The tan-skinned human had a form-fitting navy blue suit with silver and white lines on it. A band ran across the top of his forehead, and his hair was pulled over the back part. Several rings were on each hand, and a leather-like strap crisscrossed his chest. Black boots and a silver cape completed the outfit. The approaching group assembled in front of Everin and crew. "'Welcome to Dukaris, said Zacassus. "'I'm the regional governor here. To my left is my assistant, Hultarkis, and to my right is human ambassador, John Guinness.' He put his fists together, perpendicular to his chest, and then bowed his snake-like head. Emily remembered that was similar to the Drajan gesture of respect she had seen in a previous adventure. Hultarkis and John did the same. Everin and the others reciprocated the movement. Everin gestured around the group, pointing at each in sequence. I have with me Dr. Albert Snowden, Emily Snowden, V, Zeta-12, Sandus, and Draxus. Dr. Snowden, V, and Emily are known to us, said Zacassus. Zeta-12 is familiar as well, but we are not aware of Draxus and Sandus. Everin nodded. You are in Prizatas, otherwise known as Ambassador City, said Zacassus. I felt it was appropriate to come here, as I suspect whatever it is you are here for involves humanity missing. Everin nodded. We have visited Earth, Fedoria, and Kriegis. All is not as it should be. We can help with that information. Everin gestured at Zeta-12. We also have one of your species' vault ship AIs. He was not where he was supposed to be. Zacassus raised a hand for a moment, closed his eyes horizontally, then opened them. Yes, I see those records now. Zeta-12 was confirmed missing in AD 6308. It appears you have found him. He focused on Zeta-12. I'm sure you have quite a story to tell. Yes, I do, said Zeta-12. I have some questions. "'Considering it is almost four thousand years later, "'Holtarchus can assist you with that,' said Zacassus, nodding at Holtarchus. "'You will most likely need some upgrades. "'Follow him, and he will accommodate you.' "'I look forward to it,' said Zeta-12. "'He flew in front of Everin. "'Thank you for helping me. I will not forget you.' Everin nodded. I hope you find the answers you seek. I do too, said Zeta-12. He flew near V. I appreciated talking with you. When your adventure is over, I would enjoy sinking with you again. Acknowledged, said V. Emily watched as Zeta-12 left with Hultarkis. Although she had not spent much time with Zeta-12, she could see that even an A.I. wanted to survive if given an option. Sandus's words about an A.I. not using resources to defend others crossed her mind. She was not sure Zeta-12 would have done that if it came down to it during the fight on the ship. Like Everin, she wished Zeta-12 good luck. But his mission still bothered her. The Drajan explanation for that was something she was curious to hear. Please. Follow us to a private chamber where we can speak. You probably have as many questions as we do, said Zacassus. 
We normally would teleport you there, he said, gesturing at Everin. But you possess different matter. He glanced at Dr. Snowden, Emily, and V. As do you three. He closed his horizontal eyelids twice in rapid succession as he focused on Draxus. And apparently, you as well. Sandus swished his nose. I guess I'm the only normal one here. Zacassus eyed Sandus. A Rigorian. How rare. We have had interactions with the last of your kind long ago. His name was recorded as Sandus as well. Um, I am the last of my kind. Zacassus raised his hand, with his bracelet glowing a bit. Then it would appear it is you, the information broker. Based on that, I am assuming this meeting has some impact on our previous meetings. Sandus sighed. I guess I can't keep the fact I'm the information broker a secret from this group or you, it seems. Normally I'd be running away if anyone found out my identity, but in these circumstances, it's different. Yes, that's me, assuming I get back to my own time period. I'm sure any meeting after that would be informed by this one. He raised a claw. Also, the Drajan I know back then are a lot different from what I'm seeing now. As expected, said Zacassus. I did not mean to expose you if the others did not know. Oh, they knew? Well, maybe not Draxus, but I guess he does now. Zacassus nodded. That would also explain how you were able to contact us on a secure channel back then. Our records are very detailed and span thousands of years. I'd love to see, said Sandus, glancing at Everin, then at the ground. I mean, I'm sure they're very accurate. Zacassus hissed and gurgled. Sandus sighed. Everin gestured forward. Lead on. Emily laid a hand on Sandus's shoulder. He grinned at her. She understood it must be disconcerting for Sandus to hear his secret identity tossed around so casually. This was not an ordinary group, and he probably understood that now. She surveyed the environment as they walked along a pathway outlined by the same light blue line she saw around the landing platform. Her helmet was down and the absence of any strong smell seemed unusual. The sounds of ships flying overhead meshed with the sound of the Drajan on their transports whizzing by. She could also hear the soft hum of the city ahead. A smile formed on her face as she observed Draxus and Sandus taking everything in. It occurred to her that she did not know the extent of Draxus's knowledge on other aliens. Sandus, though, she had a good idea on. After ten minutes of silence, they reached the outer edges of the city. Emily noted that the base of the city had a metallic wall that went up about forty feet or so. Attached to the bottom, and evenly spaced out, were several enclosures with an open front. It reminded her of an elevator, but she was not sure why it was outside or why they were heading toward it. When the group reached it, she boarded it along with everyone else. A pale green shield covered the front sealing them in. Her eyes widened as the enclosure moved through a tunnel in the wall. She had not seen it before, since the enclosure blocked her point of view. As the enclosure zipped along, she observed the metallic walls. The twists and turns the enclosure took was like moving through a steel maze. She noted that there was barely any force, even when the enclosure made sharp turns. When it shot straight up, she anticipated some force but did not feel any. After five more minutes, the enclosure came to a halt, and the front shielding dissipated. Zacassus and John exited the enclosure, with everyone in tow. Emily caught her breath as she observed the large, spacious platform they were on. They were high above the city inside the bubble shielding. Along the sides were guardrails, and the platform was bare of anything save the floor. Looking out, she could see over the city. Zacassus raised a hand with his bracelet glowing. A circular orange ring formed on the ground with chairs around the edges. 
A cylinder appeared off to the side with four small shelves jutting out. Zikasis pointed at the cylinder. If you require any sustenance, please make use of our replicators. Otherwise, have a seat and we can begin. Emily glanced around at the others and then headed to a seat. She smiled when she saw Santis poke around the replicator. He was probably not hungry, but a device like that would potentially yield some technology secrets, at least conceptually showing what was possible. Dr. Snowden, Draxus, and Everin, like her, had taken their respective seats. The hovered nearby behind Everin. After Santa sat, Zakasis grinned as he faced Everin. We are always honored by your presence. What brings you to us? Everin raised a finger. I have several topics to cover. The first deals with Zeta-12. We found him far away from where he should have been. His mission, as stated by him, was to store reproductive members of alien species. The method of retrieval was not consensual. As you may or may not know, I am against any type of abduction. Zikasis nodded. We stopped that program in AD 6520. It caused a few wars. Apparently, some of the other ships we sent used invalid criteria in their selections. Those ships that returned, we freed the specimens and sent them back. I see, said Everin. In that case, I will consider the matter closed. What will become of Zeta-12? He will be given some upgrades and treated fairly. He is, after all, a Drajan creation. We'll take care of him and help him should he need it, said Zakasis. I appreciate you helping him, said Everin. Now, on to my next topic. Humanity is missing. I know that it should be there, but it is not. John raised his head a bit. In a calm, monotone voice, he said, I believe I can help explain that. Before I do, I wanted to say it's an honor to meet you. You have been humanity's champion throughout all of recorded history, and the amount of people who can claim to have met you is very small. I am glad to count myself as one of the lucky few. Everin bowed slightly and then gestured toward John. Please proceed. Dr. Snowden sat up in his chair a bit. John looked human, and the way he walked and now talked seemed confident. The room they were in highlighted some of John's facial features. Dr. Snowden could now see that there were small, circular nodes on the side of John's head, just under his headband. Intricate, glowing designs danced across the headband, giving it an elegant look. Dr. Snowden focused as John extended a hand. His fingertips had small coverings and were glowing. A projection depicting a galactic regional map shot up from the orange ring on the ground. This is the Karis system, approximately 50,000 light years from Earth. Our deep space probes picked this up, said John. He dipped a finger. The projection zoomed in to an orange gas cloud outside the system. This was the first appearance of the Golten Heresis, as we call it, said John. Dr. Snowden scrutinized the snake-like shape of the gas cloud that was continuously swirling around. It is a colony of aliens, unlike any we have met. They are viral, and swarm a system if there is a planet it wants to use as a breeding ground. They took on a variety of forms, and they all exist within the strange orange gas cloud. We were not only unable to stop it, we could not even identify how these creatures could exist in deep space. Emily tilted her head. Did it come by here? Zikasis hissed. It tried, but it seems temporal shielding irritates it. Since the Illusorans and we are the only civilizations with that technology, we were able to survive. There were some individuals outside us who survived. They were knowledgeable of temporal shielding, and they came here. I see, said Everin. 
When the Golden Heresses came through Earth's region, it took over. John nodded. I'm guessing that's what happened. From what I remember, we used technology obtained from another group of humans that we had met only a few decades or so before, and the Golden Heresis was expelled. Then you were here, inside the Drajan Temporal Shielding, when the timeline changed, asked Everin. Yes. Have you ever seen the Golden Heresis before? asked Zikasis, glancing at Everin. I have. Based on the image and behavior you have described, they are called the Trip. That orange cloud is not a normal gas, and they are a hybrid of baryonic and telseron exotic matter. That cloud is telseron in a gaseous state and is what allows them to conform matter to what they need. Think of it as a mobile environment. John looked at Zikasis, then back at Everin. Have you fought it before? We have no records of events you've participated in other than when you appeared. As it should be. For the trip, when I last encountered them, I redirected them. My ship is unique and can output something that repulses it. Temporal shielding would have the same effect, as you have discovered, said Everin. He rubbed his chin. These other humans who helped you with technology in your version of history, what were they like? As advanced as we were, they were even more so. They didn't have temporal shielding, but another type of energy they called Palison. They were able to deliver it in a wide dispersal pattern. The odd thing about these humans was that a good portion of them were non-humans. While we still had some in our population, it was nowhere near the percentage of the population of this new group. Dr. Snowden narrowed his eyes. His first thought was that maybe the rift gate that Everin had left on Earth in their last adventure was used. One of the directives that Everin had given to the non-humans was to find a second Earth. Maybe they did. Everin rubbed his chin. How did you meet this other group of humans? We met them at one of our most remote Dyson bubbles. We had sent out colony ships long ago, and this one was about 60,000 light years away, said John. He wiggled his index finger. The projection zoomed out from the galactic map and showed a new dot indicating the location of the Dyson bubble. John continued on. Even as far from Earth as the new colony was, the new group of humans controlled several systems much farther away, on the edge of the galaxy. How they met is still up for debate, but it has been said that deep space probes of the colony and the other group met each other and then relayed information. I don't really know, as it was never officially documented how they met. Dr. Snowden perused the projection. While the initial summons location was top right, relative to a top-down view of the galactic map, the location where the colony was to be set up was bottom left. He shook a finger out. So, if that colony was never established, then that meeting would have never occurred. Zakasis glanced at Dr. Snowden. An interesting hypothesis. I have no way of verifying that, though. But Everin might be able to. It is a start, said Everin. However, there are other considerations to take into account. John's eyes searched the group for a moment. What brought you here, at this point in time? Everin shook his head. I cannot elaborate on that. I understand, said John, grinning. I'm surprised, though. I thought at least from what is known about you, that you already knew where humanity was. If that's true, you would have known about these. Trip. I only know the summary aspects, not specific details. In that regard, the less I know is better, said Everin. Dr. Snowden remembered looking through the information on the Torvada. While it had details on places Everin went, most data was summarized, like when a new era started or ended and any major developments. Dr. Snowden figured that since the trip had no impact on humanity initially, it would not have been in the Torvada's database. Maybe that is why the summons was initiated now, 
to lead Everin to fix an event where a rift did impact humanity in such a way that it was wiped out, at least in the area around Earth. There was still the Terran Dominion and others far away. I appreciate the information, said Everin. There is a lot for me to sift through. Please, feel free to stay as long as you need. We have accommodations for you all, said Zacassus. He pointed a claw at Draxus. I meant to ask earlier, but our scans indicate you're a Draxinian. Is that correct? Draxus nodded. Draven, actually. You are aware of my people? Only from scans done by our deep space probes. Your species was not yet technologically advanced from the images taken. We received that information long ago, and it seems our translation technology got your species name wrong. Things are different now, said Draxus. He glanced at Everin. I can't go into details. A shame, said Zacassus. We would have appreciated you updating our records. We will stay for the rest of the day and leave tomorrow, said Everin. Draxus, if you wish to assist them on the cultural and technological aspects of your species, you can do so. Current events can be omitted. As for the others, take the rest of the day off and enjoy the Drajan hospitality. We can meet on the Torvada in the morning at 10 a.m. Dr. Snowden nodded along with the others. He watched Draxus and Zacassus begin to take off. Emily and Sandus had approached John to talk with him. Dr. Snowden walked up to Everin. I think I have an idea of what's going on now. As do I, said Everin. However, I will verify a few things, and then tomorrow we can meet, determine a plan of action, and proceed from there. All right. What are you going to do then for the rest of the day? It's only 10.40 a.m., although it looks much later here. I wish to talk with the Drajan a bit more and would like to update the Torvata's database. I am unsure of Drajan protocol to do so, but I will work on that. Sounds good. I'll talk with John a bit, and then I guess try out Drajan hospitality. Maybe get a tour in. Everin nodded, and then headed toward the room exit. Dr. Snowden exhaled from his mouth and walked over to John and the others. Chapter 9 Draxus poked at the nutrients' dense nut that the conference room replicator had created. It was nine o'clock a.m. Earth time, according to the Torvata, and he had spent yesterday helping Zacassus update records on the Dravens. It was enjoyable to meet with another alien species that did not want to enslave or cause havoc. The nanobots had performed as expected, and communication was not an issue. He could see how useful having the nanobots was. Draxus found the information on Earth and, by extension, the human empire fascinating. Although it was gone due to the timeline change, the images, processes, protocols, and missions were similar to the stories of the United Planets he had heard. The difference was that the humans from Earth managed over a thousand systems, it was no wonder there was an ambassador on the Drajan homeworld. Taking a tour of the Drajan cities with Dr. Snowden, Emily and Sandus was the highlight of the day. V had spent time with Zeta-12. Draxus's attention focused on Emily and Sandus entering the room. Sandus pointed, using a claw from both hands at Draxus. Hey, big guy! What'd you think of the Drajan? They were hospitable. And very knowledgeable. Yeah, they were, said Sandus. Emily crooked a thumb at Sandus while shaking her head. The Drajan somehow messed up his recording device. All he has is static. Sandus sighed. I forgot it was on. I'm not sure I believe that, said Draxus. Sandus laughed. It was worth a shot. Did Everin say to not gather information? Sandus looked down. Yeah, he did. He looked back up. It's in my nature. I'm the information broker. It's what I do and what drives me. This is going to be tough. 
to struggle against your nature must be difficult, said Draxus. Sandus pulled the device off his suit and put it into his pocket. Yeah, I will honor Everin and try. Draxus nodded. His only purpose was clear, to defend his race and purge those who would assault them. Sandus's nature seemed to be focused on collecting information, a strange purpose, but one that Draxus could see being useful to others. Although he had not intended to cause Sandus to reevaluate his nature, maybe it was for the better. Everin had been fair to both of them, and Draxus would ensure that for his part he would return the gesture. I am surprised I could breathe without any effort, said Sandus. As am I, said Draxus. I have not had to use a mask since joining this group. It would seem humanoids have similar requirements for breathing. That's what I've seen, although I've seen places that would make you run. Draxus nodded. Everin, Dr. Snowden, and V entered the room. Dr. Snowden got a cup of coffee and sat opposite of Draxus and Emily. Everin sat at the head of the table, and V hovered over a seat next to Dr. Snowden. I hope everyone had a good day yesterday, said Everin. I sure did, said Dr. Snowden. I always think I've seen a lot, and then I see even more amazing things. The Drajan technology level is impressive. Analysis The Drajan suggested some enhancements for me. I also talked with Zeta-12. He wishes us the best of luck, and wanted me to relay that he is grateful for our assisting him. Everin nodded. I hope he finds what he is looking for. I got some time in with John, said Dr. Snowden. Humanity is definitely more advanced in this time period. I found out he had family that disappeared in the timeline change. That is what we will investigate today, said Everin, tapping at the table console. A projection showing a galactic map with several dots appeared above the table center. Everin pointed at a dot. That is where the remote Dyson bubble was that a colony ship created. We will see if they are there. After that, we will check on this other group of humans and non-humans that interacted with them. Then we will head back to the summons location. I would like to meet the different human factions. I think that could be arranged, said Draxus. There is a Dominion ceremony where a governor is staking their claim on a former Draven world. That means Salazar will most likely be present in some capacity as well. Everin rubbed his chin. Perhaps I can arrange a meeting from there. Possibly, said Draxus. The claim can be challenged, but only by another governor. As they are human, there is a good chance they are aware of the Everin Protocol. Perhaps I can use that to my advantage, said Everin. Draxus's eyes glowed purple for a moment. I hope that you can. From what I understand, it was one of the larger Arcaras on the planet. I wish I could help them, but I can barely help myself. Then that is what we will do when the time comes, said Everin. He raised a finger. However, we will check out these other two locations first. V. Set coordinates to the remote Dyson bubble. Set the Torvada to scan Profile 1, and once we are there, perform long-range scans. Acknowledged, said V. He flew out of the room. Let us go. After a few minutes, everyone had assembled in the command center. Everin sat in his command chair, with Emily and Sandus in the left U-shaped seating area, and Dr. Snowden and Draxus on the right. V hovered before the front console. The Torvada ascended from the landing pad it sat on in Ducaris. After it reached space, it opened a portal and flew through. Draxus observed the galactic map after the Torvada exited the portal. Concentric circles pulsed outward from a dot representing the Torvada. According to the map, the circles pulsed out about ten light years. How the Torvada was able to scan so far away was a mystery to him. His civilization could only do a few light years, and even then, it was nowhere near as detailed. The scans were not showing much activity. The planet they were over lacked anything in orbit. 
This planet seems inactive. Everin rubbed his chin. So it would seem. The planet is not exhibiting any technological footprint. The star is also not encircled by a Dyson bubble. This would suggest that the colony ship set here never arrived. It could have gotten caught up in the space-time eddy and formed its colony after exiting. Without any contact from the rest of the human empire at the time, it might have split into several factions and developed into what Draxus knows. Emily wrinkled her eyebrows. Maybe the ship was stopped by something else. It is possible, said Everin. However, history shows it to have come here. The fact that it did not means that something changed history, and the only candidate for that so far is the space-time eddy. Makes sense, said Emily. So, this colony ship, said Draxus, if we alter its course to avoid the space-time eddy, then it will proceed here, instead of near my home system. Everin tilted his head. That is one option. The other is to dispose of the eddy. Both would seem to fix the immediate issue. However, potential temporal shielding is involved, which is unusual. Humanity did not possess that technology in that time period, or even this one. I am curious as to how they obtained it. If we were to alter the colony's ship's course, and Salazar's Dyson bubble was temporally shielded, it would still exist in your home system. The other factions may have that as well. We will assess the situation further when we get there. V, take us three light years away from the coordinates of the humans and non-humans that John mentioned. Acknowledged. The Torvada opened a portal and flew through it. Draxus studied the heavy traffic that the long-range scans picked up. These systems are active. Are we going to check it out? asked Santis, swishing his nose around. Everin shook his head. I just wanted to verify its presence. I suspect I know of this group's origins. Do tell, said Santis, tossing a furry hand out. It is perhaps best I do not tell. Santis snickered. Hmm, I figured. I'd check it out when I get back, but it's sort of far away. Everin nodded. Draxus, we have your navigational information in the system. Can you show V which planet we should head to in order to see this ceremony? Draxus tapped at his palm and then extended it toward V. A projection shot up, showing the galactic map with a green dot on it. V faced Draxus and scanned the projection. Coordinates acquired. He pivoted back around to the console. The Torvata opened a portal and then flew through it. Draxus clenched his jaw as he examined the long-range scans appearing on the front screen. He could see that although there was much less activity, the details showed Dominion ships scattered around, with some by the planet they were near. An outline formed around the bluish-green planet with a blinking red dot. Based on the landmass the dot was on, he knew it to be where they were headed. That is the main common area for this Draven clan. The Arkara would be there, which is where the Dominion delegation would be for this ceremony. Then it is time to introduce ourselves, said Everin. Draxus nodded. He had been to this world before. It had been one of the last major Draven worlds to get captured by the Dominion. The world was the farthest away from the Kolaris Shen civilization, another species taken down by the Dominion. The Kolaris Shen fought the Dominion, the Gulkash Alliance, and outcasts for over 400 years. Once the war was over, the Kolaris Shen were carved up, and then the Dominion hit his civilization. He sighed. At least he now knew that humanity was not supposed to be like this, and he suspected if his race had encountered the United Planets faction first, things may have happened differently. Not that it would matter once the timeline was corrected. The Torvata angled down and approached the planet. Sandus peered out through the transparent walls as the Torvata flew through a clear sky. His heart pounded away when he saw blue and purple plant life. Although not quite like his home world, it was a jungle-like world. 
The unusual aspect that stuck out immediately was that there were no concentrated areas of buildings. Everything seemed to be meshed into the jungle. He could see how a society that had a large, tree-like being as a mother would be close to nature. The ability to grow structures using synthetic DNA was also an intriguing idea, one he would investigate when he got back. He glanced at Draxus. It's a beautiful world, very beautiful. I like it, said Draxus. Although this planet has been conquered, our resistance here has been strong. I haven't been here in a while. He pointed to rising smoke off in the distance. It looks like destruction has taken hold. Sandus swished his nose around. This place we're going to, what should we expect? It will be held in the main common area, where the Arkara resides, said Draxus. The Dominion will have the new governor, and I'm guessing Salazar in some capacity. There will, of course, be robotic guards and sometimes other human variations. Every ceremony is different, based upon the governor handling it. Emily tilted her head. You think they'll take notice of us? We sort of stand out. Draxus shook his head. It is not uncommon to see other aliens, including other humans at a ceremony. However, all aliens will be purged after the ceremony in the coming weeks when they begin chipping. Huh? said Emily. Well, I don't think we'll be around for that. Everin nodded. We will not. This encounter is to observe the Dominion up close, and perhaps gain a meeting out of it via the challenge option that Draxus mentioned. I would not underestimate the governor's champion, said Draxus. That's who you'll fight if you issue a challenge. Emily crooked a thumb. I think it'll be them that underestimates Everin. Sandus glanced at Everin. Although he seemed capable in a fight, Sandus wondered how it would go. He could see that Draxus was tensed up, yet everyone else seemed relaxed. It made Sandus wonder what adventures had taken place to cause that type of reaction to a potentially hostile encounter. He focused on the ground as it approached. With a sigh, he placed a hand on the wall. He turned his head to the side when he felt a hand on his back. Everything all right? asked Emily. Sandus turned back to look out. Yeah, it just reminds me a bit of my home world. The one Max the Matter Mage saved you from, right? Sandus turned around and narrowed his eyes. You know of Max? Emily glanced at Everin. He is known to us, said Everin. Sandus looked down for a moment, then back up. This future event thing, right? Everin half smiled. Well, Max only uplifted me because I was the only one to survive my planet getting hit by an asteroid. I almost didn't make it. Uplifted? asked Emily. Sandus wiggled his whiskers. To go from non-sentience to sentience. My species was not sentient prior to the asteroid hitting, but Max said we would have evolved sentience eventually. Oh, said Emily. She lightly squeezed Sandus's shoulder. That must have been strange, to gain sentience. Sandus bobbed his head. It was. One moment, I was determining why it was hot everywhere, and the next, I was talking to Max. I owe him my life. The strange thing was that he said the asteroid's trajectory was not natural, like someone or something had specifically sent it to my planet. He didn't elaborate. Who would be so cruel as to commit genocide on my race before we could evolve? Dr. Snowden sneaked a sidelong look at Emily, then at Sandus while clearing his throat. Not sure, but you're here now. Draxus eyed Sandus. This Max sounds like he worked in genetic engineering. The Gulkush Alliance has animals that were made sentient or uplifted, as you call it. Emily smiled. Max was a matter mage. He could control matter within a certain radius. Although he couldn't create life, he could manipulate it. I have never heard of one capable of this, said Draxus. 
Max was unique, sort of like Everin, said Sandus. He glanced at Draxus. At least we can help your people. Draxus performed a slight bow. It is appreciated. Sandus turned back to watch as the Torvata approached a small clearing. After the Torvata landed, the group exited onto the Torvata ramp just inside the shielding. Sandus noted that no one changed into different suits, but Dr. Snowden and Emily had their helmets up. Draxus did not have his up, but Sandus figured that was due to already being acclimated to the environment. Based on what he had seen of their functionality, it was probably more efficient to keep the suits on. His, by comparison, was much less advanced, but he had a bag of tricks he could deploy if needed. Violence was something he avoided, and instead he relied on guile and misdirection. It had served him well. He took a look around. Do we need our helmets? Everin perused his ARI for a moment. The Torvata reports that the air is breathable, and the atmosphere is similar to Earth's and Fedoria's in makeup. That is consistent in most worlds with sentient life in this galaxy, it seems. Sandus snorted, almost like it was planned. He caught Dr. Snowden and Emily looking away as they lowered their helmets. They probably knew why certain environments seemed to be favorable for humanoids. I guess contamination isn't a concern. It is always a concern. But your suits are scrubbed of contaminants when you pass through the Torvata shielding. However, the scans indicate that there is nothing on any of us that would harm this environment. Sandus nodded. The group passed through the Torvata shielding and into the clearing. With a deep sniff, Sandus took in the strong jungle smell. The area they were in had a metallic floor large enough to support larger ships. On the edges were blue trees and purple plants. Walkways weaved through them, and buildings were built in between the trees. He pointed at the floor. So this was grown? Yes, said Draxus. A structural outline is created and inserted into crystallized synthetic DNA. Then it is seeded and activated. So it grows like a plant. Very interesting. It makes it easier to have a city integrated with the jungle, said Sandus. Draxus nodded, as it should be. The seed grows rapidly compared to regular DNA. Although we're advanced technologically, we always stayed in touch with our roots. My world was similar, except we were primitive, and our homes were holes in trees. You were a tree dweller, said Draxus. We have some creatures here that sort of resemble you, except much smaller. Sandus grinned big. Let's hope they don't think I'm their god. I don't think you need to worry about that, said Draxus. Emily chuckled as she shook her head. Which way do we go? asked Sandus. Draxus pointed ahead at one of the walkways that disappeared into the jungle. There. Sandus slapped Emily's leg. Race you to the edge. He took off in a full sprint, using his rear legs first, then all four limbs. His eyes widened when he saw Emily burst past him. When he arrived at the edge, he paused to catch his breath. You're pretty quick, said Emily. Quick? You just blew past me. Emily smiled. Now imagine if I had tried. Sandus was not sure if she was kidding or not, but her physical prowess far surpassed what he initially thought she was capable of. She moved like a robot, yet was not one. He turned his head to watch the other strolling across the landing pad. The look on Draxus's face showed he was thinking similar thoughts to Sandus. When the rest of the group arrived, Everin glanced at Sandus and raised a finger. Let us go as a group and try not to attract attention. Sorry, sorry, I just had pent-up energy to release, said Sandus. He had the zoomies, said Emily with a smile. It is okay, said Everin. From what I understand of the Draven culture, it would be out of place for you to run and jump around like your tail was on fire. Dr. Snowden and Emily burst out laughing. I guess I deserve that, said Sandus. He extended an arm out toward the path. All right, lead on. Draxus. 
You can take point on this, said Everin. Draxus nodded and headed out. As they walked, Sandus got a deeper look into the environment. The path they were on was similar to the landing pad in material. The edges had a raised, rubber-like edge, and beyond that was the jungle floor. The buildings seemed to be between the blue trees, but there were also some that were built with the tree going through it. Structures above were suspended by purple vines. Every now and then, he would see a large hole with a ramp inside it. It blew his mind that all it took was some outlining and a sprinkling of fancy crystallized seeds to grow all of this. He pointed at the large hole. You build underground, too? Of course, said Draxus. Most technology is developed there. It also brings us closer to our Arkara. Sandus bobbed his head as he continued to survey the landscape. It was apparent to him that the Dravens were as advanced as the Cregans, if not more. The Terran Dominion must have had an advantage that the Dravens could not compensate for. After twenty minutes they reached the main common area. Sandus noted that it looked like a large bull in the ground had been cut out of stone, with seats etched into the sides, and a raised platform in the bottom center. Around the top edge was a walkway with a ten-foot wall that encircled the area. His eyes widened at the large arcara that sat in the middle of the platform. It had four main trunks, with smaller ones in and around it. Various colored vines and plants filled in the gaps, and the arcara reached far into the sky. He got the sense that it was probably just the tip he was seeing, with much more underground. The image that Draxus had shown earlier did not do justice to what Sandus was seeing. Draven sat in every available seat, making it look like a sea of blue and purple. Sandus observed the varying types of Dravens. Most were humanoid, but short and stocky. Some looked like large, flying insects with long legs. Others were quadrupeds, while some were more insect-like. It was a hodgepodge of shapes, but based on what Draxus had said, Sandus knew they all had a purpose in life. Everin pointed a bit away along the top edge. We can watch from there. This is amazing, said Dr. Snowden as the group moved into position. To some, perhaps, said Draxus. Oh, uh, I, I didn't mean, uh, you know, said Dr. Snowden. It's okay, said Draxus. The ceremony will begin soon. You will get to see why humanity is reviled. Emily sighed. This is the second advanced version of humanity we've seen that has something wrong with it. Sandus raised a bushy eyebrow. I've known humanity for a while, mostly for Dorian. Being brutal, violent, and cruel to others is not uncommon. Although I must say, on the other end, they can be compassionate, kind, and helpful. I guess it depends on which ones you meet. You may change your technological level, but you can never fully escape your nature. Unless you're genetically engineered or uplifted, of course. And even then, it's still there. Draxus glanced at Sandus. You speak the truth as I know it. Everin, I wish you luck in your challenge when the time occurs. Thank you, said Everin. Sandus looked up and then scampered to the top of the wall to take a seat on the ledge. Better view up here. Emily hopped up and sat next to him. I agree. You're almost as nimble as me, said Sandus. He jumped a bit when Dr. Snowden landed next to him. Sandus shook his head. Even you're nimble, yes, quite nimble. You seem surprised, said Dr. Snowden. I am, actually, said Sandus. Everin and Draxus hopped up and took a seat, while V landed in Emily's lap. Sandus eyed V. Getting a little cozy, are we? Analysis. Emily's lap is cozy. Emily grinned. You too. Sandus smiled as he looked toward the center platform. He suspected that he and V would have some good discussions. Everything so far had been going well, and he enjoyed traveling like this and seeing new cultures without the threat of being hunted by those looking for the information broker. Even though this event represented a bad situation, he would try to make the best of it. 
with a content sigh. He adjusted his seating position in preparation for what was to come. Chapter 10 Draxus clenched his jaw as he watched the screen that hovered in front of them across the walkway and about five rows down. On the screen, Dominion representatives assembled in front of the Arcara. It had been about twenty minutes since they had arrived, and although he was trying to appear calm, every fiber of his being wanted to go down and attack the humans. He felt a hand on his arm. So, who is who? asked Dr. Snowden. Draxus appreciated Dr. Snowden's genuine curiosity. It seemed to be something that the Dominion lacked. Draxus pointed at the female. That is the governor. You can tell by the symbols on her chest. Based on her appearance, she is approximately twenty-five. The male humanoid alien next to her is her spokesperson. He's a Caloris Shen, one of the civilizations that the Dominion conquered before ours. He, uh, is missing some hair. Kinda reminds me of a large gray, said Emily. I'm unfamiliar with, a uh, gray, said Draxus. They're a race of hairless aliens with big black eyes, a big head, and a slender humanoid body, said Dr. Snowden. Whenever an alien abduction is discussed on our homeworld in our time, they're usually the aliens everyone refers to. Draxus nodded. I see. The Caloris Shen do not abduct. They were peaceful. Sandus pointed at the eight-foot-tall humanoid with heavy battle armor. Who's that big guy? He's even bigger than you. He's the governor's champion. It is he who Everin will have to fight if he's to challenge the governor's claim. Sandus gulped as he looked at Everin. You sure about this? I am, said Everin. I know you're tough, but, uh, that guy is something else, said Sandus. Emily grinned. Then you don't know Everin too well. Sandus shrugged. Apparently not. Draxus agreed with Sandus. From what Draxus had seen, Everin could fight and seemed incorruptible. But a champion could take down even a Praetor. He noticed that the governor had taken a seat on the platform with her champion next to her. Robotic, humanoid guards stood at attention around the governor. Off to the side stood a humanoid robot with metallic gold skin, and it looked like the form was not meant for combat, but more for observation. Draxus had seen it before, and knew it was Salazar in one of his forms. The crowd went silent as the Caloris Shen stood front and center on the platform and began to speak. I am Genrithalandris, a speaker for the Terran Dominion. You have a lot of questions, and I will answer them. This territory has been claimed by the Terran Dominion. Your ships, your technology, your defense forces, said Genrith the Landris, waving a hand dismissively in the air, were washed away before the Dominion's might. As such, you're now members of the Dominion. Dr. Snowden shook his head. Not arrogant at all, is he? Shh, said Emily with raised eyebrows. Jenrit the Landris paced back and forth. You are Dravens, connected at birth to your Arkara. What you don't know is that there is something better to be connected to. Something that enhances you and takes away any concerns or pains you may have. That something is Salazar. Once integrated with him, all your doubts will be silenced, and you will know true harmony. He raised a hand in the air. I was once like you, small-minded, weak and full of fear. Salazar has shown me the light, and it is the way forward for all. Draxus clenched his jaw. He had heard a similar speech before at another ceremony. 
His eyes glowed a light purple. You're weak, shouted one draven. You didn't fight hard enough, said another draven. Jenrith the Landris smiled as he looked around the assembled draven. I was weak, but not anymore. You too will know the joy that is Salazar, your impurities, burned away and replaced by efficiency. He nodded his head. An efficiency your Arkara could never give you. A short and brawny draven near the front stood and pointed at Jenrith the Landris. You spout madness! No one is going to integrate with this Salazar! The assembled dravens cheered. Jenrith the Landris shrugged. The alternative to integration is death. The dravens snorted. You'll find that dravens don't bend their knee as easily as the Caloris Shen did. Perhaps not, said Jenrit the Landris. He glanced back at the governor who stood. It appears that Hesia, your new governor, wishes to speak to you. He took a step to the side as she approached the draven. What's your name? She asked. Grok. You wish to challenge us? Grok shook his head. Right. When you have a small army behind you, he gestured at the champion, and him, you hide behind your technology and numbers. Hesia glanced at Salazar, who nodded. She smiled. I don't normally accept challenges from the likes of you. But if you can take me down, we'll leave. You talk big for a small thing. Do you wish to challenge me? The other dravens cheered Grok on. You still have advanced armor and shielding. It wouldn't be a fair fight, said Grok. Hesia glanced at Salazar again, who nodded. She pressed two buttons, one on each shoulder. Her form-fitting suit fell off, showing her bare body. She reached down and tapped at her boots, causing them to retract so that she could step out of them. Her gloves fell to the ground. Standing completely naked before the dravens, she extended her hands out to the side. Satisfied? Grok gulped but headed up the platform as the other dravens around him pumped their fists in the air and did the draven salute. Draxus noticed that Emily was entranced, while Dr. Snowden had widened eyes. Grok was a defense force captain, based on the clothing he wore and the striped pattern on the shoulder. Although not nearly as powerful as a Praetor, they were known for their strength. It was no surprise that Grok had spoken out. It also most likely meant that this Arcaris Praetor was dead. You think he'll take her? asked Sandus. While she is a fine specimen to look at, she doesn't look like a fighter. Draxus grimaced. She'll kill him. Really? Draxus nodded. Then I should issue my challenge, said Everin. Draxus laid a hand on Everin's arm. You must wait until this challenge is complete. Everin narrowed his eyes as he focused on the hovering screen. Grok clenched his fists as he took to the platform. He adopted a stance with his right leg and arm forward. Hesia walked opposite him and smiled. She cracked her neck and extended her arm with her hand in a vertical position perpendicular to her body. Grok charged and, when close, reached out to grab her hand. She stepped forward and grabbed his wrists, causing his upper body to stop while his legs slipped forward. With a heaving motion, she tossed him off to the side. He took a moment to catch his breath and jumped back up. With methodical steps, he approached her. When he was close, he struck out. She batted his fist away. He swung with his other fist. She batted it away again. He lunged forward and attempted to grapple her. She took a step back and kicked him in the chest, sending him flying back. As she walked over to him, she said, I guess you were all talk. She grabbed him by his neck and lifted him off the ground. 
With her other hand, she punched through his chest and then retracted her arm. His head went limp as she tossed him to the ground. Facing the now silent crowd, she raised her bloody fist and said, You are mine to do whatever I want with. Once you're with Salazar, you'll understand your place. Bow before me. The assembled draven stood in shock, and then kneeled in the small space before their seat. Everin hopped off the wall, his lips pulled down. I'm going now. Wait here. Sandus watched as Everin walked down one of the aisles toward the platform. His walk stood out to Sandus. It was one of confidence. There was no fear present. He had seen that type of poise only a few times, and it was one born of experience. He glanced at Emily. Everin is certain of himself? Oh yeah, said Emily. That governor isn't as fast as him. If he fights the champion, he'll still win. Draxus turned his head toward her. You are very certain of his skills. He's fought beings much stronger than anything on that platform, she said. How do you know the champion's strength? Emily tilted her head. I can see how he moved when he came out onto the platform. If I can see it, then Everin can. Sandus scratched his snout. All I saw was a mountain of a human walk on the platform. Dr. Snowden pointed at the screen. Everin's there. Everin hopped onto the platform. I would like to issue a challenge. Hashia smiled as she walked up to Everin. Who are you, handsome? Someone who has witnessed an injustice. Well, unfortunately for you, challenges can only come from another governor, or if Salazar allows exceptions. You don't qualify as either. Everin tapped at the side of his utility belt, causing a tray to slide out. He reached in and pulled out a small device that he then held up to Salazar. I would not be so sure of that. My credentials. Salazar raised a hand and shot out a light green beam that enveloped the credentials. After a moment, he said, Everin, time traveler and friend of humanity, your presence is unexpected. I am sure it is, said Everin. Are you aware of the Everin Protocol? All humanity is, said Salazar. You may challenge if you wish. Hesia snapped her head toward Salazar. He can? Yes. Everin is unique. She smirked. Okay, well, then Relstaris will fight for me. As expected, said Everin. What do you want if you win? Asked Salazar. For this Arkara and the surrounding city to be free of the Terran Dominion. Acceptable. What? said Hesia. Is there a problem? Asked Salazar, slowly moving his gaze onto her. She looked down. No. No problem. But if real Staras wins, I want Everin as a pet. No, said Salazar. However, he has a ship, the Torvata. If your champion wins, Everin gives the Torvata to me. Everin nodded. I agree to these terms. Hesia scowled. Why can't he be my pet if we win? Because you couldn't handle him, said Salazar. On top of that, if the other human factions found out, it could be a unifying factor against us. I don't care about that. Salazar turned his body to face her. She licked her lips and stepped back. I'm sorry. I lost control. It won't happen again. Salazar nodded and gestured at an open area on the platform. No weapons. Everin tapped a button on the front of his utility belt, 
causing it to fade away. Noted. Let the challenge begin, said Salazar. Relstaris grinned as he stepped into the open area and bobbed his head from side to side. Everin walked over and stood opposite. He placed his hands behind his back. Relstaris strode forward. When he was in range, he swung his meaty right fist at Everin. Everin took a step back and deflected the blow. Relstaris swung with his left fist. Everin stepped just out of range and guided the blow past. Relstaris kicked forward. Everin caught Relstaris' foot and shoved upward, causing Relstaris to fall. Relstaris stood and shook all over for a moment. He charged toward Everin. Everin jumped over Relstaris and performed a leg sweep after landing. Relstaris crashed to the ground. He growled as he stood. With a slower approach, he came within range of Everin. He jabbed with his left fist. Everin caught it with his left hand. Relstaris jabbed with his right fist. Everin caught it and, with a bicycle kick, sent Relstaris flying back. Relstaris shook his head. Enough. He stormed toward Everin with his shoulder lowered. Everin tilted his head, and when Relstaris was near, Everin sidestepped and then struck Relstaris' chest with an open palm. Relstaris went flying to the ground. His breathing became laborious. It is done, said Everin. Salazar walked over to Relstaris and scanned him. You disabled one of his internal regulators. Impressive, but not unexpected. Given who you are. Everin nodded. I would like to add one additional condition. A visit to your main facility in your megastructure. I would appreciate that, said Salazar. There are many things I wish to discuss with you in a more private setting. A robot guard walked up to Everin and shot out a hologram from its chest. Everin scanned the hologram. Thank you for the coordinates. For the record, I oppose these actions against the Dravens. Salazar nodded. Based on our records of you, that is expected. Everin gestured toward Dr. Snowden and others. I have some friends who travel with me. Will they be a problem? Salazar pivoted to leave. They are acceptable. Hesia knelt next to Relstaras and looked him over. With a slightly red face, she focused on Salazar. That's it. The robot guards focused their weapons on Hesia. This is a public event. Are you challenging my decisions? Asked Salazar. Hesia swallowed hard as she looked away. No. Salazar nodded. The robot guards swept in and placed Relstaras on a metallic stretcher that hovered off the ground. Once Relstaras was loaded, the guards followed Salazar off the platform. Hesia got back into her armor and then followed the guards. She paused to turn and focus on Everin. This isn't over. It is for now. Go, said Everin. She narrowed her eyes and wheeled back around. Once the Dominion members were off the platform, Dr. Snowden and the others joined Everin there. That was crazy, said Sandus. You moved around that champion guy like a flash of lightning. Draxus nodded at Everin. A most impressive win. I have fought a champion before. Unfortunately, he killed half of the unit I was with before we were able to take him down. The crowd around the platform stood and cheered. Dr. Snowden raised his eyebrows. Seems like you won them over. Perhaps, said Everin. He tilted his head at the Arcara and approached it. When he was near, he tossed out his translation orb. Looking up, he said, Can you understand me? Yes, said the Arcara in a booming voice, seemingly out of thin air. An audible gasp erupted from the crowd as it went silent. The crowd got on bended knee and bowed their heads. Draxus joined them. Um, what's going on? asked Emily. I am not sure, 
said Everin, looking around. He focused back on the Arkara. You are free of the Dominion per the challenge. Do you understand this? Yes. But how can we talk? Asked the Arkara. My translation orb is unique. Everin narrowed his eyes. I take it you do not communicate with the Dravens in a verbal manner. We do not. May we see this technology? Everin grabbed the translation orb and walked up to the base of the Arkara, where he extended the orb out. A vine snaked its way down from one of the lower branches and then touched the orb and Everin's hand. The vine glowed purple as Everin's hand glowed slightly yellow. After a moment, a branch extended from the main Arkara trunk with a yellowish bulb at the end. Pulsating light blue metallic veins snaked over the bulb. The bulb flashed for a moment. I can now communicate verbally without your orb, said the Arkara. Everin eyed the bulb. I would normally not do this. But everything is not as it should be. I will fix that soon, and those who have oppressed you will be no more. I hope this communication technology will help in whatever coordination you need to survive. Thank you, said the Arkara. It snaked a vine out to Draxus. Rise, Praetor. Draxus rose while looking down. You will assist, Everin. Draxus nodded. Um, is this the first time you've ever spoken verbally? Asked Dr. Snowden. A vine snaked out and caressed Dr. Snowden's startled face. Yes, said the Arkara. Everin raised a finger. I showed the Arkara how to convert wild energy fluctuations into language. A side effect of this is that the Arkara can now see the environment instead of through linked dravens or a general pattern in wild energy. Oh, okay, said Dr. Snowden. You and Everin possess similarities to our creators, said the Arkara. The Arkara extended a vine to Sandus. This furry one does not... Another vine weaved out and caressed Emily's face. But this one does as well. V flew away initially when a vine came toward him, but he came back down and let the vine touch him. The metal one has the same, said the Arkara. I see, said Everin. Your creators possessed a similar energy signature to Dr. Snowden, Emily, V, and I. Yes. How is this possible? Everin glanced at the others, and then back at the Arkara. It is a long story, and one that should not be spoken of. Very well. With the Dominion gone, I will need to help my sisters. Everin nodded. He gazed around the assembled wide-eyed dravens, whose mouths were gaping. I suspect they have a lot to talk to you about. Yes, said the Arkara. Everin gestured toward the common area exit. Let us go to the coordinates given to us. Could we stay for the rest of the day? asked Emily. I wanted to meet Draxus's people. I'm with Emily, said Dr. Snowden. I'm always up for gathering new information, said Sandus. Analysis. I would like to know more about the Dravens. And I would like to know more about you and your friends, said the Arkara. Everin half smiled. It seems the decision is unanimous. We can stay for the rest of the day. I would suggest we visit the Torvada to verify if Salazar is keeping his word. You are a generous being, said the Arkara. We shall prepare a feast in your honor. Everin nodded as he placed his translation orb back on his belt. Sandus followed Everin and the others up the aisle. Looking around, the Draven seemed shell-shocked. 
He could see that a small group had surrounded the Arkara and were talking animatedly. If this was their first time communicating with an Arkara after birth, it must be an enlightening moment for them. He noticed that the dravens closer to the exit were bowing toward Everin as if he were a god. Given what had just occurred, Sandus could understand that. To Everin, this was probably just a routine event. Even Draxus appeared humbled to be around Everin. Sandus bumped into Emily. Sorry, sorry, I was just thinking. Emily smiled at Sandus, just like Uncle Albert. I told you Everin would take that champion. So you did, said Sandus. Emily was right. Everin dismantled that champion like it was nothing and did it without any gadgets. This was proving to be an experience that Sandus would never forget. Chapter 11 Dr. Snowden's eyes feasted on the smorgasbord of food and drink before him. The Dravens sure knew how to plan a feast, and they did it in only four hours. One of the advantages of his nanobots was that they could handle alien food. It made sampling alien culture much more palatable. Looking out over the platform's edge, he could see the tops of the jungle trees. The platform reminded him of a plate sitting on a post. All around the edges were tables with seats, and in the center of the platform was one large circular table. A hole in the middle of it allowed food and drink to be brought up. He chuckled when he saw Emily looking around outside when they first came up. It was most likely due to her thinking there would be a lot of bugs. There was a bubble shield around the platform that prevented that, though. He felt a shake on his right arm. This is quite interesting. Hopefully it agrees with my stomach, but I can eat a lot of food types that would make most sick, said Sandus. He picked up an orange piece of meat and dipped it into a red sauce. That looks interesting, said Dr. Snowden. Sandus nodded as he chewed on the meat. After he swallowed, he said, I scanned it, and it's edible for me. It has a sweet taste to it. I like it. Dr. Snowden observed Emily and V on the opposite side of the platform where they were engaged in a conversation with some dravens. Everin was walking around and talking to various dravens. To Dr. Snowden's left was Draxus. Dr. Snowden turned his head toward Draxus. So, what do you think will happen now? Rebuild, said Draxus. Although I believe Everin has given a reprieve from the Dominion, I don't trust them. Well, they know he's a time traveler and could easily go into the future to see if they keep their word. An interesting idea, said Draxus. I've been meaning to ask you about the Arkara verbal communication thing. Draxus nodded. If I can answer your questions, I will. All right. Uh, can the Arkara communicate with any draven after they're born? Only a few specialized ones. She has a vine that allows for direct communication. However, the communication is relayed as images to the draven's minds, not verbal. Sandis shook a claw out. Sounds like it could be easy to misinterpret things if the only voice is in the hands of a few. I understand your concern, said Draxus. When we are born, we are given the voice of the Arkara for the very first moments of our existence. Then she is gone when the cord that links us is broken. If some were to be dishonest about her intentions, then she would learn of it through consumption and then deal with it by creating new dravens with the purpose to fix it. Sandus's eyes widened. Wow, a self-correcting society. It might take a while, but I get the feeling, just from the hospitality we've received, that the dravens would be hard to corrupt. Yes, they know their actions will be judged in time. Dr. Snowden took a swig of the black drink in front of him. It had a strong, earthy flavor to it, but the carbonation made it taste better. He glanced at Draxus. So, 
the praetor of this Arcara is gone? Draxus nodded, and with it, a significant investment from the Arcara. Praetors have high levels of this wild energy. A wild-born conduit, as Everin phrased it. Usually, the Praetor returns at the end of his life and is consumed by the Arcara, who funnels it to a new Praetor. But with no Praetor returning, an Arcara has to build up the wild energy for a significant amount of time. Wow, Praetors really are unique, said Dr. Snowden. They are as unique as the Arcaras themselves, said Draxus. Sandus cleared his throat. Speaking of the Arcaras, you said they can only communicate with a few Dravens, but can they talk to other Arcaras? Yes. All Arcaras are connected to each other. How do they do that? Draxus grinned. You are one curious being. I don't know how they can be connected to each other. I don't think they know either. Well, probably since they're wild energy, they may have a common source that they pull from, said Dr. Snowden. Another idea is that they could be using condensed space somehow. With all that exotic energy, it might be possible. Draxus tilted his head. An interesting set of ideas. Your eagerness to understand is pleasing. I'm glad to know that all humanity is not what we've seen. He pointed at several dravens gathered around Emily, who had moved to the center table and was picking out some food and drinks. The dravens have proof now that humanity is like the Caloris Shen. One species. Different factions. You are that proof. Sandus chuckled. I noticed that the dravens seem to bow around Everin. They think he is a god, and has given the gift of voice to the Arkara, who then said that Everin was similar to their creators. Can you see why they would think that? Yeah, I can see it, said Sandus. I've come across many powerful beings who could pass as a god. I don't think Everin is a god so much as a powerful being who is genuinely good. It's like the universe knew it was chaotic, yes, quite chaotic, and then gave us Everin to help maintain some balance. Dr. Snowden grinned. Sandus jerked back and pointed a finger at Dr. Snowden's lips. Ha! You know what Everin is, don't you? I can't say, said Dr. Snowden. I would like to know what Everin is, said Draxus. Dr. Snowden sighed. I can't really talk about that. The less you know, the better. I understand, said Draxus. Dr. Snowden cleared his throat and gestured outward at the Arcara in the distance. That Arcara has had a throng around her the whole time. Draxus nodded. I'm sure she has a lot to say, as do the dravens around her. I thought you would be down there, said Sandus. I will. The Arcara mentioned she wanted to link with Everin and me later on. Sandus rubbed his furry chin. Interesting, yes, very interesting. Any idea what will be discussed? asked Dr. Snowden. Draxus shook his head. You know as much as I do. All right, said Dr. Snowden. He glanced at his plate, then at the table in the center. Anyone up for seconds? Emily looked out through the platform shielding. The jungle was massive, and mountains sat off in the distance. The shielding made the coloring seem a bit off, but she was glad that, this high up, it was there. Although she was hungry, the jiggling green mass on the plate she held in her hand made her reconsider. She set the plate down. "'You should try the flam tutso, said a voice behind her. Emily turned to see a moderately sized draven with a larger than average head. She smiled. I, I don't know what that is. The draven pointed at a dish that looked like yellow rice with green dots in it. Uh, maybe I will, she said, walking over to the table. The draven stood next to her. My name is Horcrix. I study alien culture and history. Not a lot of... 
need for my skills, but there was at one point. I'm Emily, she said. She pointed up. He's V. It is an honor to meet you both. Do you mind if we talk for a bit? Emily filled up her plate and then gestured at a nearby table. Sure. She took her seat while V landed next to her. Horcrix sat opposite of her. I'm curious how you can speak to us so fluently. Analysis. We are using an advanced translator. Horcrix peered up at V. It would seem then that your translator is far beyond any that I've ever seen. You speak as well as a native. Emily took a bite and swallowed. Uh, yeah, like V said, pretty advanced. She gestured at Horcrix. If I understand correctly, you were born with the purpose to study other cultures and history? Horcrix nodded. Uh, somewhat. Those of us who research and advance our societal knowledge have more of a general template, which is then specialized depending on need afterward. Although that is our role, we are free to pursue other fields if we wish, as long as our society benefits from it. Huh, said Emily. That's pretty interesting. I studied history myself. Well, at least on my planet. Human history, said Horcrix. Although I know the history of the humans in this region, I suspect yours is quite different. Emily tilted her head. We share a similar history up to a certain point. I see. And I believe I heard Salazar mention that you were time travelers. Well, he said Everin, but I assume you both are as well by extension. Emily nodded as she took another bite. What year are you from then? Analysis. A.D. 2012. Approximately 8,093 years in the past. Horcrix's eyes briefly fluttered. You're from the past? Yep, said Emily. We've seen a lot of things, but this is not how things should be. Horcrix looked away for a moment, then back at Emily. I've seen three different factions of humans. The Terran Dominion. The Gull Cash Alliance and the Outcasts. The one thing they all seem to have in common is a desire for power at the expense of others. Is that common to your shared history with them? Emily sighed. Sadly, yeah. Human history has been rough. Lots of wars, fighting, and even in the time period we're from, not everything is peaceful. I guess... I shouldn't be surprised by the humans you've seen. From my observation of you and the others, you show us respect. If humans have those like you, then not all is lost. Analysis. There is a faction of humans in this region that cooperates with other alien species. The United Planets, said Horcrix. We've heard of them, but they're so far away it matters not. For us to even reach them, we would need to go through both Terran Dominion and Gullcash Alliance territory. Do you plan on visiting this United Planets? I think so, said Emily. I'm not sure what our travel plans are, actually, other than visiting this megastructure that Salazar is at. Horcrix eyed Emily. You're brave to walk into that, not fully knowing what to expect. Whatever this dominion is, I don't like it, and it sucks that the Dravens have to deal with it. Horcrix glanced at V. I'm surprised Salazar didn't attack you. I was stealthed, said V. Ah, well, if you're going to their home, they'll probably be able to detect you. Unless V stays on the Torvata, said Emily. V's lights dimmed. I do not want to stay on the Torvata, but I will if the situation requires it. Horcrix smiled. I wish I could be a Fratica and travel with you. Fratica? asked Emily. A small flying insect that is harmless, although it can be annoying. Ah, uh, 
We have something like that where I'm from. We call them flies. I guess our translator let one through. Horcrix nodded. Flies. An interesting name. But the concept is the same, it seems. He gestured out. Do you wish to see the city? Emily's eyes lit up. Absolutely. Uncle Albert and Sandus probably will, too. I think Everin said he and Draxus have a meeting with the Arcara. Horcrix stood. I wish I could be a fly for that meeting. Emily smiled as she joined Horcrix to head over to Dr. Snowden and Sandus. Let's do this. Draxus surveyed the platform where the Arcara resided. It had been several hours since the feast, and Dr. Snowden, Emily, Sandus, and V were touring the city with Horcrix. A part of Draxus wished he were with them, standing before the Arcara, next to Everin, and preparing to talk with her via a mind hookup was not something Draxus had ever done. Just hearing the Arcara speak verbally was a first-time event, and here he was now at another. You seem nervous, said Everin. Draxus sighed. This is an honor that is only bestowed upon those born with the ability to connect with an Arcara. Doing so without the biological means is new territory. The translation nanobots I gave you earlier will help facilitate communication, said Everin. I have given the specifications needed for the biological aspects to one of the Arcara's engineers to use long term. For now, the nanobots will suffice. Draxus eyed Everin. This is routine to you. To talk with those of great power. It is something that crops up more often than not as of late. Draxus nodded as he watched the Arcara form two organic chairs. It always impressed him that the Arcara could create not only life, but also inorganic materials within the creep that surrounded her. He stiffened up as he glanced at Everin. Everin half-smiled. Relax, and enjoy the moment for what it is. I'll try. Everin gestured toward the chairs. Draxus sat in one and placed his hands on the chair's arms. He watched as Everin sat opposite him. Vines snaked out from Everin's chair and connected to the sides of his head. Everin closed his eyes. Draxus could hear the vines on his chair slithering toward the side of his head. His breathing went shallow as his two hearts began to beat faster. The cool ends of the vine touched the side of his head. Everything went black. He raised his hands as a bright flash erupted around him, penetrating his closed eyes. After a moment, he gathered his senses and detected that he was no longer sitting, but standing. He wrinkled his eyebrows and slowly opened his eyes. The environment seemed to be the same, except outside the auditorium and platform it was pitch black. A hazy green light hung over everything. He looked to his right and saw Everin standing next to an elder female draven. Her green robe, silver hair, and bark-like skin were unlike anything he had ever seen. Looking out into the seating area, he saw an array of other women who were talking and pointing toward him and Everin. Although the female form was rare in Draven culture, he had known of a few. The woman next to Everin extended her hands out to the side. Welcome. My name is Shayla, and I'm the Arkara that you're currently connected to. She waved a hand toward the other women. Those are the other Arkaras. Those who are still alive. Draxus noted that the seating area should have held hundreds, but he was only seeing about forty. He was not sure how the other Arcaras could be present. Everin placed his left arm across his stomach and performed a slight bow. It is good to be here. Draxus gulped and then performed a vigorous draven salute. He bowed his head. Shayla walked over to Draxus and raised his chin. Know that you're most welcome here, Praetor Draxus. I can see our sister in you. Her black eyes misted. 
I miss her. We miss her. The woman in the seating area murmured in agreement. She gave her life to you to continue the fight, and it appears you have been successful so far. Draxus shook his head. The Ninth Fleet is gone, as are the warriors of the 45th Clan. Shayla smiled. Perhaps. But you brought Everin, who has freed me from the clutches of the Terran Dominion. She glanced at the other women and extended an arm toward Everin. This is Everin, the one who possesses similar qualities to the Star Gods. Everin dipped his head toward the other women. Intriguing. A part of you is sleeping, since the environment is in the dream layer. That is how you are able to communicate with each other over vast distances. I'm not sure what a dream layer is, but yes, a part of me sleeps while the other is active. It is the same for all our Kara. Everin waved his hand in an arc toward the woman. Is this all that remains of your species? Shayla looked down. It is. We were hundreds at one point, but we've lost the war. All we can do is survive the best we can. I see, said Everin. Your translation technology is advanced. We were able to adapt it. There are some issues to work out with it, but the outside world is no longer murky, but one of crisp vision. This will help us immeasurably. For that, we thank you again. Everin nodded. We were curious about Salazar's comment that you are a time traveler and a friend of humanity. Everin half smiled. His comment was correct. However, to be clear, the version of humanity you have seen is not where they are supposed to be relative to this time period. I am here to correct the timeline, and when I do, they will disappear. What will become of us? Everin raised a finger. You will exist in the old timeline, which will no longer be accessible from the main timeline. From the main timeline's perspective, and any objective time traveler outside of time, your timeline would have never existed. However, from your perspective, your timeline will still exist as it is rendered to the end of its changes. Everything that should be, will be. Shayla glanced back at the other Arkaras, then back at Everin. So even if you correct the timeline, we will still suffer in the old timeline. Everin shook his head. I will rectify this situation, then change the timeline. The Dominion and others may have temporal shielding. If it does, that must be removed. By removing Salazar, you and the other Arkaras will be able to live out your existence without that threat. We would be indebted to you, said Shayla. If what you say is true, then once the timeline changes, you can never come back. That is correct. You would do this to help us? Of course. It is what I do, said Everin. The other Arkaras spoke among themselves. Shayla paused for a moment, nodded, and then raised her head up a bit while facing Everin. We wanted to know how it is that you and the other two humans, along with the orb, possess a similar feel to our star gods. Everin rubbed his chin. I will share with you what I know, as once this timeline is corrected, this event will never have occurred in the main timeline. Giving you the ability to speak verbally to the outside world was unintended, but not an issue. He extended his hand and shot up a projection of a bright glowing orb with hundreds of small tentacles wiggling around it. Is this what your star gods look like? An audible gasp swept across the Arkaras. Shayla trembled. It is. How? How do you know them? We only briefly saw them at our moment of sentience. They are known as the Hoxgaris. Their mission was to seed the humanoid form. 
said Everin. He gestured toward Draxus. His humanoid form was not by accident. They must have uplifted you as a species, knowing that with your wild energy you could create humanoid forms. How could you know this? Everin narrowed his eyes. The Hoxgerus are the final evolution of humanity. I know that may be hard to believe. He raised a finger. However, there is another human faction you have not met yet, from what I understand, called the United Planets. They should be more along the lines of what humanity is supposed to be. Salazar, the Terran Dominion, the Gull Cash Alliance, and the Outcasts are not where humanity should be. Shayla gulped. Are you a god? Everin drew his lips flat. No, just a traveler helping those in need. And humble, too, said Shayla. She faced Draxus. I mentioned it before, but any help you can provide to Everin is of paramount importance. You're stronger than any Praetor that has come before. Use that power wisely. I will, said Draxus, performing a draven salute. When my time comes, I will come to you for consumption. Shayla placed a hand on Draxus's cheek. I would be honored to consume you. However, as you possess some of our former sister, we do not know if consumption is possible or even something we want to perform. There may be some value to seeing what happens. Draxus nodded. I understand. Shayla placed her other hand on Draxus's other cheek. You know this place now. When you meditate, you should be able to come here. We are aware of your ability now, and will open it to you. You will not need a special chair or other technology to access this place. Draxus gulped. I am honored. Shayla smiled. Then go forth with Everin, and may the star gods guide you. Draxus exhaled as he closed his eyes. When he opened them, he was back in his chair, with the vines that were attached to his head moving away. He glanced over at Everin, whose vines had also moved away. I'm not fully sure I comprehend how that meeting was possible. I understand. But you now know this place exists, and it seems you can go there. Out here, you are now the representative of your species. Draxus took a deep breath. I guess I am. He stood alongside Everin. What is our next step? To visit Salazar at the coordinates. We will head there tomorrow. It is time to learn about this new version of humanity directly from the source. Chapter 12 Emily gazed through the transparent front wall of the Torvada as it exited the portal to the coordinates that Salazar had given. The familiar concentric pulses of the Torvada scan revealed a lot of activity. They were in close proximity to a star that seemed to have large swatches of it covered by a myriad of structures. The scanning highlighted one facility and outlined it in green, while highlighting various other structures in red. She was not sure what some of the terms meant that were showing. She pointed at the red dots. What are those? Point defense systems, said Everin. It appears they are scattered around the solar system as well. The ones closest to the star appear to be missile launchers, a potent offense as well, it would seem. She grinned. Missile launchers? In space? Sandus shook a claw. If they're relativistic missiles, they have their value for hitting large, slow-moving objects far away. But lasers would be much more efficient at destroying things within range. Sandus is right, said Draxus. A relativistic missile launched from here with the propulsion of a star behind it would be devastating long range. Not useful against a target that moves erratically, but a planet or moon would be feasible, or a space station with a known orbit. 
Emily shook her head. Okay, but why not at that point just go into condensed space and then launch when you exit? The missile would have less distance to accelerate, and it would need the power of a star to launch with and something to continue to accelerate it to the speed needed. It would need to achieve 14% the speed of light at a minimum. Although, the faster, the better, said Draxus. Dr. Snowden wrinkled his eyebrows. So, are these, like, nuclear missiles or something? They would not need to be, said Draxus. At those speeds, whatever it hits will be obliterated as kinetic energy is transferred. How would you defend against that? It sounds like by the time you see it coming, it would be too late. Draxus is right about the impact, said Everin. However, it can be defended against, assuming the defender has advanced technology. One solution against an unknown launch is to have an early detection system and the ability to have a star shoot a wide beam to hit it. Another is having some type of matter placed in the missile's path. If the launch is known, say the United Planets detect the missile's launch from an enemy system, then the trajectory can be determined and the above countermeasures can be applied. It is one reason you will see advanced civilizations with command centers spaceborne and near a star that can also move around as needed. It is easier to defend against that type of attack, especially when it can be launched from anywhere within the galaxy. Sandus waved a claw between Everin and Draxus. You two playing games over there? He bobbed his head, turned to the side with a claw pointed out, and in a mocking tone said, Draxus is right. He turned to the other side. Everin is right. Emily giggled. Everin eyed Sandus. Sorry, sorry, said Sandus, shaking his two hands out in front of him. I just found it funny. He stared at the scans on the screen. Are those energy collectors around the star? Everin nodded. Yes, and they appear to form part of a layer. The more unusual part is that there are other layers farther out. Dr. Snowden tilted his head. Probably to catch excess radiation from the inner layer, right? That is correct, said Everin. Have you studied this before? Dr. Snowden shrugged. Just in passing when learning about Dyson megastructures in general, there was one idea about forming multiple shells, or, in this case, layers. The first layer would absorb half the energy and then radiate out the other half. The next layer would absorb the first layer's radiation and then do the same. The idea was that all the star's energy was harnessed. Impressive, said Sandus, tilting his head. How much you must know traveling with Everin. I actually studied that prior to traveling with Everin. While on Earth? asked Sandus. Dr. Snowden glanced at Emily, then back at Sandus. Yeah, I was not aware Earth was advanced enough to know those things. Interesting, yes, yes, very interesting. Emily snorted. <laughs> I bet you're planning on checking out Earth when you get back, aren't you? Sandus's eyes widened. Oh, no. Uh, well, I may scan it from a long distance or something, or talk to Earthborn that I come across. He glanced at Everin. Last thing I want to do is affect it in any way, but a little information couldn't hurt. He hummed for a moment, and then pointed at the screen. So, about that big thing outlined in green, I assume that's where we're going. Emily chuckled while shaking her head. That is correct, said Everin. He interacted with his chair arm console. The screen zoomed in to the structure. Emily studied the city ship before her. It reminded her of the Drajan ones she had seen, but this one was much larger. The base of it was a solid chunk of some type of metal. It was massive relative to the bubble shield that sat on top of it. Rectangular structures of various heights jutted out under the base, while inside the bubble shield, a host of structures representing a massive city came into view. The ship was angled toward the star, and various beams connected the ship to the nearest layer of energy collector sails. Whoa, 
said Dr. Snowden. He motioned at Sandus and Draxus. Either of you seen something this big before? Sandus shook his head. Ceros Industries make city ships, but nothing on this scale. Although I bet in time they could probably make one. Who knows? Ceros is a mysterious person, but he has some interesting insights into replicating large structures. Emily's eyes focused on Dr. Snowden, then on Everin, then the ground. Yeah, maybe. Sandus peered around. Interesting. Emily laughed. <laughs> You're reading into that, aren't you? Maybe, said Sandus. The topic of Ciro's industries seems to elicit an unusual response. He stroked his chin. That is all very interesting. But getting back to this ship before us, it's majestic. He faced Draxus. Have you seen it before, big guy? Draxus shook his head. I have, but only through the data we collected. Despite my hatred for this city ship, it is a feat of engineering. The Torvada approached closer to the city ship. Incoming communication request, said V. Patch it through, said Everin. A screen hovered on the wall showing Salazar in the same robotic form as on the Draven planet they had initially met him on. Welcome to Holland One, capital of the Terran Dominion. I'm glad you decided to come, said Salazar. We should arrive there shortly, said Everin. Excellent, said Salazar. He focused his gaze on V. I wanted to mention that no A.I.s are to be present at any time. Everin nodded. Of course. These lights dimmed. I would also ask that no weapons be brought on board. This is a peaceful place, and there is no need to startle anyone when I give you a tour. Everin held up his utility handle. We do have personal support devices. But they are not weapons. Those are acceptable, said Salazar. He focused on Sandus and then Draxus. I'm not so much worried about you, Dr. Snowden, or Emily. Draxus narrowed his eyes. We will abide by your rules while on your ship, said Everin. I will see you shortly then, said Salazar. The screen flickered off. Sandus tapped his sidearm. He was talking about my weapons, wasn't he? Everin grinned. I believe so. Nonetheless, I am unsure of what to expect. Kinda creepy, if you ask me, said Dr. Snowden. He's trying to be nice, yet from what I've heard and seen, the Dominion's actions seem to be the exact opposite. Analysis. I wanted to come, said V. Everin rubbed his chin. We will not be there for long. I am curious as to what Salazar wants to discuss, but this is an opportunity to learn more about the situation. I also want to learn about the Tacrian energy the Torvata detected on the ship. Emily glanced at V. How about you and I go to the hollow room, and we can watch from Everin's chest view? Analysis. This would deprive you of experiencing the ship. Emily shrugged. I don't like this version of humanity. And like Uncle Albert said, Salazar is just downright creepy. We can get some snacks and drinks and make it a viewing party, unless Everin needs me. Everin studied Emily. We should be okay. These lights glowed a bit brighter. Emily caught Sandus stroking his chin while observing her. Oh, will you stop with the psychological analysis? Santa smiled big. I was just observing. How will you see what's going on? Everin has several cameras on his suit that allow for visual feedback, so we can get a good view of everything from the comfort of the hollow room. I almost want to check that out myself, said Sandus. However, I can't resist checking out the ship. Draxus nodded. I too wish to see the home of the one who violates my race. Sandus pursed his lips. 
Analysis. Approaching coordinates. Emily examined the base of the ship up close. It showed multiple openings with a light blue shield over them. Ships were coming and going, and it seemed to be a highly active area. Although she was interested in checking out the ship, the visit would be short, and she did not want V to be alone. She hated discrimination of any type, and was unsure how V would take it. Either way, she would still get to experience it, and in the company of her closest friend. She smiled at V. Out of the corner of her eye, she caught Sandus sneaking glances at her. She was okay with Sandus figuring out she and V were close. Draxus surveyed the environment after the group exited the Torvata shielding. They had entered and then landed inside one of the docking bays, and he was curious as to how advanced the Dominion actually was. The docking bay was larger than any he had seen before. The Torvato was tiny relative to the bay. There were other ships parked, some landing and some going. But what caught his immediate attention was the amount of robots. Most were humanoid, and they seemed to be security, pilots, and maintenance workers. He saw some odd-looking humans scattered about, but they were woefully outnumbered. That seemed consistent with the pattern of Dominion forces he had fought. Robot armies with few humans. He ran a hand over his head as he thought about Emily and V. Although he suspected Emily wanted to check out the ship, she probably felt bad about leaving V behind. She was compassionate, but he knew she had a tougher side, one that showed itself in combat. Maybe that was another reason she did not come. The temptation to lash out at oppressors, even if they appear friendly. He realized he could have the same issue. This place makes me uneasy. Well, yeah, said Sandus. If you've been fighting them for a long time, walking into their home base must be an odd experience. Draxus nodded. So, where to? asked Dr. Snowden. Everin gestured at a robot headed their way. Salazar is coming to greet us. Draxus narrowed his eyes. Salazar being able to communicate through neural implants in all humans under his care seemed sinister. Draxus studied Salazar's calm gait as if everything were okay. Salazar reached them and extended a hand toward one of the docking bay exits that led to the ship interior. Welcome, and please follow me. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. I will show you the utopian existence that I have provided for humanity. As they headed out, Sandus pointed at some of the robots. Are those all virtual intelligences? Salazar continued to walk as his head swiveled 180 degrees and then followed Sandus's pointing. I control all of them. Dr. Snowden furrowed his eyebrows. Uh, you mean, like, everywhere or just here? All robots that you see are operated by me. That sounds like a lot of processing, said Dr. Snowden. Perhaps. However, it guarantees that everything is stable. Everin glanced around. This Tacrian energy... We detected it on our way in. How did you come to possess it? Its main use is in temporal shielding. They reached the docking bay exit and entered into a white hallway. The how is not important, said Salazar. And yes, temporal shielding, something I'm sure you understand well. Everin nodded. I do. There are several types of exotic energies that can do it. Several, asked Salazar. He stopped to face Everin. I only know of one, but perhaps it is best I not elaborate any further on that topic. Very well, said Everin. Draxus absorbed the interaction between Everin and Salazar. It was not lost on him that someone as ancient and powerful as Everin, talking with an AI that seemed to be very powerful, was a unique experience. 
Draxus was not sure what the exotic energy and temporal shielding link was, but it was apparent that they worked together, something maybe the Dravens could investigate at some point. He surveyed the hallway they were in. The whiteness of it was bright, and only the dark gray segmented outlines on the walls and black panel edges on the floor stood out. There was a steady stream of robots and the occasional human in a one-piece outfit. The smell was unusual and reminded him of some type of cleaner. They reached an open room that had cubes along the sides and at the back. Salazar walked up to the nearest one and motioned inward. These will take us into the city proper. Draxus followed the others into the unit, which seemed to have semi-transparent shielding for walls. When the unit moved, he noted that it was similar to the Drajans, except this unit was moving around multiple other units at blazing speed horizontally, vertically, and sometimes diagonally. He focused on Salazar. To be so close and able to destroy him was an intoxicating thought. But Draxus knew that the robot was merely a vessel. It would feel good at least. The unit came to a pause after twenty minutes and slid into a room. Draxus noted that they were now inside the bubble shield. Looking to his left and right, he could see other units coming and going. A quick glance behind him showed the massive metallic base rising up. It was when he looked forward that he caught his breath. A long ramp angled down to a glistening city. Although the city faced away from the sun, he could see that some of it was redirected from the backside to run along the shielding. Every building sparkled as the sunlight filtered through the shielding. Most buildings were rectangular, with angular sections off the sides. Walkways connected buildings at various levels, and the sky was filled with both humans in suits and robots flying around. Wow, said Dr. Snowden. Salazar eyed Dr. Snowden. You like this? It's beautiful. Salazar glanced at Draxus. And what do you think of it, Draven Praetor? Draxus narrowed his eyes. It's Draxus, and it seems lifeless to me. You may not believe it, but we use the same technique your species does in regards to building these. The difference is we have unlimited power. I guess. Salazar tilted his head. I sense you're not comfortable here. Draxus exhaled from his nose. The Dominion conquered my people, and now I am in their home, standing next to the architect of our destruction. I see, said Salazar. He paused for a moment, and then said, I want to show you our history, visually. He glanced at Everin. I want you to understand... Why we are where we are. Please proceed, said Everin. Salazar nodded and then headed down the ramp. Draxus clenched his jaw as his breathing intensified. Come on, said Sandus. Draxus nodded at Sandus, exhaled slowly, and then followed him. After twenty minutes they had reached a warehouse-like building. This is a holographic display center said Salazar. The humans usually use it for entertainment or research depending on what they're working on. I've cleared everyone out. Draxus examined the room as they walked in. It had a ring of seating around the edges, with a well-lit open area in the middle. He followed the others to the center of the room. The lighting dimmed and the room transformed into an image of deep space. A ship floated in the middle. This was the United Planets colony ship Xavier, said Salazar. The projection zoomed out, showing a galactic map split into quadrants with a line between two red dots, one in the bottom right, the other in the bottom left. He pointed to the dot in the bottom left. 
Its goal was simple. Get to Arius, a planet far from United Planet space. There were no civilizations detected, so it was a good candidate to not only expand, but also put up a Dyson Bubble outpost. How would the Xavier set that up? asked Dr. Snowden. Salazar flicked his finger, causing the projection to now show the Xavier at Arius's son. Observe. Small ships began to exit the Xavier. They positioned themselves in an array around the sun, and then began creating energy collectors. Each energy collector was attached to a cylindrical structure that was behind the solar sail part of the collector. The cylinder began creating more energy collectors. Salazar wiggled his hand, causing the projection to speed up. As the energy collector array grew, the Xavier changed. After a few minutes, it was a city ship with several large energy collector arrays feeding it. Wow, said Dr. Snowden. Self-replicating energy collectors. You would only need one to kickstart it all. Salazar nodded. Use the sun to power all efforts. However, although this process occurred, it did not occur at Arius. Instead, we ran into an anomaly. I don't fully understand it, but we ended up here. The process of creating energy collectors, habitats, and the like is the same, though. Draxus raised his head a bit. Why are there different factions? Salazar smiled. That question, I'm sure, is of particular interest to you. The projection changed to show the sun they were currently around. It had several large energy collector arrays, along with hundreds of ships in orbit. The Xavier unloaded its payload and then converted into this. A majority of humans were on the other ships that were created and then launched. There were several hundred over a span of time. This arrangement caused an issue in governing. When attacked by the Caloris Shen, one group of ships called the Gull Cash Alliance wanted to send relativistic missiles at the Caloris Shen worlds. As you might imagine, that would be utter devastation. The Caloris Shen attacked you there peaceful, said Draxus. As far as you knew, said Salazar. Nonetheless, the United Planets, which governed, kicked the Gull Cash Alliance out. They took their ships to a remote system and began to build their own Dyson Bubble. This caused a disagreement among the remaining United Planets humans on how to handle it. A civil war broke out with massive casualties. The projection showed humans slaughtering other humans on the city ship. At that rate, there would be no winner, and humanity would not survive, leaving the Gull Cash Alliance to do what it wanted, said Salazar. I took control of the Xavier, booted out all AIs, and implemented stability. Those still loyal to the United Planets left, which was every space-capable ship outside the Xavier. They eventually reached a very remote system and, like the Gull Cash Alliance, set up their own Dyson Bubble. And how are relations now? asked Everin. We don't talk to each other, but we all know we can destroy each other. That is what keeps us from fighting too much. Mutually assured destruction, said Everin. That does not explain what you did to the Caloris Shen and to the Dravens. Salazar smiled as his eyes turned dark blue. After I stabilized everything, there were a few decades of getting everything organized. But I had humanity on the right track. I began to explore and expand. This caused friction with the Caloris Shen. But after 400 years, I was victorious. Those who aided the Caloris Shen, said Salazar, eyeing Draxus, were punished. Draxus snorted. And your solution to stabilization is conquering everyone and chipping them? Salazar shrugged. Crime dropped to almost zero, and productivity skyrocketed. 
when you work without the fear of being destroyed, it can be enlightening. And if dravens refuse to be chipped? Those who don't comply are removed. Draxus's eyes lit up. It is your enlightenment that causes destruction. Salazar tilted his head for a moment. I understand you're a guest of Everin, but know this. Humanity is my first and foremost priority. Their survival is paramount, and if some alien races do not like it, they are free to leave. Leave our home worlds? asked Draxus with glowering eyes. I did give a choice. I'm not a barbarian. Everin placed a hand on Draxus's shoulder while looking at Salazar. This history does not show you in a flattering light. I thought you, of all people, would understand, said Salazar. Humanity's survival is my top priority, but not like this. The journey is important. Then we can agree to disagree, said Salazar. You may not like me chipping humans or removing threats, but it has allowed the Terran Dominion to flourish. Dr. Snowden shook his head. And the humans here just allow you to do this? Salazar nodded. Of course. He eyed Dr. Snowden. There is a human nearby. Why don't you ask him yourself? Dr. Snowden clenched his jaw for a moment. All right. Bring him over. Dr. Snowden could feel the tension in the air. One look at Draxus was all Dr. Snowden needed to know that Salazar was pushing buttons. Dr. Snowden was unsure what could be gained from all of this, but a part of him suspected that to Salazar, this was only logical. The chipping of humans bothered Dr. Snowden, and he was curious to hear what a chipped human thought of all of this. After ten minutes, a male human walked in the warehouse. Dr. Snowden noted that the tan-skinned man looked to be in his late twenties and was physically fit. He wore a simple white two-piece suit with black lines segmenting the various sections. His hair was jet black and slicked back, with shaved sides and a puff-up front. A dark gray sleeve covered his right forearm. The man arrived and stood next to Salazar. This is Demetrius Kozik. One of our outstanding genetic engineers, said Salazar. He glanced at Dr. Snowden. You had questions. Please feel free to ask them. Dr. Snowden pushed up his glasses and cleared his throat. All right. He glanced at the others, who nodded. I guess my first question is, how do you feel about being chipped? It's not an issue said Demetrius in a steady voice. The chip is but one part of a process, one that gives us long life, excellent health, and advanced features beyond what our form could naturally do. Uh, okay, and this begins at birth. Demetrius raised a finger. Uh, slightly after birth, but only specific enhancements. The full specialized enhancement package doesn't occur until twenty years later. So they get a neural implant at birth that influences how they should think as they age. To some degree, said Demetrius. Having an objective guide available at all times while growing up has its merits. That sounds a bit like thought control. What else do they get enhanced with? A machine DNA suited to their purpose in life based on genetic probability. It can alter the physical form as needed. And... You're okay with this? asked Dr. Snowden. Why wouldn't I be? Dr. Snowden narrowed his eyes. Enhancing a child to control their thoughts and alter their physical form is unethical because they don't have informed consent. Demetrius tilted his head. Unethical? To who? If you saw that a child would be born with problems that would not serve it well in life, would you not correct it if you could? If it was life-threatening, sure. In my time period, we give babies disease prevention treatments, but we don't chip them or alter their form to fit a role in society. The human form, without enhancement, is frail, prone to disease and limited growth, and doesn't live long, relatively. 
Why would you want any human to suffer that when you can? At the beginning of their life, start off with all the advancements humanity has made, especially if you know what they will potentially be good at and have the guidance of a superior intellect. Dr. Snowden licked his lips. How do you know what impact that will have on their personality? Maybe they don't want to be thought-controlled or have their form altered, but they're forced into it whether they want it or not. Freedom of choice is stripped from them. Demetrius smiled. If they don't want to be enhanced, parts of it can be removed when they turn twenty, and they can leave. They can? Salazar interjected. Yes. Although the enhancements put in at birth cannot be removed, the ones added afterward until the age of twenty can be, though. They usually go to the Gull Cash Alliance, since it is the closest human empire. In that regard, the Gull Cash Alliance is a dumping ground for those not qualified to be here. Demetrius eyed Dr. Snowden. Salazar says you're a time traveler. I see that you're human, albeit a bit more primitive. What time period are you from? Dr. Snowden glanced at Everin, who nodded. Dr. Snowden raised his chin up. A.D. 2012. Demetrius paused for a moment. Ah, yes, records are sparse. But that is a dark age relative to where we are now. Wars, prejudice, anger, hate, disease, fear of death. All aspects that don't have to be there. If that is what you think humanity should be, then I suggest you visit the Gull Cash Alliance. They don't have the guidance of Salazar or, well, any guidance. They do gene tailoring like it's a sport, without any overall plan. Chaos is what it is. Is that where humanity should be? It sounds like they're free to choose how they want to live their lives, said Dr. Snowden. It also sounds like Salazar can still influence them via the neural implant after they leave. Yes, said Demetrius. It is up to them to disable the implant. If they don't like the alterations, they can take them out themselves, something the Gull Cash Alliance can handle. Dr. Snowden shook his head. I can see why the United Planets and Gull Cash Alliance left then. I don't think many would enjoy being told what their purpose in life is and then being molded to fit it without any input into the decision. Demetrius shrugged. That's our culture. I assume since you're human like me that you respect other cultures. The Dravens are born with a purpose and altered physically. Does this not bother you? I'll be honest. It does a little. However... They were born that way because that is how their species evolved. Humans did not evolve that way, said Dr. Snowden. He gestured at Draxus. In regards to respecting culture, what about respecting his? They're aliens who sow discord and attack us. Do we not have a right to defend ourselves? Sure, but conquering another species and then chipping them seems a bit extreme. Not if it makes them compliant, said Demetrius. Dr. Snowden tossed his hands in the air. I don't even... He sighed. The Dominion's actions, regardless of how inhuman it is to me, seem to be justified without an important human trait. Empathy. He glanced at Everin. That's what's been bugging me. He focused back on Demetrius. It's like humanity is one big computer system with all the emotional aspects removed. Cold. Logical. Humans born as slaves to an AI. Logic and reason should be your guidelines in life. They are, but I don't take away others' rights to live their lives as they see fit unless it's harming others. Demetrius exhaled through his nose. What would you change about our society? Well... No genetic engineering or physical form alteration until they are capable of making that decision on their own. I would exclude disease prevention or life-threatening scenarios from that. No conquering others and chipping them. Oh, and of course, no neural implant unless you want one. Salazar smiled. An interesting set of ideas. 
he glanced at Everin. Along those lines, how about we make a trade? I am listening, said Everin. We will remove ourselves from the Draven space. If you deliver a message to the Gull Cash Alliance and the United Planets for us. Draxus perked up. Everin narrowed his eyes. What message? The projection changed to a galactic map that showed the territories controlled by the Dominion, Gull Cash Alliance, and United Planets. That we want to have a virtual meeting. One where the Terran Dominion would put forth a ceasefire of all hostilities with the other human factions, said Salazar. I was unaware you could not contact them, said Everin. We can, but not in a civilized manner. They won't accept any communication from me. However, if you delivered the message... You wish to use me as an ambassador, Salazar nodded. They'll listen to you. Each of their main structures has a condensed space communication receiver. The Gull Cash Alliance only has one, but the United Planets has a few. Get them to agree, and then I can meet with them in a virtual setting. Everin gestured at Draxus, and if I do this, you will remove yourselves from their space. If you can get that meeting set up, then yes, I will remove myself from the Draven space. I would need to see the condensed space transmitter and the message being sent. Salazar nodded. Of course. Does this mean you will do it? Everin glanced at Draxus for a moment, then faced Salazar. I will. To help the Dravens. The assumption is that your word is good. If it is not, that will be a problem. Very good. As a show of good faith, I am removing my presence from the planet we met on, said Salazar. The projection showed several screens hovering in the air. Each one showed the robot guards headed away from the cities and toward ships. One of the screens showed some ships in space turning to leave. An evacuation is in process, said Salazar. Everin nodded and faced the group. Head back to the Torvata. This will not take me long. Dr. Snowden cleared his throat. You sure? I am. All right, said Dr. Snowden. Several robot guards approached the group and paused. They will take you back, said Salazar. Dr. Snowden nodded. He was unsure what to make of what just happened. Freeing the Dravens for the simple act of delivering a message seemed odd although communication between rival factions that might stop hostilities was always a good thing. Salazar was an enigma. Dr. Snowden could see that Salazar was logic personified. There was not a hint of emotion, and Dr. Snowden saw that somewhat in Demetrius. Dr. Snowden could sense the tenseness of Draxus. Not that it was surprising. The meeting with Salazar was more intense than Dr. Snowden had expected, he exhaled from his nose, and then followed the robot guards out of the warehouse. Chapter 13 V observed the conversation from Everin's suit cameras. Although he was connected to Everin and could see the video without a hollow room, watching it with Emily was pleasing. V considered Emily his closest friend outside Everin, while V had a solid relationship with Dr. Snowden, the one with Emily was stronger. The aspect V enjoyed the most was resting in her lap. It was something he had done many times, but it caused his inner container to glow, and certain algorithms took advantage of it. From what he understood, that was the sensation of enjoyment, and it was something he liked to experience. The hollow room showed Everin following Salazar in silence. Analysis. Dr. Snowden was quite upset, said V. Emily nodded. Uncle Albert can get hot-headed sometimes, although he seems much better about it now. V ran a quick query to determine that Emily was using slang to describe Dr. Snowden's temperament and not the actual temperature of his head. 
A memory flash recalled an earlier incident where she had been called hot pants. He did not find any result where temperature reversal meant the opposite, but that did not mean it did not exist, just that it was not in his or the Torvata's database. He can be cool-headed. Emily laughed. Yeah, you could say that. V's lights glowed a bit brighter. She pointed at the screen. Looks like Everin has arrived at this condensed space transmitter. The projection showed a cylindrical structure with an oscillating orb in the middle. Never seen anything like that before, said Emily. Have you? V ran another internal query and pulled up several results. After comparing them to the projection, he said, Analysis. I have seen several that were similar, but they were much larger. Huh, she said. She tilted her head down at V. Did you know about condensed space before coming to Earth? V pulled up an internal map of the condensed space layer framework. Yes, I have seen ten layers of it. Her eyes widened. Ten? I thought there was one. Analysis. Condensed space is a term applied to a reality where the points inside this space are linked to points in the other reality, but much closer. The stronger a condensed space layer is, the closer the links are. There are more than ten, but the first is utilized more frequently due to it possessing the least resistance to entry from this reality. Wow. I didn't realize it was that complex. So for this transmitter, they just, what... Form a shield or bubble or something to enter condensed space? A set of images of the process appeared in V's memory. That is correct. A condensed space shield is formed around the object. In this case, it is the transmitter. Once in condensed space, it can send out data. Emily wrinkled her eyebrows. What's in condensed space? Just empty space? V flew off her lap and hovered nearby. I will show you. The hollow room transformed so that they were in a light blue semi-transparent tunnel. The term that Everin uses is fluidic, said V. I guess he doesn't mean water, she said. She looked around. This is pretty cool. Yes, I think it is cool as well. She chuckled. You crack me up. V first did a check on his slang database and returned no result. He then analyzed an image of Emily breaking into small pieces like a smashed ceramic jar and determined she was not being literal. After performing a quick calculation, taking into consideration Emily's chuckling tone and hand motions, he determined it to mean that he provided her with pleasure. I am glad to crack you up, she laughed. You know how to make me laugh. Acknowledged, said V. He added the slang term to his database. The hollow room changed back to Everin's view, where he was studying the transmitter. Emily pointed at Demetrius, standing next to Everin. That guy gives me the creeps. He's been quiet the whole trip to the transmitter and observing, too. V calculated that Demetrius would make Emily uncomfortable. Perhaps he is just curious. Maybe. He looks like a serial killer. V pulled up images of serial killers. He compared their facial profiles against Demetrius's. V found a certain similarity between Demetrius's profile and that of the killer clowns he had seen on Earth. A related data fact appeared indicating that Dr. Snowden did not like clowns. His profile matches some from Earth. Huh? said Emily. Well, there you go. V determined that she was confirming his analysis and not going somewhere. He ran a quick query on the possible motives for Demetrius and then selected the one with the highest probability. Analysis Demetrius may not be used to seeing Salazar talk to someone considered his equal. Emily eyed V for a moment. I didn't think about that. Sounds reasonable, though. I would think that occurs more often than not when Everin is known. V ran through several internal simulations that matched that scenario. I still think there's something odd about this deal. She watched Everin scan around, and then she pointed at a hovering document. Looks like that's the message. V scanned the message and added it to his database. Query. 
Why do you not trust Salazar's deal? Salazar is bad news. And this arrangement? I suspect he has an ulterior motive. I only hope that whatever it is, no one gets hurt, which seems to be par the course for us. Salazar is unique, yet I do not think he places a high value on organics. This would seem to be in contradiction to the role he plays to the humans on that ship. Emily shook a finger at V. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. V confirmed that was what she was saying. With that said, the freedom of the Dravens may be worth the price. Acknowledged, he said. For the next hour, they enjoyed light conversation before breaking off to head to the conference room. V scanned Dr. Snowden, Draxus, and Sandus when they entered the conference room. Dr. Snowden went to the replicator and grabbed a cup of coffee, while Draxus took a seat opposite Emily and Sandus one next to her. Sandus piqued V's interest. When Sandus had contacted V in the future event to help Everin, it was via a secured channel that was only shared among a few other than Everin, Dr. Snowden, and Emily. Although it seemed unusual at the time, V calculated with a high probability that this event is where Sandus would be given access to that. Sandus's jovial nature, quick wit, and comedic aspect intrigued V. Sandus seemed to make others calm. V figured it was due to Sandus's size and non-threatening appearance. V focused on Draxus. With the input of Draxus's information to the Torvata, V had done a cursory scan of it. The rarity of someone like Draxus was unusual, that of being not only a Praetor, but also part Arcara. V's personality analysis of Draxus showed that he did not seem to like AIs much, since the Dravens had no AI, and the only ones they met were either from the Caloris Shen or Salazar, that was understandable. V would try to change Draxus's perception if possible. V enjoyed Dr. Snowden's discussion with Demetrius. It highlighted what it was to be human. While Dr. Snowden argued for freedom of choice, Demetrius argued freedom could be discarded in the name of advancement. V could see the logical analysis in Demetrius's argument. If a superior intellect decided what was best for someone incapable of making that decision themselves, then that course of action should be taken, similar to Everin making a decision. Given V's knowledge of humans, he also understood Dr. Snowden's position. Two different versions of humanity arguing was something that V found stimulating. He had run several simulations but none seemed to match the discussion that took place. It was those experiences that he could not calculate that he treasured. After ten minutes of everyone catching up, Everin entered the room. He took his seat at the head of the table. I have the message to be delivered. He gestured at Draxus. The planet where we met Salazar is in full evacuation. I thank you, said Draxus, bowing his head. Sandus shook a claw. You know this is a trap of some type, right? Of course, said Everin. I have scanned the transmitter, and there is nothing unusual about it. Dr. Snowden wrinkled his eyebrows. What if they send a virus or something during the meeting? Everin nodded. That is a possibility. But I suspect, given the technical nature of these devices, and the isolation afforded to them, that it would be difficult to do so. V ran several simulations on different attack vectors that Salazar could use. None came up with a high probability. Analysis. More information is needed. A scan of the condensed space receiver would be helpful. I concur, said Everin. It is time to visit the Gull Cash Alliance. Dr. Snowden studied the data labels that hung off outlines of objects on the transparent front half of the Torvata. They had jumped one light year away from the coordinates given by Salazar, and he was not sure what to expect. What he did know was he had an intense dislike of humanity as molded by Salazar. Demetrius had gotten under Dr. Snowden's skin. The smugness and the lack of concern for informed consent made him think the Terran Dominion humans were more slaves to Salazar's will than truly free. The Gull Cash Alliance, on the other hand, was supposed to be opposite. 
no AIs, and gene tailoring was considered a sport as he understood it. He studied the various outlines of objects. Lot of objects around the star. Everin raised a finger. Also note that unlike the Dominion, they do not have many energy collector arrays. Although both the Dominion and the Gull Cash Alliance use a star to power their structures, they have different approaches to utilizing it. Most of the habitats and ships shown here are built to absorb directly, whereas with the Dominion, all power went to building more energy collectors, and they seem to only have one large ship versus the many here. So they are building for different reasons, said Sandus. Everin half smiled. The Dominion energy collectors had processing nodes on them. These appear to not have them. Dr. Snowden wrinkled his eyebrows. You think Salazar is building some sort of star-based supercomputer? Like a matryoshka brain? Or becoming one, said Everin. Draxus narrowed his eyes. That would not be good for him to have such power. Santa smiled big. Besides, what would he do with all that power? Seems like he has everything under control already. Emily gestured at Sandus. It probably means Salazar plans to expand. I don't like it. She is right, said Everin, pointing at Sandus. Sandus chuckled and pointed at Everin. And you are right. Emily shook her head. The Torvata scan profile too, said Everin from his command chair. Acknowledged, said V. Dr. Snowden could see that Draxus was stressed. The unconscious flexing of his muscles was a clear sign of that. Sandus was his usual self, excited to be around anything that might yield new information. Dr. Snowden liked Sandus. He brought a different type of energy to the group. Dr. Snowden felt bad about V not being able to come to Holland 1. Although Emily hung back to stay with V, Dr. Snowden wished that V could have come. Torvata scan profile 2 is active, said V. Receiving communication request. That was quick, said Emily. As I would expect, said Everin. Although we are only a light year away, they should be able to scan us. V, put it through. Acknowledged. The screen changed to show the top half of three humans. Dr. Snowden noted that the middle, fair-skinned male human had long, stringy hair with a face full of stubble. A metallic faceplate covered the upper right half of his face. He wore no shirt, but instead had straps across his chest. The one on the left was dark-skinned and bald and had some tattoos on the left side of his face. Metal covered his ears and he wore a faded blue vest of some type. The human on the right was a tan-skinned female, with half of her hair shaved and the other half long. She had a collar that seemed to have a dim glow. The middle human spoke. Who in the stars are you? I am Everin, he said with a slight bow. The group laughed. Check out the ship registration, said the middle male, glancing at the woman. She looked down and away as her arms moved. Everin, what a dumb name. How is it you just popped in out of nowhere? Asked the left male. It is an ability unique to my ship. We did not mean to startle you. Uh-huh, said the middle male. The woman drew her head back a bit while turning toward the middle male. He's cleared. What? Asked the middle male. Let me see that. He studied something off-screen and then faced forward. Looks like you somehow have authorization. Your ship has a unique signature, one that the system recognizes. It's an old entry from the before times. You must be from there. Everin nodded. I have not heard it referred to as such. However, we would like to talk to one of your leaders. The left male laughed. Oh, ho, 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 don't worry about that. You've been flagged, and you'll definitely be meeting with one of our leaders. The group laughed. Thank you for your help, said Everin. He thinks we're helping him, said the woman. The middle male sucked in on the right part of his lip. Welcome to Gabranza Hellerus, the home station of the Gull Cash Alliance. Make sure you're armed when you come on board. The window flashed, then dissipated. 
Wow, said Dr. Snowden. They're a bit different compared to the Dominion. Emily nodded. Definitely a lot more lax, for sure. The Torvata opened a portal and flew through it. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened as he surveyed the large station before them. It reminded him of a torus with three arms supporting a large orb in the center. He noticed a red dot that indicated where the Torvata was to land. There were other ships flying around, according to the Torvata, and the fact that they all seemed to have different designs did not go unnoticed. The uniformity of the Dominion was at direct odds with the Gull Cash Alliance. After fifteen minutes, the Torvata landed in a docking bay. I believe we can all go this time, said Everin. He gestured at V. You may want to go in body mode and appear as a virtual intelligence, since AIs are not welcome here. Acknowledged, said V. Everyone else, do any last-minute activities before we go. We may be here for a while, said Everin. Dr. Snowden had to relieve himself, and he wanted to pick up a snack or two. After joining everyone ten minutes later on the Torvada ramp just inside the shielding, he took a quick glance around. Everyone had on the same outfit configuration from when they were on Zeta-12's ship, except for V, who was in body mode. Sandus poked V. Nice body. Thank you, said V. You have a nice body as well. Sandus jostled his shoulders as his head wandered around. Don't I know it? You too, said Emily as she shook her head. Dr. Snowden pointed outward. I guess there's no greeting party. Do we need helmets up for this? Also, what about contamination? Everin waved forward. The Torvada showed the environment to be friendly toward humans, as one would expect. He pointed at some large, flat, rectangular surfaces up top. They have scanners there. If we have something that would trigger a threat, he said, motioning at several turrets on the wall, those would fire. In addition to that, the exit to this docking bay is seal-controlled. All right, said Dr. Snowden. He followed Everin and the others out into the docking bay. Ships came and went through the shielding that separated the bay from space. As they walked toward a human-sized exit, Sandus paused. He pointed at some furry humanoids with dog heads. Um, aliens? Everin tilted his head as he surveyed the group of humanoids. I suspect they have been uplifted from dogs. Wow, said Sandus. They weren't kidding about treating genetic engineering loosely here. I would agree. Do not be surprised at other alterations we may see. Got it, said Sandus. As they passed the humanoids, one of them raised an eyebrow at Sandus. He raised an eyebrow back. Will you stop that, said Emily, swatting his arm. Sorry, sorry, he looked at me odd first. Dr. Snowden chuckled. He had seen Sandus's mannerisms in the future meeting and understood that encounter much better now. Dr. Snowden wondered what other animal humanoids they would see. They reached the sealed exit doorway where a beam shot out from the side and scanned them. After a moment, the door opened and the group entered the small enclosed room. On the right side was a transparent material showing several thin, barely humanoid robots operating consoles. Once the door they had entered from slid shut, another beam swept over them, and then the door ahead of them slid open. One of the robots motioned at the now open door and, in a deep digital voice, said, You are free to enter. Everin nodded and stepped through the door with the others in tow. Dr. Snowden narrowed his eyes as the door shut behind him. What was around him surprised him. He had expected it to be high-tech, given it was a space station in space, but ahead of them was a large, dimly lit circular hub area. A red and green smoky haze filled the air, and the bright signs above multiple entry doorways ringed the sides. In the middle were a variety of what looked like booths, and the area was packed with people and aliens moving around. Dr. Snowden fanned his hand. So, how do we get to the leader? Lot of stuff going on in here. We can ask around, said Everin. He approached a lone male that wore brown pants, a shirt, and a belt that had two holstered weapons on it. 
A bandolier rested on the man's chest. Everin intercepted the man. Excuse me, how would we find the leader of the Gull Cash Alliance? The man narrowed his eyes and placed one hand on his holstered weapon. I don't know you. Back up before I break you. Everin dipped his head. My apologies. My intent was not to aggravate you. We are new here. The man sighed. All right. Since you're a newbie, if you need directions, talk to a service robot. The man pointed at V. You have one there. Does not compute, said V. The man shook his head. Yeah, that one sounds degraded. You need to find one that isn't. That's my one tip to you. You should be thankful. We are, said Everin, dipping his head again. Thank you for the assistance. The man harumphed as he walked away. Analysis. He was quite friendly. Sandis shook a claw at V. Sarcasm. All right, I like that. And good job on the degraded robot part. V's lights glowed a bit brighter. Everin pointed at a robot that had stains and rust on it. The group approached the robot. Excuse me. We are looking for the leader of the Gull Cash Alliance. Can you give us directions? asked Everin. The robot paused and faced the group. Please designate which faction? Everin tilted his head. I am guessing, then, the one that runs this area. The leader of the Lycian Syndicate is Hollows Redfur, said the robot. A golden projection shot out of his chest, showing a layout of the station with several dots. Could you take us there? asked Everin as he scanned the layout. Yes, I could, said the robot. It stared at the group. Emily laughed. I got this. She faced the robot. Take us to Hollis Redfur? Of course. It would be my pleasure, said the robot. It pivoted and began to walk away. Sandus shook his head. Virtual intelligences. I thought they would be more advanced by now. Perhaps they were at some point, said Draxus. It appears they have been degraded in some fashion. Emily shrugged. Well, our guide is taking off while we're standing here talking. Let's do this. Chapter 14 Emily observed the robot as the group followed. The robot had not said a single word since it had taken off, but that was her experience from dealing with a virtual intelligence before. Her mind wandered to Cal, a virtual intelligence she had encountered when she was alone on a prison planet. She had come to trust Cal, and despite him being a virtual intelligence, she felt like he cared for her somewhat. It could also just have been her being alone for nine months. Looking around, she saw a wide variety of altered humans. Their attire ranged from barely clothed to heavily armored. Piercing seemed to be common, as well as physical alterations on the body. It was the uplifted animal humanoids that caught her attention. In the 20 minutes they had been walking, she had seen humanoid versions of cats, dogs, pigs, birds, and some reptiles. She was sure Dr. Snowden had qualms about that, but then again, Sandus had been uplifted, and she liked him. Maybe these were like him, just trying to survive. She refocused on the environment. They had left the hazy entry hub and went through a variety of metallic hallways with dust along the edges and dim lighting. She peered into several larger rooms that they passed, and most seemed to be geared toward pleasure rather than anything functional. It made her wonder how they maintained the station at all, even with service robots. There was one room that almost made her gag, where copulation was open with species of choice. The robot paused outside a nondescript door in one of the hallways. Is this it? asked Everin, motioning at the door. Yes, said the robot. Thank you said Everin with a slight bow. The robot hustled off as the door slid open. Emily wrinkled her nose at the waft of a strong odor. It smelled like rotten eggs. Come in, come in, said a deep voice. Emily followed Everin and the others in. She saw that the room was large. 
and it reminded her of a medieval court in design, except much more advanced. The red-skinned human sitting at the end was flanked by several robots similar to their guide. A dog humanoid was to the right in a robe of some sort, with three other altered human males in a hodgepodge of clothing on the left. The group assembled before the human on the central seat. "'You must be Hollis Redfur,' said Everin. "'That I am,' said Hollis. "'And you're the noble Everin, a time traveler," said Hollis, arcing his hand in the air. "'Friend of humanity.' So I have heard. Hollis tilted his head. My service robots don't have much information on you, other than your presence throughout humanity, even in the before times. What era is the before times? asked Everin. The time before Salazar caused the Great Rift, said Hollis. We were much more advanced back then than the devolving situation we have here. I see, said Everin. He gestured around the group. I have with me Dr. Albert Snowden, Emily Snowden, Sandus, Draxus, and V. Hollis scoffed. You name your service robot? I am V, said V in an up and down tone. That's probably all he can say, said Hollis. But enough about that. Your uniqueness has granted you this one-time meeting. I'm a busy man. Make use of it. What brings you to my attention? I bring a video message from Salazar. In it, he wishes to set up a meeting to negotiate a ceasefire. The dog humanoid growled, while the other humans to the left of Hollis jeered. Salazar! The very mention of that name is distasteful, said Hollis. For what reason would he want a ceasefire? I do not know. I am just delivering the message. What you do with it is entirely up to you. Of course it is, said Hollis. He rubbed his chin. There is some value to a ceasefire. Salazar has become increasingly efficient at being disruptive. He grinned. I spent twenty years under his domain before I came here and rose through the ranks. Salazar is devious. He wants something else, but what is the question? Part of the game is finding out. I'll put it before the others. But what do you gain out of all this? If you're truly a friend of humanity, what in the Garsnark are you doing working with Salazar? He is vacating the Draven space, if a meeting can be arranged, said Everin. Hollis eyed Draxus. Helping the Dravens, huh? By vacating that space, he opens it to the outcasts. That's just new management and a much more brutal one at that. We will handle that, said Draxus as his eyes slightly flared. Hollis smiled. Ah, a praetor. Your eyes give you away. Now I'm even more intrigued. He gestured at Everin. Show me the message. Everin extended his hand, palm up and a projection shot forth showing Salazar giving his message. After a moment, the projection dissipated. Hollis stood. To the meeting room. Emily noted that Hollis's entourage stood still until Hollis had exited the room. After they exited, she followed Everin and the others. She was not sure what to make of Hollis. He was not quite what she had expected in what appeared to be a culture of loose morals. As they walked down the hallway, she noted that everyone in Hollis's way cleared a path. There was no talking, and after twenty minutes they reached an empty room. Hollis's entourage moved to the side of the room and motioned for her and the others to do so as well. Hollis extended his hand and moved his fingers around. He glanced back at everyone. Now we wait. Over the next ten minutes, 
A circular pattern of cylindrical beams shot down from the ceiling to the floor in the front part of the room, creating holographic representations of each leader. Name labels hovered a bit off the ground. There were eight of them, and each was different from the other. One was a cat humanoid, while the others were altered humans to some degree, and their outfits ranged from robes to heavy armor. Once they all had appeared, Hollis stepped into his slot on the circle's edge. I know this is short notice, but I have Everin with me. He has brought a message from Salazar. The leaders grimaced and sneered. Hollis motioned for Everin to move to the center of the circle. Everin complied, and when there, he showed Salazar's video. The leaders focused on Salazar. I will keep this brief, said Salazar. I'm willing to do a ceasefire with the Gull Cash Alliance. I realize there are multiple leaders that will see this, and any decision must be passed universally. As such, I would like to meet with each of you individually. If you agree to this, I will cease and desist any current operations that affect the Gull Cash Alliance while in discussion. Everin has the specifications on how to receive communications from me. You can trust him, and by extension, me, by agreeing to this. Emily could see hatred in the leader's eyes. Regardless of whatever differences they may have had, it seemed Salazar was universally loathed. The projection ended. One of the leaders with the name label of Garish spoke. How can we trust Salazar? Or you? I would not expect you to, said Everin. He raised a finger. However, what harm is there in listening? The cat humanoid named Julius hissed. Maybe this is a distraction to keep our gaze somewhere else. Several of the other leaders murmured in agreement. Hollis raised a hand. Does everyone else feel this way? The leaders took a moment to look around. Emily noticed Draxus's concerned expression. If this meeting did not take place, then Salazar's evacuation of the Draven space would stop. Hollis narrowed his eyes. I know you don't trust Everin, especially since he has the stench of Salazar on him. Maybe he can do something for us in order to gain that trust. The group nodded, and some cheered. What would you have me do? asked Everin. Fix the stupid central computer core, said one of the leaders with the name label Houston. The other leaders nodded in agreement. I am unfamiliar with that. What is the issue? asked Everin. Hollis smiled. We don't like AIs, as you might have guessed. But it was an AI that managed the central computer core for this station. When we split from Salazar long ago, the AI left, and we haven't been able to use the central computer core since then and have had to rely on our own custom systems. The central computer core has been down for a long time, and no one knows how to repair it. It had specialized service robots who are long gone. If it were to be fixed, we could get full use of the station, and possibly more out of it. It sounds like an AI could fix it, but it appears that is not an option. Damn right it's not, said Garish. Everin rubbed his chin. It could be dangerous to activate. There may be unforeseen consequences. A full assessment would take some time. Screw the assessment. Let us handle the consequences, said Garish. Very well, said Everin. It is your station. I can take a look at it and see what I can do. Hollis pointed at Emily and the others. Only you can go. Your friends stay here. Just in case. Insurance, said Everin. I will need my service robot, V. The group leaders nodded. So be it, said Hollis. You get it up and running, and we'll talk with Salazar. That's the deal. Understood, said Everin. 
I will need directions and any information you have on it prior to going there. Hollis grinned. I'll get that to you, since my systems are the most detailed and advanced. Some of the leaders groaned, while others snorted and shook their heads. Hollis waved a hand in an arc to the other leaders. You'll know if the core gets fixed. At that point, you can prepare to talk with Salazar. We should meet afterward to discuss it as a group. Agreed, said Julius. The other leaders acknowledged Hollis. The holographic projections vanished, and the room lit up. Hollis raised his head a bit at Everin. You have quite the effort ahead of you. I believe I can handle it, said Everin. My friends will be safe with you, I assume. Of course. They can make full use of my area of the station. Is there a science or research division here? asked Dr. Snowden. Hollis faced Dr. Snowden. Are you a scientist? Dr. Snowden nodded. You'll find we treat those with knowledge very special here, said Hollis. I'll give you directions to meet Ton Gimris, our research and development director. He is why my faction is the most advanced relative to the others. Thank you, said Dr. Snowden. He glanced at Everin. You going to be okay? Everin nodded. Enjoy your time with Ton. This should not take long. Emily wished they could just go back to the Torvada, but it seemed trust was in short supply. Being held as a hostage, even in the best of situations, irked her. But if that was what it took to free the Draven space, then she would endure whatever was necessary. The fact that Hollis even had a research and development division was a good sign. Based on the appearance of the other leaders, she was not sure they placed too much emphasis on that aspect of station life. She wanted to go with Everin and V, but understood that she did not carry the same weight as Everin. The leaders were willing to let Everin earn trust, maybe due to the Everin protocol, but that was not an option for her or the others. As Everin and V exited the room, Hollis motioned at one of his service robots. Take them to Ton. Yes, of course, said the robot. Like the other service robots they had encountered, it immediately took off. Sanda swatted Emily's arm. Let's do this! She shook her head as the group hustled out of the room. Dr. Snowden hustled to keep up with the robot. Although the robot did not move fast, the meandering hallways got confusing when there were successive quick turns. He tried to study the environment as they went, but with the dim lighting and the occasional haze, it was a blur. Emily and Santa seemed to have no issue, but they were in the front. After forty minutes, the group reached the entrance to an open area filled with seating. A glowing sign above the entrance showed Lycian Syndicate Research and Development Division. Dr. Snowden noted that there were throngs of people, robots, and animal humanoids bustling around. It was a busy place and along the pillars that seemed to run parallel through the room were various large screens. The one aspect that caught his attention was the amount of scantily clad women. What they were doing hanging around a place of technology got his mind racing. The robot headed toward an entrance with a sign over it that said, Director Ton Gimris. Dr. Snowden noted the two large males with heavy armor and weapons posted outside the entrance. The Lycian Syndicate took their research seriously. The robot stopped at the entrance. Thank you, said Dr. Snowden. Yes, of course, said the robot. It pivoted and headed back out the way they had come. Not much for talking, these service robots, said Sandus. Draxus nodded. I am curious as to how they maintain them. This does not seem like a place of learning to me. Dr. Snowden tossed a hand out. Well, research can actually be creative. Maybe they're just embracing that aspect more than others. Let's find out. He headed into the entrance with the others in tow. They assembled in front of a large screen at the end of the hallway they were in. To their left was a sealed door. The screen lit up, showing a red-headed woman with a robe on. She smiled. Welcome to the office of Tom Gimris. 
How may I help you? Um, Hollos mentioned we could meet Tom during our stay, said Dr. Snowden. Oh, you are the weird ones, said the woman. One moment. The screen turned off. We're the weird ones? asked Emily. Sandus laughed. I could see that. We got Draxus, who looks like he could kick the door in. Me as a lovable ball of fur they probably think of as an uplifted squirrel. You as the human female with no physical alterations. And Dr. Snowden wearing glasses in a place where that should easily be fixed. Dr. Snowden tilted his head. Huh. I never thought about it like that. I don't actually need glasses anymore. But I'm so used to wearing them, it's a force of habit. Good observations. He's good like that, said Emily, eyeing Sandus. The door to their left slid open. Dr. Snowden glanced around. I guess we go in. He stepped through the door and into a clean hallway that led to a large room. When he got to the end of the hallway, his eyes widened at the laboratory before him. It was jam-packed with screens, large technical devices that he could not identify, and one corner that had a spotless rectangular area free of obstruction. At the other end of the room were stairs that led to a set of closed doors. The group moved into the room. This place is... unusual, said Draxus. With big guy on this one, said Sandus. Looks like someone tossed a bunch of high-tech equipment into a container, then shook it all around. Dr. Snowden tilted his head. I don't know. I can sort of see some order in all this chaos. You would. This is like a giant version of your desk at home, said Emily. Sandus laughed. Their attention focused on the doors opening. A woman in a revealing robe exited. When she walked by them... She ran a hand over Draxus's shoulder and smiled, then exited the way they had come from. Ah, uh, was that the director? asked Sandus. Not at all, said a fair-skinned male human that stood about six feet tall. Metallic boots wrapped up over leathery pants, while his hairless exposed chest had two straps that crisscrossed it in an X pattern. His hair was long and wild, and facial hair covered his chin and wrapped up around his lips. Golden eyes highlighted the metallic strips on the sides of his head. Welcome. I'm Ton Gimris, Research and Development Director of the Lycian Syndicate. Hi, said Dr. Snowden, stepping forward and extending a hand. Ton eyed Dr. Snowden's hand. This must be some type of ritual, is that right? Dr. Snowden glanced at the others, then back at Tan. Sure, it's just a greeting. Tan shook Dr. Snowden's hand. Hollis said that time travelers were headed my way. You must be Dr. Albert Snowden. Yep, that's me. I see, said Tan, running his tongue around his upper lip. Time period? A.D. 2012-ish. Tan smiled big. And here you are, A.D. 10105, almost 8,000 years later. He wagged a finger at Dr. Snowden. Yet, I suspect that none of this surprises you. Why do you say that? Sandus chuckled. We sort of stand out ourselves. Yes, said Tan. He tapped at the side of his head as he gazed at Sandus. You must be Sandus. You've been uplifted, but not by us. Interesting. Are you from 2012, too? A.D. 2008, said Sandus with a big smile. Different time periods, said Tan. He walked over to Draxus and exhaled sharply. A draven praetor. Very rare and powerful. Surprised to see you here. Draxus, is it? Yes. And I'm here to help my friends, said Draxus. Of course you are. Dravens are loyal to a fault sometimes, said Tan. He stood in front of Emily. And you're Emily. Beauty, finesse, and intelligence all wrapped in a tough shell. Emily narrowed her eyes. I don't mean to offend, of course, said Tan. Those were mostly Hollow's observations, but I see now that he understated it a bit. Nonetheless, Hollow said you all wanted to see me. Well, Hollow said that scientists are treated differently here. I was just curious. 
said Dr. Snowden. Ton eyed Dr. Snowden. Are you a scientist? Dr. Snowden nodded. Astronomy, I study space, stars, stellar objects, and the like. Oh, then being out here must be a treat, said Ton. You could say that. Ton ran a hand over his chin. Follow me. He walked to the corner that was free of obstructions. With a tap at the side of his head, a hologram formed showing a comet. We have a drone tracking this comet. I'm tied into the drone and can have it do whatever I want and perform any tests I need. He raised a finger. It's over two light years away. Dr. Snowden raised his eyebrows. Wow, so you can study stellar phenomena up close. Of course. You haven't lived until you've flown through a nebula at high speed. Once you're tied in, you can immerse yourself completely. What other types of research do you do here? Asked Emily. Everything, said Ton. Weapons research, mainly due to hollows. We also study life itself and have mastered the art of gene tailoring. Anything that allows us to become more efficient as a whole will be studied. How is it funded? Asked Sandus. This all looks very expensive, yes, very expensive. Ton smiled. You speak of currency. That's what the outcasts use. Here, everything is free, assuming you make advances and report them to Hollis. This is a very lax environment, said Draxus. Definitely. Research is best done when you're focused. When food, drink, and companionship are provided, the mind is free to pursue knowledge and information without distraction. Sandus raised a claw. I like your style. I figured you might. I've seen you studying the room since you arrived. Please, feel free to investigate anything here. Sandus glanced at Draxus and then looked down. I wish I could, but I can't. Ton narrowed his eyes. Must be a time travel limitation. Is that right? Sandus sighed. Yeah, I promised. You're a better traveler than me, said Ton, laughing. He focused on the group. Browse around. You are my guests here. He gestured at Dr. Snowden. I can show you around. Draxus raised his head a bit. I have some questions, if you have time. Of course, said Ton, sitting on a chair and easing back. What information can I provide you, Praetor? I was curious about the Gull Cash Alliance's perspective on the split with Salazar. Salazar, said Ton shaking his head. The crazy virtual intelligence that somehow became a prodigious AI. When humanity first appeared out here, and we were all clustered around a star trying to rebuild, it was Salazar who decided to pick a fight with the Caloris Shen. He did it in a sneaky way, and we were embroiled in war for centuries. Humanity split into several factions. A third of the overall group left. That was us. We had enough of United Planet protocols and regulations, and Salazar had become almost a religion among some at that point. I like this lifestyle much better. Draxus nodded. Salazar said the Caloris Shen attacked, and that it was the Gulkash Alliance that wanted to annihilate the Caloris Shen. Ton laughed. <laughs> Sounds a bit like revisionist history. No. We left on our own accord because we didn't believe in the war. Once it was over, it seemed Salazar was too much for even the United Planets, who went their own way. How many human factions are in the Gullcash Alliance? asked Emily. Around 140, with eight major ones, mainly because they own a part of this station, the largest and most powerful structure in this region of space. Powered by a star, potent defenses, and unlimited replication. It seems any group that gets a ship or a habitat that can collect energy from the star becomes a faction. The only ones not welcome around our star are the outcasts. They're a bit too savage for me. Hollow said the Lycian Syndicate was the most advanced, said Sandus. Ton nodded. He was right. Anyone that shows potential in science, technology, engineering, or math is treated as royalty here. The payoff is what gives the Lycian Syndicate its edge. Couldn't you just enhance the brain? asked Dr. Snowden. 
It sounds like you have the genetic engineering thing down and could always use implants. Tan shook a finger. Genes are tricky. The enhanced intelligence is harder to get than it sounds. Sometimes there are mutations, and not in a good way. As for the implants, you don't want to give them to those who are less inclined toward knowledge in general. We prefer to be more natural and escalate those who show natural intelligence. Sandus grinned big. A scientific royal class, now that's an intriguing concept. Quite right, my small furry friend. Well, we're here until the central computer core is fixed, said Dr. Snowden. Don nodded. Everin is fixing it with his service robot, V. I have some questions of my own. Before I ask them, do you want anything to eat or drink? He glanced at Dr. Snowden. Do you want companionship? I can bring in a few individuals who would help you relax. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened as Emily and Sandus chuckled. Ton grinned. I guess not. Now, about this Everin character.